Reflect, the record to reflect, I have received a document that has a caption uh, for this case, a heading that says bond, uh, then two short paragraphs, and then a signature at the bottom with the name Daryl Edward Brooks Jr., authorized representative of Daryl E. Brooks, all rights reserved. Um, I've reviewed it, sir. I would note uh, it will be made part of the file. Uh, you do not reference any um, law as it relates to this request or what I would deem a request. Um, there's no constitutional provision, statutory pr provision, or common law associated with this. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking me to do with it as well. I don't see a clear request for relief as well. So. Um, it will be filed, but I don't, I'm not going to address it any further. Do you um, want a copy of that for your record, sir? Yes, I do the time stamped original copy, if I may. Um, and also, um, to my knowledge, um, the filing is proper, um, unless Your Honor can um, provide verified uh, law of, of your own that that is not a proper document. Um, I think it's very clear, clear what the document is referring to. Um, the language is is all together. Um, it's a very very clear document in it in its entirety. And uh, Mr. Brooks, I would direct your attention to Section 802.01, which governs motions, how made, and the form. That document does not comply with that. Um, as far as receiving a time stamp, uh, we have a date stamp. It will be scanned uh, and it will be then uploaded into the file. Um, I would just note for the record, it's now 8.07 uh, and I've had that for a couple of minutes now, but that's, uh, we don't have a time stamp in the courtroom here. What was the law that you cited? Uh, I draw your attention to section 802.01 which is the statute related to motions. And does that refer specifically to that filing? It refers to any request that's made to a judge or in a court of law. Um, could, I suppose, go to a court commissioner, but that's not where we're at in these proceedings. Um, that, to me, does not provide a legal or factual basis for the request that you're making. Um, so that's how I will address it. Um, for the record, I believe it does, Your Honor. Um, it was it was uh, presented in the same fashion that all my motions in in this court have been presented, and uh, you never cited the same thing with the other filings. So it that's leading me to believe that um, it's just that document that's not being accepted when I have the other timestamp filings for the same uh, documents that I file. Every other document is, is filed in the same manner. Every last one of them, and, and no, no exception with that one, Your Honor. I understand my obligations with uh, individuals who are representing themselves to review their pleadings and to uh, construe them liberally. However, you were notified uh, the other day that future requests needed to comply with section 802.01 even with a liberal uh, reading of that document um, i'm not sure what it is you're asking me um, it's not going to prevent this court from proceeding forward and continuing on with the trial um, and having uh, the jury brought in and the next witness called for the record your honor will you, can you state why um because it's clear what this is referring to. It's referring to why there's no bond uh, mentioned or stated in the court document, the, the docket sheet. There's no uh, bond in any of in any of these writings. Not not one time does it mention it. And so that was what this was referring to. Um, I understand what it's referring to, sir. Sir, also, there's no legal basis for your for argument. Record. Also, so, for the record, this docket is not a certified copy, which is what I requested. I do not control the 
uh, clerk's office, you need to make a specific request to the custodian of the court record, which is the clerk of court for a certified I, I, copy. I, I, I that, that can't time. be done here uh, in this courtroom. You have to do that through an inmate communication form. That's that's what I did, Your Honor. The, the ICF should be on record that I re specifically requested. I specifically requested a certified copy. Sir, I'm not machine. in charge of that, so I'm not going to address that any further. So my understanding is a certified copy was provided to this you. This is not the certified copy no. that I'm holding, Your Honor. I know I, how again, you can take that is. up with the clerk of court. That is beyond uh, the scope of what I am addressing here. I am not the custodian of the record. I would not be the the judge to address any concerns that you have if you believe your request was not complied with. It, it clearly wasn't because I'm not the it. person to do that, sir. It's not the proper venue in this case or forum. All right. The custodian of the record needs to reply to that. That is our clerk of court. If you believe uh, she did not do that, then you have recourse available to you, but it's not through this case. So with that, I'm going to move on. Let's have the jury brought out. I was uh, not provided with exactly what I asked for. If, the, um, if I'm told by the court to submit an ICF for any requesting, and I requested specifically a certified copy of the docket sheet and was not provided with what I specifically asked for, then Sir, how I'm I, not, I can't address that any further. So again, I, I would like you need to take that up with the clerk of court and you can communicate directly uh, with her office. Can but I I'm not going to do it through this court proceeding. I would like that stated for the record that I did not receive what I specifically asked for. And I'm sure that the ICF is on record. I can get Mr. Brooks for the record. We're on the record. And okay. so everything that we're saying is on the record. So it's noted. Bring the jury out, please. Um, also, I have one more thing I wanted to stay for the record. Go ahead. Um, which was also submitted via inmate communication form. So that should be on the record and it should be filed. I, I, I know it should have been received by now. It was addressed to Miss Monica Pass and it was in um, it was asking for uh, the complaint that was filed. It was three different complaints and they're, they're found in the docket sheet. One from 1123 of 2021, one from 1129th of 2021, which would be the amended complaint, and then one from uh, January 12th of 2022, which would be the second amended complaint. I specifically asked for um, copies of those to be provided as they were not on, in any go discovery. Back go back out, Teresa. Oh, hold on a second, okay? Sorry. One second. Mr. Brooks, are you, I am not going to uh, answer for clerk of court pause. She is the custodian of the record, all right? And it, so you're going to have to communicate directly with her if you're looking for just copies, I'm happy to print those off for you. I've already provided some of those things to you. I hear you saying you want certified copies. That would not be provided by me. Are you looking for certified copies or just copies? Certified copies. All right, then that will have to be addressed by clerk of court pass. So how would I do that? Because I, I can't, <laughs> sir, it, I, I've already told you you need to make the request to her if you, and, uh, that's how I have to leave it, sir. That's I'm not the custodian of the record, so. I addressed it that way, Your Honor. I addressed it the way I was told to address it from My the My understanding court. is it went to her. So with that, let's have the jury brought out. Your position's noted. All right. Your Honor, can we address the subject matter jurisdiction before the jury comes out? The no. jury comes out? We've already done that. And is that a judicial determination that you're making not to address the subject matter jurisdiction which has yet to be proven at this point? It has not been Mr. verified. Mr. Brooks, please, the jury's coming out. I know what you're doing, but just, I've already addressed that. So is that a judicial determination that you're making? My decision on the record stands, sir. And I would like the record to reflect that you have not shown verified proof of subject matter jurisdiction whatsoever. <coughs> and that by refusing to answer that is a tactic agreement by you your honor which you understand what that means i know you do 
Mr. Brooks, I have not entered into any such agreement. And because the jury is out and you are claiming that there's some issue, um, I'm going to take this up later, but I uh, will entertain a request from the state for a curative jury instruction. All right, thank you, everyone. You may be seated and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Uh, we are proceeding uh, with this trial, and the state may call its next witness. And, Your Honor, before the state calls the next witness, I just want to let the record reflect that I did put Exhibit 54 on the witness stand, um, and it will be um, introduced through the next witness, who is Laura Thien. All right, thank you. Good morning, Ms. Thien. If you would please make your way to my witness stand, which is all the way up by me. It is up one riser. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Mm -hmm. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. Laura, L-A-U-R-A, Thien, T-H-E-I-N. Thank you, and sorry I put an M on that previously. <laughs> All right, go ahead, your witness. Thank you. Good morning, Mrs. Thien. How are you today? Very good. Okay. Ma'am, I'm going to direct your attention to, no, to November 21st, 2021. Were you at the City of Waukesha Christmas Parade on that day? Yes. Were you there as a spectator? No, I was in the parade. I was in one of the units. Okay. And which group were you with? The Milwaukee Dancing Grannies. How long were you with the Milwaukee Dancing Grannies? Um, how long? Yes. Eight years. Okay. And... Um, how would you describe, first of all, how many people at that time were in the Dancing Grannies, approximately? Uh, there were nine of us in the parade. Can you describe, um, you got, were you guys friends, close? Did you see each other often? We were like sisters. We were a sisterhood. Did you meet regularly for practices? Every week. Okay. Without fail, pretty much? And we had some social outings. And then we see each other again every weekend for a parade. So would it be fair to say that the nine people that were at the parade on November 21st, you knew pretty well? Very well. Is it normal for the dancing granny to, grannies to be part of parades? Oh, yes. We do lots of parades. <laughs> we do about 21 of them in summer and about five to six in winter. Did you, you talked about practices. Did you have um, certain numbers that you did for, for example, for the Christmas parade this past year in November? Yes, we do Christmas routines and Christmas for the holidays. And then we do different type of routines for summer. Okay. In November, did you, would you have a pretty standard formation that you would keep to do each of your routines during the parade? Yes. Did you have uniforms? Yes, we did. Can you describe them for the jury? Objection, ribbon. Overhold, you may answer. Brown skirt. Uh, they were long skirts with white fur. They were blue with white fur on the bottom. Blue jackets with white fur for cuffs and around the neck and a white fur hat. Did you have, I'm assuming if you were dancing to music, that you had something that played the music? Yes, we have a music vehicle. Where would that musical music vehicle be in relationship to the group who was performing? Right behind the group. Oh, hold on, there's uh, been an objection. Um, it's noted, it's overruled, her answer may stand. Just in the future, if there is an objection, uh, wait until I've ruled on it and then answer if I say uh, overruled, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, relevance. Grounds for the relevancy. Keep going. Thank you. So did you also have people walking with um, the performers in the parade to give support? 
Uh, yes, we have volunteers. We have two volunteers that carry the banner and a volunteer that will give us ice chips in case we get. Okay. Do you recall who are the two volunteers who are carrying the banner that day? Uh, yes, it was our usual banner carrier, uh, a young girl, Allie, and then at the last minute the gal didn't show up because we have two for the banner. She didn't show up, so Jimmy at the last minute decided to be the other banner carrier. Now when you say Jenny, are you referring to Virginia Sorensen? Yes. And you knew her as Jenny? Yes. Okay, and you said there's also another support person who carried ice chips. Yes. Do you know who that was last year? Overruled. You may Rouse. answer. Rouse for the I should You can answer. Okay. okay. Yes. Rouse Bill. One of our dancing granny's husbands. Is that Wilhelm Hospital? Is that his full name? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now I have before you a document that's marked States Exhibit 54. Okay. Do you um, see that in front of you? Yes, that's okay. pretty much our group. Okay. So it consists of um, nine different, it looks, why don't you describe for the jury exactly what's in front of you? Objection. Overruled. Grounds. Jimmy Hansen. Okay, we have nine people that were in the parade. And when there are an uneven number, there is somebody who is in the slot. Okay. And uh, it was my turn to be in the slot. Okay. <laughs> so. okay. So on the top of the sheet, and I'm, I have a copy in front of me, so if we're going from the top down, um, we have the names, it, it says banner, and then on the, the left hand side as I'm looking at that, it's Ginny Sorensen and Allie, is that correct? Yes. And I'm going to actually um, ask that this be published also for the jury and admitted into evidence. Objection. And we have yet to see what, what's being talked about being shown. Does Mr. It's up now. Brooks have a copy? I believe it's up in front of him now. All right. I'll give him a minute to look at it. Objection. Not consent to being called that name, nor do I agree to being called that name. All right. The record should reflect that the um, Exhibit 54 is being displayed on the monitors at the pr present time to the parties, to the court, and to the witness. Um, there's been an offer or a request by the state that the court receive the exhibit um, based upon the testimony of this witness. Uh, exhibit 54 is received permission to publish as granted. Objection. Noted. On what grounds? Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to be specifically addressing, uh, when, so please respect that. Um, I respectfully the, request a legal re reconsideration of your ruling. Mr. Brooks, now is not the time for that. The objection has been overruled. I expect that you will honor that, and we will continue without interruption. Go ahead. I do, I do honor it, Your Honor. Um, for the record, I respectfully, respectfully reject that ruling and take exception to that ruling. Keep going. Thank you. So in the upper left-hand corner, the name Ginny Sorensen, um, in the middle it says Banner and then Alley. Um, Ginny was Virginia Sorensen. She was carrying the banner with Allie, correct? Yes. And they would be in the front as the group is going down the parade route? Yes. And the nine people who are listed in the boxes following or behind the banner, does that accurately reflect the lineup that um, you had on November 21st of last year? Yes. Okay. Overruled. You, her answer may stand. Wow. Your Honor, I'm now going to show the witness exhibit 53, just the witness only. Go ahead. And let me know when you see it up on your screen. It's done. Okay. I'm going to show you a couple seconds of it. I'm just going to ask you if this accurately depicts uh, your group on November 21st of last year. So I'm going to play a couple seconds. It's starting at 00, zero and uh, let's play it for five seconds. This is my group coming up. And does that accurately reflect how your group on November 21st of last year? 
Okay. Um, <laughs> I would... Sorry, you were shaking your head yes. Is that a yes? Yes, that's how it was. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have said that out loud. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. That's um, what I'm here for, to make sure the record's clear. Okay. I would ask the court to admit um, this Exhibit 53 into evidence and um, publish it for the jury. Objection. Overruled Exhibit uh, 53 is received permission to publish as granted. Grounds for the overrule. Ma'am, I'm going to play it straight through and then we'll go back and go through it um, and pause it occasionally for you and I to identify everyone, okay? Objection. Grounds for the overrule, Your Honor. The statement continue. Is that a legal determination that you don't have to give me the grounds for the overrule as I have objected on Mr. the record? Brooks, stop interrupting. I've made my ruling. Let's keep going. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as for a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law, or is that a tactic agreement, Your Honor? Your Honor, just for the record, this is one minute and 27 seconds now. That was the routine at the beginning of the parade, it looks like. Is yes. Correct? And will you be able to identify each of the people if I go through the exhibit and kind of pause it occasionally for you to tell us um, who they are and a little bit about them? Objection, Thank you. Overruled. Uh, grounds for the overrule. Not hearsay. Go ahead. Okay, so I'd ask that we begin playing it without sound at zero zero. If we can pause it. Um, again, can you circle Virginia Sorensen on the screen? The screen in front of you is touch. Okay. This is Ginny. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about Ginny? Ginny was our glue. She held the group together. She was in the group the longest. And I think she was in the group for close to 20 years. So she was in there for a long time. Um, she was close to everybody. Like I say, we were like sisters. And she, if you had a problem, she would always ask you about it, talk to you about it. Judy was always there. Okay. If we can continue on, it stopped, I'm sorry, at one second. If we can uh, continue on from one second. <coughs> If we can pause it. Okay, and now that's Lee and Sharon. Okay, so who is on, as we're looking at this video, who's on the right side? The right side would be Sharon. Lee is on the left. She was right behind uh, Ginny. And I'm just going to uh, direct you to Exhibit 54. I'm just sorry. In front of you. I didn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I misunderstood. When you say the left side, the left side of the street was where Lee Owen was, or the left side of the uh, picture as you're looking at your screen? Uh, Lee was on the left, oh. right behind Ginny. Miss the, Oops. it's okay. Uh, there's been an objection. Um, it's overruled, but I would caution the state about leaving the witness. Okay. 
Go ahead. You may answer. Okay. So okay. right behind Ginny was Lee Owen. Yes. Is her name full name Leanna Owen? Lee was. <coughs> Lee was very close to Ginny. <coughs> they worked together a lot for, for the group, and for she taught a lot for the new people that were coming in. She was more or less the leader to teach them the routines. And uh, I rode with Ginny to every, not Ginny, but Lee. I rode with her to every practice we rode together. So we were quite close to. Okay. And um, next to Lee, you said, stated according to Exhibit 54, that would be Sharon Millard? Yes. Okay. And I'm going to focus on the people that were injured um, during the parade, okay? So um, next, if we can continue on, we stopped. Well, before you move on, can you tell me where that was paused? In 11 seconds. Thank you. If you continue on from 11 seconds. <coughs> and pause. The state has paused at 21 seconds. Okay. There's a um, woman who seems to be between, um, in back of um, Lee and Sharon. Do you recognize that person? That would be Betty. Okay. And do you know Betty's last name? Betty String. <laughs> String. Okay. And did you know her very well? Uh, she was fairly new. She was only in the group for a couple years. Okay. And so, but we knew each other quite well. Would she go out on the events with you and you do social events? Absolutely. Okay. And I think I said it, I stopped at 21 seconds, if we can continue on. If we can pause it. The state has paused at 28 seconds. Behind Betty, um, there are two women who are in the forefront of the uh, video that mm -hmm. stopped. Um, the person that would be dancing on the left-hand side of the street as you're walking down the street, do you know who that is? That would be Kathy Schmeling. This was her first parade. Okay. Can you um, <laughs> circle her where she's standing on the okay. screen? Okay. I go the way she's going, on the right side or left? Um, circle who you think is Kathy Schmeling. Okay. Kathy would be on the, yeah, on the right. She would be right there. Okay. And um, you said the other person was who? Lola. Okay, can you circle Lola? Hospel. She is the wife of Bill that was hit. Okay. Who? Um, noted, it's overruled her answer, may stand. Next question. Grouse. And you stated that Wilhelm or Bill was a support person that was marching the parade that day? Yes. What did you know about Lola? Lola was the mother figure. She was, I think, the oldest in the grannies. And uh, she was rather on the quiet side, but she was just friendly with everyone. Okay. Was she in the grannies when you joined eight years? Oh, yes. Before? She was in quite a long time, similar to Ginny. Okay. Um, so continuing on from 28 seconds, I'd ask um, that we continue playing it. If we can pause. The state paused at 34 seconds. Um, do you, can you identify the person who is behind Lola and uh, Kathy on, in the video? Yeah, she would be in the middle. That is... Lola, there's been an objection. It's overruled. Grouse. Um, she may answer. Grouse. That's Tamara. Um, Rosentier. It's hard to pronounce her name, but Rosentier. Rosentreeter? Would that sound right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you circle her on the screen? Okay. That's her right there. Okay. And what can you tell us about uh, Ms. Rosentreeter? She was, um, I would say, about 
five years into the group, four to five years, and um, fun person, very friendly. Okay. All of us are very friendly. <laughs> okay, you, you seem like you might be. <laughs> okay, if we can clear the screen and continue from 34 seconds. And if we can pause the screen here. Okay. Okay, the next um, two people are behind um, Ms. Rosentreter. Tamara, yeah. And um, can you identify those people? Yes. This is Tamara Duran. So you had two Tamaras on your, your team? Yes, we do. Okay. And two Kathys, too. But, okay. And this is Kathy. Is that Zartek? Zartek or something like that. Um, hold on. There has been an objection. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I'll sustain the objection on um, leading grounds. Her answer may stand, but I would, again, caution the state to... <laughs> And I would just note for the record, Exhibit 54 is in front of this witness, and it does have the first and last names, and she's already said that it accurately reflects um, the people who are marching with the Dancing Grannies on November 21st of last year. That was not the question. It was, it was leading. Understood. Um, for purposes of identification, though, I'm going to instruct her to turn the 50, Exhibit 54 over to make sure that her testimony today is from her recollection and not from reading from a form. So if you could turn that over, please. The paper document that oh. you have. There you go. Thank you. Go ahead. Now you circled, <laughs> uh, can you circle Tamara Durand again, Tamara? Okay, this is Tamara Durand. Okay. This okay. would be Kathy Z. Okay. Um, direct your attention to Ms. Durand. Can you tell us a little bit about her? I'm sorry. Directing your attention to Ms. Durand. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about her? She was new, and this, again, was her first parade. She was so excited about being a granny because she had worked for months and months to learn all the routines. And when she knew she would be in that Christmas parade, she was so excited. She just couldn't wait. So. She was looking forward to doing all the parades. That was the first and last parade she ever did. If we can clear the screen and continue on with the video from 42 seconds. And pause it. Okay. Last but not least, that hopefully you get me. this one. Okay, that's you. That's me. Okay, if you can circle you on the diagram, I think there's only one person in it. Um, and you said you've been with the Dancing Grannies for eight years, correct? Yes. Okay, if we can clear this, and I stopped it at one minute and nine seconds. If we can t continue forward. I'm going to pause. That's the music vehicle. Okay. <clears throat> Who drove that vehicle on that day? Pardon? Who drove the vehicle on that day? My husband. Okay. And you see a, a, a um, figure entering into the screenshot. Um, do you know who that is? This would be Bill. Okay. Thank you. And that's uh, Bill Wilhelm? Pardon? Or do you know the last name? It's been rephrased. Bill. Okay. That would be Bill Hospital. Okay. And do you recall him wearing a hat that day, as shown in the picture? Objection, leading the witness. <coughs> um, overruled. Grounds. Relevance. You may answer. Okay. Bill was just walking up behind uh, Tamara Duran, and he going to be offering the, her some ice. I'm not sure you heard the question, if the state could re-ask it. Certainly. Was, in looking at the picture, was Mr. Hospital wearing a hat that day? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. 
And during pretty much the um, entire route of the parade, um, was he usually was he usually in back of you or in front of your position? He's on the side of us. Okay. And usually on the the side that he's on right now. Sometimes he would be on the other. Okay. It just depended how many people we had to give ice okay. on any particular parade. Okay. And was it cold that day? Do you remember? Yes, it was pretty cold. <laughs> okay. Um, I did stop the video at 1 minute and 20 seconds, and I am done with this exhibit. At some point during the parade, did you hear, strike that, were you always, with the formation that you've testified about, were you always the last dancer um, in the formation? No. On November 21st, 2021, were you, all, were you the last dancer in the formation throughout that um, parade route? For this parade, I was. Okay. We took, to, if there's an even number, nobody is in the <clears throat> slot. But if there's an odd number, there was no partner, so we just would take turns. Each different person at each different parade would be in the slot. Okay. So at some point, did you hear something unusual behind you during the parade? No, because the music vehicle was right behind me. Okay. Did so, you at any time turn around and see something unusual? Yeah, as we were going and I was dancing, when I would turn my, I seen a streak of red coming on my right side. How fast was that streak of red going? It was going say, pretty fast. Hold on. Um, the objections noted it's overruled. Her answer may stand. Grounds for the overrule. Relevance. So your answer stands, which you said it was going pretty fast? Yes, it just like whizzed past me. It wasn't just going slow. As it was going past you, who was in the area prior to it going past you on, and I'm assuming you lifted your right arm, was that on your right side as you were marching down Main Street? Yes. Okay. Who was in that area prior to that red street coming through? Uh, Kitty Corner for me, that would be Bill and uh, Tamara Duran. Did you get the opportunity to see what that red streak was? Uh, yeah, and shortly, in a few seconds later, the red uh, vehicle was right in front of me, going down the center of, to me, just pointing to the center of the parade route. So right in front of you? Yes. How close did that red streak come to you? I would say a few feet. He had to go around the car, the music vehicle. Okay. And then the right, right, on the right side, and that's when Bill and Tamara were hit. So when you were in front, um, or I'm sorry, in the back of the parade lineup, um, how far were you directly in front of the music car? Uh, several feet. And the red vehicle that you've identified, it went to the right of it the music car? It came from the right side, yes. And you stated it hit Bill and Tamara, correct? They were the first ones because they were just kitty corner from me, several feet. Then where did it go? Um, the, then I noticed I didn't see them get hit because it all happened so quick that I was still dancing and all of a sudden I seen the red car in front of me and I screamed either in my head or out loud, I don't know which, but I said, what is he doing? Where's he going? And I just screamed it because it was so unusual, and I knew if he was going down the center of the parade route, he was going to be hurting a lot of people. And he wasn't going slow. He was going at a good clip. Did, from the time that you saw the red vehicle on your right, um, striking Bill and Tamara, did it ever, did you see it slow down at all? 
Did I what? See the vehicle slow down. No, it just hit them. And as he was coming in, he, he started then going toward the middle where he hit two more people and then veered to the left and killed two more. You said you, it was a red vehicle. Did you get a general description of the vehicle? What type of car? Was it a car, a sedan, a pickup truck? And no, it was a, like a SUV or something. It was a, wasn't just a car. It was a van or, you know, something on that or SUV. So as the vehicle went through, did it stop after it um, struck? I think you said it struck the people in the front. Who were the people that you just testified to that died? Objection, lead the witness. Overruled. Grounds. Uh, he came from the right. Oh, Hit two oh wait, wait, whoops. Sorry. <laughs> Was not leading. Go ahead. You may answer. It came from the right. Hit two people, and then veered toward the middle, that's when I really see them, and then hit two more people, veered to the left, and hit two more. And the last two people that were struck, do you know who those people were? Yes, I believe they were Jimmy and um, Lee. And you testify that both of those people died as a result of being struck? They were killed instantly. And because the car came from the Hold back, on. oops. That's okay. There's not a question. Wait till the question is asked. Okay. <laughs> After the car struck Jenny, and she would have been in the, the front of the parade still carrying the banner, is that correct? Yes. Uh, she was on the far left, right in front of Jenny. After that occurred, um, did you see the vehicle stop? No. Vehicle kept going? Yes. Did you see the path of travel it took after it um, struck Ginny? Well, after it struck Ginny, it was sort of on the left side of the street, and it just kept barreling through. Okay. I'm going to bring up Exhibit 54 again. Go ahead. And I'd ask that be published to the jury. It's previously been admitted into <coughs> evidence. Go ahead. Check it. What's the relevancy of the video? It's exhibit 54, the court's already admitted it. It is shown to the jury. Go ahead. Ma'am, can you, when the car went through, can you approximate, approximate where Bill was on this chart? You can put an X where you think he was. Bill was about uh, here. I thought the sheet wasn't being shown. Um, you specifically made a ruling for the sheet to be turned over. Uh, that was during her testimony. She's now being asked to annotate the exhibit. So it's proper. Your objection's noted. It's overruled. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, can you um, show the jury using this chart, and maybe you just using a line, the path that the red um, vehicle took? It struck there, hit Tamara, Betty, Lee, and then Ginny. Thank you. If we can take a screenshot of that, and it would be State's Exhibit 54A, I believe. And you stayed after it struck your group, it continued going in the left hand? Yes. Side. Do you know what group was in front of you? What was in I'm sorry, do you know what parade group was in front of the dancing grannies? Um, and if you don't remember, that's okay. Yeah, so. I'm not real sure. Okay, that's fine. Um, for the record, uh, the court did capture the annotation and marked it as 54A. Okay. <clears throat> After the vehicle went by, what did you do? After the ve I when I noticed that vehicle in front of me, and then it went to toward the left and continued going down. It all happened in a matter of seconds. And after the car kept going, I looked on the road and all I seen were bodies. I thought I was in a war because there were just so many. And I just went into shock and I just grabbed my jacket 
like this and went to each body to see who it was and if I could help. I'm gonna, you said that you grabbed your jacket. You held both um, sides of your jacket up to your neck area. Would that be a fair statement? Yes, yes. I just, Objection I think that Hold on. Okay. The objections noted, it's overruled. Her answer and the description provided for the record by Attorney Basie, I would note, was accurate. Um, you may continue. Grounds for the overrule. Already noted. Go ahead, Attorney Basie. Um, so you said that you were in shock. Um, I just went into shock seeing the body. So I just, I needed to hold on to something, I think. So I just grabbed this and just went from body to body. And then the people were running into the road with blankets and the, uh, anybody that was in the medical group quick came and were helping the people that were laying in the road to see if they could help. The people that you saw laying in the road were all of those people from your group? Objection, yes. hearsay. Overruled, not hearsay. <coughs> Just a reminder, once again, let me rule on the objection before you answer. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Can you walk us through who you went up to and what you observed after you said you started going to each of the bodies to check and see if you could help? Um, like I say, the people from the sidewalk, they just ran into the road to help. Spectators? Spectators from the sidewalk, yes. They were wonderful to try to help, bringing blankets to cover the people, to keep them warm. Um, then there was someone from the, I think it was the tavern, the bar right there, and someone came out and had us, kind of corralled us, me, Sharon, and Kathy, into the tavern to give us some warm coffee or something to drink. But I couldn't stay in there. I had to be out there. And I had to know what was going on and how badly everybody, anybody was hurt. So when you came out, who did you go up to? I, then I went up back, I was on the road again, and just looking who was being helped and who was not quite being helped yet and how badly they were hurt. I could not even find Tamara and Lee. Okay, and when you say Tamara, Tamara Durand or Tamara Rosentreter? Durand. Okay, so you couldn't find Tamara or Lee Owen? Okay. Sorry. Did you hear her ask, was that Lee Owen? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, the two of them. Okay. I couldn't find. <laughs> the rest of the people were accounted for, but I didn't know where they were, so when they were hit, they went flying on the sidewalk. So, and that's why I didn't see him on the road. Okay. You saved yourself, Kathy Zadarzduk, um, Kathy Schmeling. The three of you went into the bar initially. Is that correct? Um, when they came out, they told us, you know, come on in here and get warm and have something warm to drink. And Were you injured as a result from, did you get struck by the, the red vehicle? No. Did uh, you see injuries, or do you know if Kathy Schmeling or Kathy Z Zdarstek got hit by the red vehicle? I don't believe so, because Sharon, Kathy, and I were, uh, Kathy Z, were kind of walking in the road trying to see if everyone was being helped. How about you said Sharon was also looking to see if people were being helped. Did yes. you observe any injuries on Sharon? No. We were the three, more or less, that, and the fourth one was Kathy Schmeling, and she immediately went on the sidewalk, and I think it was a sister, or someone was in the, on the sidewalk watching the parade. She quick ran up to Kathy and took Kathy right home. 
Kathy's sister, Kathy Schmeling's sister took Kathy Schmeling home? Yes, because she was crying standing there on the side, on the sidewalk, and she was kind of uncontrollable. Okay. So let's go, who were the first people that you saw as you walked out to check on people? Um, Sharon, I seen her. I'm sorry, of the injured people. Oh. Uh, who did you see of the injured people? Um, approximately where were they and what did you observe? Okay, I went straight ahead and it was mainly Tamara. Uh, Rosen Trader? Yes. <laughs> and then it was um, Betty String. Were they both on the ground? Yes, they were laying in the road. Did you see, um, were they and, able to move? Pardon? Were they able to move? Um, not much, because the people were telling them to lay still, because I believe they had two skull fractures, and they didn't want her to move her head or anything. But yet she was awake, and she could talk. Okay. So. How about Tamara Rosentreter? Now, she had several broken bones, ribs, arm and wrist, leg. Um, so she had a lot of broken bones, but she too could talk and communicate. How about Lola Hospital? Lola immediately ran to her husband. She was, he was laying kind of on the sidewalk, because when he was hit, he just went toward the sidewalk. And now he was hurt. He wasn't killed instantly. And she had a blanket for him, and she stayed with him until the ambulance came and took him to the hospital. Did Bill recover from the injury sustained by that vehicle? No, he didn't. He died during surgery. Did you um, note any injuries or find out of any injuries to Lola Hospital? No. And uh, Lee, Owen, you said you could not find. Did you find Lee at all that evening? Yes. Later, the police had me identify her. They had her picture on their phone. And because uh, I asked where Lee was, and they showed me this Lee. And um, it was her. She was thrown on the sidewalk. That's why I didn't see her in the road. Do you know what side of the sidewalk she was, or what side of the road she was thrown on? She was on the left. So as you're marching down Main Street, she was on the left side? Yes, she was right behind Ginny. Okay. And the picture that they showed you of Lee, was she alive when they took that picture? No, she was killed instantly. And Ginny, did you see Ginny that night? Ginny was killed instantly also. She was right there on the road. Again, on the left-hand side? Yes. And did you go by Bill Hospital? Bill was on the right side. He, he kind of was thrown on the sidewalk. Did you go by him at all? Or? Yes. Objection. Okay. I talked to him. Hold I, up. There's been an objection. Oh, I didn't hear him. <laughs> um, it's overruled. And yeah. her answer that she gave me. I didn't even state the objection, but... I'm going to show you what's been previously marked and admitted into evidence, which is Exhibit 15. It's going to show up on your screen, okay? Do you see, let me know when you see it in front of you. And okay. I'd ask that it be published to the jury as well. It's previously been admitted into evidence. Go ahead. Thank you. Ma'am, can you, um, is this look to be Main Street, the parade route from November 21st of 2021? Objection. Being the witness. Sustained as to the form of the question, please rephrase. Do you know what Exhibit 15 is? Um, no, I don't know what this really is. Okay. Do you see, does it appear to be a map or something else? Objection. Pardon? Being the witness. Okay. Um, overruled, she may answer that. Does it appear to be a map? or something else? Yes, where there's a lot of names and kind of a map. Okay, do you see uh, a purple line on that map? 
Yeah, with all the purple stars on. Cr or, I don't know if they're purple stars, but I see some yellow stars, some orange stars. Yes. Objection, yes. leading the witness. Um, this has previously been marked and admitted into evidence. I think Wait. I can direct her attention I, to these items. Agreed. I think your objection is noted. It's overruled. This exhibit has previously been received. I think the stars are the color are pretty obvious. What they are. There's various color stars, and it's again, the exhibit has been stars. received. The jury can determine for itself later on um, what colors they are, the meaning of them. Uh, but go ahead. You may ask uh, your next question of this witness. And you see the street that uh, the long street that's depicted on Exhibit 15. Do you see a name on that street? Okay. Do you see it? Yes. And what is it? Um, I see all the stars. I don't know what the question. Do you see a name on the street on the map? Okay. Let me see. For Main example, okay. Main Street, Broadway. Yes. So is Main Street the, the street that you were on when you were marching and your group got hit? I believe it was. Okay. Now, if you go to look to the um, bottom left, there is a box that's labeled Dancing Grannies. Do yes. you see that? Yes. And it has um, six names, seven names in that box. Are, are those all part of the Dancing Grannies? Objection. Leading the witness. Overruled, she may answer. Grounds. She may I answer. answer. Go ahead. Um, with the exception of Bill, he was Lola's husband. Yes. But I'm sure he would appreciate that distinction that he was not one of the dancers. <laughs> right. Um, all of those people were associated with the dancing grannies? Yes. And the people in red are the ones that you testified are, are deceased as a result of being struck that day? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And the other three that are in green are those people who were injured as a result of being struck that day? Okay, one, two. Yes, Lola wasn't really injured. She just was with Bill when he was injured okay. to keep him calm. Okay. And you see that there's a black line that directs it to a yellow star. Do you see that? Objection, being a witness. Yes. Um, overruled, this exhibit has previously been received. It's fair for the state to direct the witness's attention to a particular part. And her answer may stand. Does that appear to be the location where your group was struck? Okay, yes. It does? It looks like it would be, yes. Thank you. We can take that off the screen. I'd now like to show exhibit. 55. Go ahead. I'm assuming just to the witness. Yes, just to the witness. Um, if we can play it for approximately, first of all, do you see it in front of your screen? Yes. Okay. Starting at zero, zero, we're going to play it for approximately 10 seconds, um, and then I'll ask you some questions about it, okay? Does that accurately depict what occurred to your group on November 21st, 2021? Yes, it does. I'm going to um, ask that it be admitted into evidence and published to the jury. Objection. Overruled. Browse. It's relevant. Permission to publish is granted. Exhibit 55 is received. And Your Honor, this clip is 15 seconds long. I would ask that the um, full clip be played at this time. Go Ma'am, the group that you saw on the right-hand side of the screen, was that the Dancing Grannies? Yes, it was. And did you see headlights coming through your group? No, because it came from the back. I'm sorry, in the video, did you see headlights oh, coming yes. through your group? Oh, yes. Objection, Lee. Yes. Overruled. She may answer. And you answered? 
Yes. Okay, thank you. And was that the path of travel you recalled seeing the red vehicle take as it went by you on the right and went through your group? Yes. Okay. I want to show it one more time for the jury so that they can now focus on the headlights on the vehicle. Objection. Relevancy. Uh, your objection's noted. It's overruled. Uh, permitted to publish once again. Grounds. Is granted. And your honor, the state is going to play it at 50%. Grounds. Objection. Grounds. Noted. Overruled. Grounds. Relevance. Okay. If you can start, and please. I request a legal reconsideration of your ruling. Denied. Grounds of the denial. For the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling? Is that a legal determination, Your Honor? Are you making a judicial determination? You may continue. May I, did you see the body come forward and fly front, in front of the truck? Um, no, me being in back. I'm sorry, in the video, did you see the body? Objection. Flying in front of the truck. It's not no. moving. In the video that you just saw, you didn't see a body? Oh, yeah, on the video, but not. Right. And do you know who that was? Um, yes. Who was that? Uh, when they had it on TV, that was no. the man, right? I'm sorry. Who was the bo the body that went flying in the street that came towards the front of the screen? Hold on one second. That last answer, I'm going to, because it was non-responsive, but I'm going to strike it instruct the jury to disregard it and then if you could state your question again certainly um, if we can go to um, exhibit 55 again to approximately the 10 second mark are you withdrawing that last question then yes I am. okay thank you the question it's been withdrawn from the record it's been withdrawn May be struck from the record. It, there does not need to be struck. So the request is denied. It's been withdrawn. May I ask for a legal and factual The marks of the attorneys and questions of the attorneys are not evidence. It's the answers that are evidence. So that's why it's not being struck. You may continue, Attorney Basie. Thank you. Do you see a body probably in the middle of the screen on the left hand side? On the ground? Yes. Do you know who that is? Well, it's hard to tell who it's, but it, that would probably be Ginny. Okay, thank you. I'm now gonna show you, um, just you, it'll be in front of you on the screen, Exhibit 152. <coughs> exhibit 152 is 14 seconds in length. I'm going to uh, show it to the witness, the entire 14 seconds, to see if she recognizes this. Do you recognize what's depicted in that video as what occurred and what you saw on November 21st of last year? Uh, yes, okay. but when the car went, hit them, it was, you know, it was on my side and I didn't see them flying okay. or anything. I Correct. just... But you saw the car come through, and you previously testified that you saw the car strike them. You didn't see where they went. Is that Objection correct? Objection, leaving the witness. Um, overruled. That answer may stand. I'm going to ask that this be admitted into evidence and published to the jury. Objection. Where's the relevancy? Grounds the objection's relevance. noted. It's overruled. And Exhibit 152 is received. Permission to publish is granted. Grounds for your ruling, Your Honor. Relevant. I'm going to play it at full speed initially, and then I'm going to play it at 50%. So I will ask you questions after I play it full speed, okay? Mm -hmm. If we can uh, play the whole 15 seconds with some.
Ma'am, who did that red vehicle strike um, in that exhibit, <coughs> Exhibit 152? Objection. Leading the witness, uh, saw the video. Tomorrow, saw the video. Oh, there's been an Oops. objection, everyone. Um, the objection is noted, it's overruled. Now you may answer Ground, the question. Grounds for the overrule, Your Honor. <coughs> it's overruled, you may answer. Grounds for the overrule, Your Honor. Go ahead, you may Tomorrow, answer. Tomorrow, Duran. Thank you. I'm now gonna play it at 50% speed for the jury. And that was the car that you saw travel in front of you? Yes. Objection leading the witness. Overruled. Grounds for the overrule, Your Honor. It's overruled. Next Grounds. question. Ma'am, I'm now gonna, um, if I did not already do it, I'd ask that Exhibit 52, 152 be admitted into evidence. I would then direct the witness's attention to Exhibit 153, which will show just in front of your screen, okay? Grounds. Um, exhibit 152 was received already. No need to address the request for grounds by Mr. Brooke due to that. And then the exhibit is up in front of the court, the witness, and the parties, but not published. Objection. I do not consent to or agree to being called that name, Your Honor, for the record. Go ahead, Attorney Basie. Thank you. This clip Would is... Would that be noted for the record, Your Honor? Go ahead, Attorney Basie. Thank you. May this... that be... Noted for the Mr. record. Mr. Brooks, Honor. stop interrupting. I just want to make Mr. sure. Mr. Brooks, on, stop. I just want to make sure it's on the record. Go ahead, Attorney Basie. Thank you. Um, this clip is 38 seconds in, in length, Your Honor. Um, again, I'm going to show you the first five seconds of this clip and ask if it um, accurately reflects your observations from um, November 21st of last year. <laughs> if you can start. Ma'am, is that um, your group in the Waukesha Christmas Parade last November? Yes. Okay. I'd ask that Exhibit 153 be admitted into evidence and be published for the jury. Objection. Relevancy. Exhibit 153 is received. It may be published to the jury. The objection is noted and overruled. Ma'am, I'm going to have it played at full speed, and then I'll ask you some questions and then play it at half speed, okay? Mm -hmm. Ma'am, what did you see in Exhibit 153 that was just played before you? I seen Bill being hit and thrown towards the sidewalk. And that's Bill Hostel? Yes. Okay. And um, I'm going to show it now to, the, to you and the jury. Just a clip of it, starting at zero seconds. At 50% speed, what I'm going to be asking you about is where you are in this clip, OK? So if you can start it. <laughs> See, we may have a future granny in, in front of us here with the green hair. Sure looks like it. Objection. <laughs> Rather than see. Um, your objections noted, sustained. The jury will strike that last question and answer. And the jury will disregard that last answer. Now, if you look at the street, Pause. Sorry, keep going. Mm 
we can pause it now at 21 seconds. I would just ask, did you see after Bill Hospital was struck, did you see some feet <laughs> coming through the screen on the bottom at the very end of that clip? Objection, relevant. I've seen him in the oh. legs, yeah. Okay, and then did you see your feet, Mark, <clears throat> that would have been the approximate area that he was hit? Did you see your feet in the video at the end? It's fine if you didn't. It's Not really. really. Nice. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Further, thank you. Ma'am, I'm going to give Mr. Brooks an opportunity to ask you questions as well. Please answer those for him. Go ahead, your cross. Uh, during your testimony, you kept referring to um, a he, he, he. Uh, who were you referring to when you said he, he, he? I can't understand him. Can you please uh, state your question a little bit louder? She's not even yeah. here. I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry. You um, need to be closer to the microphone or projector I, voice, I, okay? I got it. I got it. Thank you. Um, during your testimony, you kept referring to a he, he, he. Like a lot of times you would say he, he, he. Uh, who were you referring to by the he? Who did you mean by the he? He? Yes. When it was showing Bill, no, not, not Bill good. would be the he. Uh, before today, uh, have you seen any of those videos before today? No. Um, you stated that you saw a red vehicle uh, sh strike the the grannies. Do you remember if that was, or let me back up. Do you remember what type of vehicle you saw? It was like an SUV. It wasn't just a car. It was, you know, the flat back. I'm bad for cars. And all I know is I've seen the red streak, and then all of a sudden, I've seen the car in front of me. So would you describe it as a car? Um, it was a vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> and how close did it come to you, if you recall? I would say several feet. I was in front of the music vehicle, and it came around the, the music vehicle on the right side, and that's where Bill and Tamara were. And I was a little bit this way because I was directly behind the music vehicle. Were you, were you able to see into the vehicle in any way? Was I able to what? To, to see inside of the vehicle. No, because it came behind me. So, so you didn't get a look at the driver at all? No, I don't have eyes in the back of my head. Do you recall what happened when people were struck by the vehicle? No, I couldn't see them being struck from where I was. Like the vehicle was big and it was after the vehicle went through our group that I seen all the people that were struck. Um, earlier you testified to uh, people being thrown to the side of the street. Um, would it be fair to say that and, and I'm going off your last answer to the last question. Would it be fair to say that you didn't see that with your own eyes? No, that's where they were found. But you didn't see it with your own eyes? No, I couldn't. Sorry about that. 
Um, you also stated that a few of the people that were struck died instantly. Would that be fair to say? That died instantly, you mean? Yeah, you, you stated that a few people that were struck died instantly. Would that be fair to say? Some of them, yeah. And... Two were injured and... How, how would you know for sure that they died instantly if you didn't see them struck? Because uh, the police found uh, two of them on the sidewalk, one on the left, one on the right. They were already dead. So were you told by the police that they were dead? That what? Were you told by the police <clears throat> that they had passed away? I could see they were working on them and weren't getting anywhere. They were trying to get the heart started with the heart machines. Nothing was working. And you, you know that for sure? I seen them working on them, yes. Not but, all of them, but on some of them. So was it fair to say at that time that you had no uh, medical diagnosis at that point in time? Nobody gives nobody diagnosis. They just were working on them and trying to get them revived, but so, they couldn't do it. So it would be fair to say at that time you had no knowledge of the injuries sustained? Um, no. You stated that, uh, I believe it was uh, a Kathy. Did you know a Kathy that was part of your uh, group? Yes, two Kathys. You stated, I don't remember which one, but you stated that one of the Kathys um, had a sister or something? Yes, was... in, on the sidewalk watching the parade. Um, do you recall the sister's name? No. Are you sure it was a sister or maybe just a relative? Could have been a sister or a relative. I figured it was a sister. So it would be fair to say you didn't know for sure who it was? That's an answer. It was someone in the oh, family. You may answer. Go ahead, you may answer. Okay, it was someone in her family that was trying to console her, but she was just standing there out of control, weeping and um, you stated that uh, there was a, mu a music van or of My, some sort? Uh, views, a music vehicle. And you also stated that you couldn't hear what was going on behind you because the music van. Would that be fair to say? That's right. I didn't hear anything. I just seen a red streak when it came past me. So would it be fair to say that if a vehicle was honking a horn, you wouldn't have heard it if it was behind you? I don't know. <clears throat> no, there was no horns. But you don't know for sure because you stated that the music was playing pretty loudly. Would that be fair to say? That's for sure. But whether I would hear a horn or not, I don't know. Were you able to see a, a license plates number of the vehicle? No. I was just shocked that a vehicle would be in the parade route. I didn't have time to read a license plate. And you stated uh, that there's a, also a member of your group named Lola. Named what? Lola. Lola, yes. It was her husband, Bill. And she, to, to your knowledge, to your recollection, Lola was not injured? No.
you spoke of uh, you spoke with knowledge of a lot of the injuries. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Um, have you yourself ever had any medical training of any kind? No, my family is all in the medical field. Have you yourself ever no. been in the medical field? No. Did you see anyone behind you struck? No, because I was behind the music vehicle. I mean, in front of the music vehicle. And you yourself were, weren't injured, right? No. no. The car couldn't get at me because they would have to go through the car. You stated um, that you went in inside of a building at, at some point or yes. one of the businesses. Yes. And you you stated that you couldn't stay in there because you wanted to see how bad everything was outside. Would that be fair to say? Well, I was outside first, walking and seeing everybody, then watching them work on them. And the tavern was trying to comfort us by inviting us in for coffee or water or something to get us. But I couldn't stay in there. I had to be out there with them people. Do you recall about how long you stayed in the tavern, I think you said it was, before you yeah, got back, back out? I would say five, between five minutes and ten. So when were you uh, informed by, uh, I guess I would say, uh, medical personnel of the injuries to your group? When I seen them working on them. They had the heart machine on Ginny, and blood was pouring out of her mouth, and, and I knew she was gone. There was so no doubt about it. At, at any time during the incident, did medical personnel come to you and no. tell you injuries? No, just the police came to me to rec to um, to know that where Lee was, because I was wondering where she was, and the police showed me her photo and said that she was gone. At one point in, uh, in your uh, earlier testimony, you pointed to the defendant table and said, that's him from the news. Any reason why you would say that? From the news? I, yeah, didn't, I didn't say that. You, you testified that you saw, you pointed to the defendant's table and said, that's him from the news. And you were cut off right in mid-sentence. I wasn't saying that at all. So have you ever seen any news coverage of the incident? Um, from, like from Lola, I knew that her, that Bill had died during surgery that evening. And so I knew that from her because she was at the hospital with him. I knew about... Um, Ma'am, did you hear the question about uh, about seeing news reports and just be a little more specific on the time. Okay? I don't know what I'll, you I'll, mean I'll about it. news reports. Okay, fair enough. On the regular news or? Let, he'll rephrase. Okay. At any time, did you, do you recall seeing any news reports related to the incident? At any time? It was on the news. Yes. So, so it would be fair to say that you watched reports of the incident when it was on the regular news in the evening was it they didn't cover much of it they just showed that 
the dancing grannies, you know, that. Would it be fair to say you, you learned uh, additional information that you didn't have when you were at the incident from yeah. the news? Uh, not from the news, I didn't know. Okay. I knew from the family. So would it be fair to say that before you received information from the families, you weren't sure of the exact injuries to the grannies in your group? Some of them I knew right away and because you, of the police. Did you know just from observation or were you told? Um, I was pretty much told. And from the videos that you saw here today, which you already stated it was your first time seeing any of those videos. Yes. Did you see anything in those videos today that you didn't see at the time of the incident? Yeah, the people being hit and flying. Once the car was in front of me, it, that's when it left the bodies behind. But you didn't actually see. I the couldn't. The car was in my way. And do you recall who else was not injured from your group besides okay. besides Lola? Uh, the four of us were not injured. Uh, do you recall the names of who was not injured? Um, Kathy Z, Sharon Millard, um, me and Lola and Kathy. The other Kathy, there's two Kathys. Both, both Kathy's, to your knowledge, were not injured? No, they weren't. We were all that was left standing. Do you recall about what time you left the parade after the incident? What do you mean after the incident? Do, do you recall what time you, you left, left the parade? Um, that was when everybody was taken away. And um, I think then we were in the bar having a cup of coffee. And then I had to find a way home because the music vehicle had to stay there because it was a crime scene. So... So Kathy Z's family took her home, so they gave me a ride right away, too. And you don't recall about what time that was? No. That would be fair with, a, with everything else going on. At any time in the, the days following the incident, did you see any reports of a suspect at, at any time? I seen it on the news that a suspect was taken. 
or found, we should say. And and what what are you referencing when you say found? What was I what? Oh, found. In other words, the police found them. I didn't know who, where, or who he was at the time. I don't recall if this question was asked, so I'm going to ask it. Were, were you there with any of your family members, immediate family or anything? My immediate family members, just my husband. And he was driving the music vehicle. Was he in was he injured in any way? No. Outside of being shot by what well, he was seeing. Phys physical. Yeah. Physically, physical injury. Did he no, did he suffer no, any physical? Because he was in the car. Do you recall giving any uh, police statement, or were you interviewed by any law enforcement yes. after the incident? Yes. Do you recall uh, if it was the same night of the incident or in the days following? <laughs> Both, Both, right there at the time, and then the next day. Did you ever uh, file any claims related to the incident? I believe... Not of the incident, no, because I was there when they were talking to the gals that weren't hurt. They were like interviewing us. The the four of you, correct? The four that weren't, uh, the two, yeah, the all two of cats. Us. Yeah, the ones that were left, yeah. Um, do you know if they filed any claims related to the incident? If what? Do you know if they filed any claims related to the incident? Objections. Grounds. Cause for speculation. Grounds. <clears throat> um, the way that he asked it is uh, overruled. Um, so you may answer if you know. Okay. Um, no, because we were all together and came to every interview that they needed from us. Do you recall uh, seeing or reading any complaints related to the incident? Objection. Grounds? Sustained as to the form of the question. You don't have to answer that. Okay. Should I rephrase the question or? It was sustained as to the form of the question. <coughs> At any time during uh, any interviews with law enforcement? Were you shown a complaint related to the incident? Objection, Ben. Grounds? Sustained as to the form of the question. Were you informed that it may be a possibility that you might be called to testify in this matter? Um, a lot later, um, not at the time, we, we, I had no idea of testimony until would you would you say much later as you say would would that refer to weeks months months <laughs> i was in no shape at the time to testify or talk about anything uh 
Do you recall seeking to testify, w wanting to testify? No, I didn't ask to. This just happened when we would be in our interviews with, and then. So it would be, it would be fair to say that you were asked or yes. subpoenaed? Yes. Do you recall by whom? I imagine the DA, sir. <coughs> When you say the DAs, do you mean the district attorney's office? Yes. Did they ever identify to you as being the plaintiff in this matter? Objection. Grounds? Uh, sustained. Next question. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor? Relevance grounds. Do you recall ever being told that there was a plaintiff in this matter? No, it's just I was interviewed a few times, the five of us, um, and that was pretty much the end of it until months ago where... I think probably a little explanation is needed. Um, are you aware what a plaintiff is? Objection relevant. Grounds. Sustained. Next question. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor? Next question, Mr. Brooks. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor? Ask your next question, please. Uh, I, I, I am. I just want to know the grounds, just for the record, the grounds for the sustain. Ask your next question. Your Honor, the grounds should be put Mr. on the Ross. record. Ask your next question. I'll address this all at the next break outside the presence of the jury. Ask your next question. Your Honor, with all respect, I think the Mr. jury Brooks, deserves. Under 90611, ask your next question, or I will determine that the cross examination is now closed. I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm going. I'm going to keep going. I just think the jury deserves to hear. Mr. Brooks, I'm instructing you to stop making those statements. The jury will disregard. This is the cross examination. Know. It's not your opportunity to make legal arguments or. Uh, to testify. You'll have an opportunity if you so choose to do that later. With all respect, Next this, that is not question. questifying. The jury just deserves to know. All right, um, under 90611, um, the cross-examination will be determined. Question, Sir, you didn't follow my very clear instructions. Um, does the state have any follow-up? No, Your Honor. All right, all right thank you, ma'am. You may step objection down. Objection to that, Your Honor. I, your objection's noted. Ma'am, you I may step not. down, and after she steps down, I will be excusing the jury for a few moments. Please rise for the witness and for the jury as they leave the courtroom. Mr. Brooks, please wait. <coughs> you may have a seat, everyone. <coughs> to specifically address the repeated request by Mr. Brooks for the court to state the grounds, sir, I am not legally required to do that. Those are legal determinations uh, that if you feel there is an error later on, you can address on appeal if you are convicted. I have been answering many of them 
uh, at your request, but I may not do that at all times. In fact, you're asking me to provide that explanation and really highlight for the jury um, the court's opinion on relevance. That's why we don't state that. There's an objection, it's a party makes it, states the grounds. Uh, sometimes I ask the opposing party um, for their position. Um, sometimes I do not. Many times it's very self-evident. Either the objections are baseless. Many of the hearsay objections are baseless. Um, your objection to hearsay is it's not hearsay. Uh, so that's why to me they're self-evident. I say sustained and we go forward. So you need to be aware, sir, that when you ask for the grounds, you're asking me to state a legal conclusion in front of the jury, um, which I don't feel is necessary uh, for the reasons that I've already stated, that um, you're asking me to highlight uh, my opinion on relevance and my determination on relevance. So going forward, you need to be aware of that. Um, again, not a sign of disrespect. It's the record. <laughs> is self-evident many, many times. If I feel that more argument is needed, I'll excuse the jury, but I haven't felt the need to do that uh, up until this point. And I will caution you once again, sir, 90611 is the statute mode and order of interrogation and presentation controlled by the judge. The judge shall exercise reasonable control over the mode and order of interrogating witnesses and presenting evidence so as to do all of the following. A, make the interrogation and presentation effective for the ascertainment of the truth. B, avoid needless consumption of time. C, protect witnesses from harassment or undue embarrassment. Um, and it goes on, but for purposes of what I'm going through, that's the most relevant portion of 90611. So when I give you the warning that under 90611, I will cut off your cross-examination, it's because you're violating 90611. And so, is that a judicial determination that I violated 90611 when- I'm advising no. you, sir, um, it's not a specific determination as to anything uh, that's happened thus far, just a summary of why I am relying upon 90611 uh, throughout the uh, questioning of witnesses and the presentation of evidence. Your Honor, um, so with I'm, that, we're going to continue. I'm going to have the state be ready with their next witness. Your Honor, I'm, I'm not interrupting you. I'm letting you make you, a clear record. Mr. I, Brooks, you have actually interrupted me. I just let you go through the whole uh, citing of uh, 90611 without saying anything. I, I'm not asking for the parties to make an argument under 90611. So I'm advising you. you Stop interrupting me, please. I'm advising you, sir, uh, so that you have hopefully more knowledge and awareness as it relates to the statue that I've cited um, dozens of times during this trial. I'm, I'm well aware of what I'm citing, Your Honor. Well aware. <laughs> All right, and so. It, and I'm just seeking for the record to be clear. Um, with all due respect, Your Honor, um, that's judicial misconduct because you're not allowing the jury who deserves to hear certain aspects of testimony. Um, like I stated yesterday, under the Sixth Amendment, I have the right to face my accuser, which means that I can question about clearly the plaintiff being the accuser. How come I can't question about uh, if a witness may know or have had any prior interactions or any conversations or or anything of the sort with the plaintiff who has yet to show their face also i didn't even the reason why i was objecting the way i was is because i was trying to get to the question of um the witness saying that about the four um ladies in her group that were not injured um there's relevancy because with her stating on the record clearly for the record and for your honor and for the court and for the jury that these ladies were not injured in any way but yet there's still charges associated with these with these ladies who were not injured 
that should be dismissed. We are not at that point, sir. The charges I would refer you to the preliminary jury instructions for first degree recklessly endangering safety and the elements or the elements they don't need to prove. There are certain elements. And so um, I'm not going to have a debate with you over the law at this point. I've made my rulings as it relates to certain questions that you have asked and whether they're relevant, whether they're vague, whether they call for speculation or a whole host of uh, reasons that a question can be objected to. I'm not further going to address uh, your uh, position on um, May I request the, a legal reconsideration of finished, the ruling, Your Honor? You interrupted me. I'm not done with what I was trying to say. Um, it was no way you, for me to know that because you paused. I'm sorry. I apologize. Just because I paused doesn't mean I'm done. But so, you paused for quite a while, so I wasn't sure. In any event, sir, we're going to keep going. Um, any error you believe I've made, you can raise again on appeal if you are convicted, but we will proceed forward. Does the state have I'm their not next witness? To available please do not interrupt i'm asking this and that's why question. I just, that's why I was mr just brooks quiet. you're interrupting stop does okay. the state have Come available in. their next witness we do but could we please request a comfort break your honor i'm sorry but we haven't okay. gone about two hours now all right that's as long fine. as we'll they're okay uh 15 minute break that's fine thank you you're welcome for the record your honor this we haven't addressed subject matter uh, jurisdiction off the record mr
Thank you. Be seated. All right, we are back on the record. Then appearances are as they were before. State have their next witness available. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> All right, let's bring the jury back out. I don't uh, consent to being called by the name that this court chooses to identify me by. Um, I'm going to state for the record that I'm here as a third party interviewer on special appearance on behalf of my client. Can that be noted for the record? It was noted this morning. May it be noted again for the record so that we can keep the record clear and accurate. The appearances are as they were this morning. They are no different. Bring the jury out. And we have yet to address subject matter jurisdiction, Your Honor. We still haven't I still haven't been shown any verified proof that All rise. this court has subject matter jurisdiction. And at this point, may I request an affidavit that you, Your Honor, have no bias, no conflict of interest, and no interest in the outcome of this case? Mr. Brooks, the jury's coming out. We'll address your legal issues later, if I deem them appropriate. Judge, do you hold the full Mr. judicial Brooks, power please, of the state, or is please, this the military right, can power? Can you please take the jury out? Thank you. Do you hold the full Mr. Brooks, jurisdiction? Mr. Brooks, just wait until the jury's out, please. I ask that you show that respect. I, I will. I will. Thank you. Yeah. Can be seated, Mr. Brooks. Just make your statements. What do you want to advise the court today? I want to first say, state again for the record that I do not identify by that name, nor do I consent to being called that name. Uh, Your Honor, um, with all respect, I I'm merely asking you do you have the full judicial power of the state, or is this military power? I'm sorry. I don't understand what you're asking me, sir. I'm asking, is and on this- on what legal basis are you I'm, making I'm, that request? I'm asking, for the record, is this a common law, common, common law court or an admiralty court? What, what, what are we in here? And I'm, I'm requesting an affidavit that you, Your Honor, have no bias, no conflict of interest, or no interest in the outcome of this case. Um, and the reason why I'm, I want to state this clearly for the record um, mainly is because of the bias that's been shown. Um, I have not been getting any uh, certified copies of any requests that I've made, which I was told by this court to uh, address inmate communication forms for anything that I that I may need. I've done that. I've complied with that. Every time I've needed something of, of the court pertaining to documents, I've done it the way the court has asked me. And I've always stated that I wanted everything to be certified. I have yet to even get that. My um my court docket sheet was not a certified copy. Um when I asked your honor um, of your oath of office, I asked for that to be certified. You stated for the record that you would not give me a certified copy of your oath of office, which you are required to show if I ask for it. I've, I've brought up um, 
my Sixth Amendment constitutional right that has been pretty much discarded. And that is based on the fact that I have the right to face my accuser, which would be the plaintiff, state of Wisconsin, in this matter. They have yet to show that a claim is, 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 is I mean, a living human being can only make a claim. An entity cannot make a claim. I've requested uh, for the complaint to be provided. The complaint from November 23 of 2021. The amended complaint from November 29th of 2021. The second amended complaint from January 12 of, of this year, 2022. I have yet to see those. Um, there was no record of a bond in my docket sheet. I'm asking that I ask for that to be verified by proof. That hasn't been provided. There's so many um, biases, clear biases, in, 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 in questions that are not being asked based on judicial determinations made by Your Honor. Um, you look at the discrepancies, and, and I think they're clear. Um, I think at minimum I deserve for the subject matter jurisdiction to be verified and proven. I've raised that issue numerous times, pretty much every day, every time I, I, I come before your court, Your Honor, I, I address that, and it has yet to be proven. Uh, my filings have been disregarded, even though they've been filed into the record, even though they've been time-stamped. I haven't got the original copies of, of any of them, which I'm supposed to get. Um, and as we sit here today, I, I, I'm still not even understanding the nature and cause of the of the charges. That hasn't even been proven. Can that be provided in any way? I'm 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 basically sitting here confused because I don't understand why these proceedings are are allowed to continue when there's so many things that have not been provided. They haven't been provided in my discovery. They haven't been provided to me by uh being brought to my uh pile where I'm housed in the jail. I'm without so much information, valid information to this matter. And, and I believe that it should be verified and it should be proven for the record. And if not, I move for this case to be dismissed for failure to appear by the plaintiff and failure to state a claim for which relief can be granted. Everything that I'm saying it has merit and it has validity. As we sit here today, I'm still... Uh, being charged with charges that shouldn't even exist based on the testimony that we've heard for the last few days. There's so many things left to still be proven. The The prosecution team hasn't even proven that they're licensed to practice law in Wisconsin. Are, they haven't proven are they just bar association uh, uh, members or do they have state-issued licenses? That has not been proven, which I've raised that issue for the record. I'm not even sure if that was even recorded in the docket sheet. There's so many things and, and your honor, you still haven't stated for the record if you have full judicial power of the state or is this military power? That hasn't been proven. Nothing is nothing has been proven. Not subject matter jurisdiction, not licenses to practice law. My Sixth Amendment right has been basically trampled over. No complaints have, have been sh shown. Neither of the three that I've requested, by the way that you told me to request them by in inmate communication, um, nothing is certified that I, that I get copies of when I clearly ask for them to be certified and to be filed into the record. Uh, it's, it's to the point where I... Your Honor, you should you should rec recuse yourself from the from the pre uh, presiding at this point. If you're not going to um, abide by the oath that you swore, which was in your oath, correct? You swore to protect the Constitution of the United States. You swore to protect we the people. 
that is not being done here. If every valid argument that I raised is, is, is taken by the court as a sign of disrespect or a sign of trying to intentionally be disruptive or, or uh, causing a problem, when I'm merely seeking understanding because I don't understand, I'm merely seeking to understand why this information has yet to be provided and we're this far into this matter. And there's still no verified proof. I, even as I sit now saying this, there's still no proof being provided. N zero. How is this case allowed to continue without these uh, documents and filings being verified? Is there any legal factual basis that that can state why this information has, has not been provided? Why the docket sheet is incorrect? Why there's so much on the docket sheet that should be on record that's not even in there? That if we had the the uh, the recordings of the record they would see was brought up numerous times that, that doesn't even show up? I'm just I'm just asking for your honor to be fair, which is another right that I have, the right to a fair trial and the right to an impartial jury. It's, I can go on and on and on about what's not what's not being done. I have again, I, I, I say I have the right to face my accuser. Where's where's the injured party? Who's who's making the claim? I asked your honor numerous times. For your honor's name, you wouldn't answer. I asked, did you have a claim against me? You did not answer. I asked the whole courtroom, did anyone have a claim against me? No one said anything. Which you stated for the record a non-responsive answer. A non-responsive answer is, is an agreement. Which will be a tactic agreement by you, your honor, that you don't have to answer these questions that you should be answering. I have that right. The the plaintiff in this matter, which was stated by witnesses in testimony to be the state of Wisconsin. But when I asked, do they see the state of Wisconsin present in the courtroom? The question is shut down, which is a valid question. The plaintiff should be present in this matter. Where is the plaintiff? Who's bringing the who's bringing the claim? Because we know an entity can't bring a claim. It has to be a living, breathing human being. No one is stated for the record if they're the injured party. Not your honor, not the prosecutors, not anyone in the court has stated to be an injured party in this matter. No one. Not one person. I have the right to demand that the court place in the evidence any unrevealed contract. Has that been provided to me? Have that been placed in the evidence? I would like to see it, which is my right. I have the right to inform the jury about the truth in their duty, in their rights. That's the First Amendment and the Sixth Amendment. But I'm repeatedly told to shut the question down when this is valuable information that the jury should be privileged to know. They deserve to know. Once they were chosen to sit on this jury, why are we keeping information away from them that they deserve to know? They ultimately have the power. They decide the matter. Why are we keeping information, valuable information from their knowledge? That's, that's a disservice to the jury. And frankly, it's a dis disservice to the court that they're not allowed to hear things that they should know, that they should be informed of. It's all right to inform them of everything that they have the power to know, to do and to know. They deserve that much. It would, it would, be, it would be a travesty for them to make a decision without being fully informed. And these are all valid, valid things. I have the right to protest and object if any of my rights or demands are not being met. I've done that numerous times only to be shut down. Numerous times. 
I've raised uh, the, the issues that I didn't consent to anything that may have been suggested on behalf of my former attorneys. I've never even consented to them making a plea on my behalf. I haven't, as a matter of fact, when it comes to a plea, I haven't even had the, the opportunity to entertain any plea that may have been suggested by the prosecution. We haven't even, we haven't even talked about that. Not one time was it ever brought to my attention that the prosecution even wanted to offer a plea. That's another issue. I have the right to challenge the jurisdiction of this court, which I've done numerous times. I have the right to demand that the code be constru construed in harmony with the common law. I just raised that. I'm constantly referred to as pro se when I've raised the issue that I'm pro per. I have the right to conduct my defense pro per free from professional restrictions imposed upon licensed attorneys, which this court is well aware that I am not a licensed attorney. In fact, the court is also aware that I only had three days to prepare for a trial that the prosecution has been, been prepared for for a whole year. We see these boxes right here. This box alone is 45 or 50 pounds full of so much information. I, 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 I haven't even gone through half of it. It was stated for the record that the discovery the in its entirety was brought to my housing unit on the 29th of September, which trial was scheduled, that would be a Thursday, which trial was scheduled for Monday. How can I possibly go through all that, all the paperwork, all the the uh, digital discovery and, 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 and things of that nature? How can I go through all of that and be prepared in three days? That's a clear bias. I did not have time to prepare for this. Everything I'm doing is off the top of my head, winging it, taking it as it comes. When the court is well aware that I was not prepared, I raised the issue that it should be an adjournment, at least at the minimum it should be an adjournment because of that fact, at least to let me go through all the discovery. That was denied. No valid reason was stated for that when your honor knew there is no possible way, humanly possible, that I could be ready for a trial of this magnitude in three days. That's clear bias. I have the right to face the injured party claiming damages. That's under Article 3 and the Sixth Amendment. I raise that issue again. Where's the injured party? Is the injured party present in, in, in court right now? Can anyone can anyone make a claim against me? Can you make a claim against me, Your Honor? Do you know of anyone that can make a claim against me, Your Honor? Can anyone right now in court, anyone, make a claim against me? And because of that, Your Honor, the motion to dismiss should be granted based on that alone. There's, there's no injured party in this matter. So who makes the claim? Who? I have the right to put the judge on notice of my intent to appeal in any ruling decisions during the case. You stated for the record that I will have to wait until the appealing process, but it, my right is that I can raise that issue during the case, which I've attempted to do. That's been shut down. <laughs> I have the right to specifically reserve all of my rights, which I do at the beginning. I have the right to say what I want and to be heard under the First Amendment. And when I attempt to do that, it's taken as a slight to the court, a disrespect to the court, or me intentionally coming into the court to be disrespectful, which I've stated that that is not my intention. Never, never is it my intention. 
I never intend to walk into your courtroom, Your Honor, and be disrespectful intentionally. I never come into this courtroom to disrespect anyone. But because I don't understand, I raise these issues because they have validity. I have the right to object to any statement made by the judge or the prosecution. I've done that and been repeatedly shut down. Without a, without a, uh, without a lawful explanation. I've, I've repeatedly asked the court for a, a, a motion for a finding of fact to determine if things are being done legally. I've been denied that numerous times without merit, which is also my right. I have the right to recuse the judge at any time, which is also a right. I have the right to a speedy and fair trial by impartial jury. I think it's safe to say that my speedy trial right has definitely been violated because this matter has been taking place for roughly a year. I've never consented to waiving anything related to a speedy trial. And if that was done, it was done without my consent or without my knowledge. We're way past the speedy trial date, way past when the uh, change of venue motion was was brought up. I believe that was the first time I came before your honor in, in early March. I, I want to say March 11th of this year when uh, the uh, change of venue motion came into play. It was decided by your honor that that wouldn't be decided until uh, the 20th of June, I believe. That's that's over the 90 day mark right there for a speedy trial. That was denied and, and I, I, I still don't understand how that was denied when it's when it's clearly obvious that at minimum, the venue should have been changed based on the fact of the magnitude of the matter. There's no possible way anyone in this county would not have some type of connection or some type of knowledge, whether they were um, told something by someone that they may know, uh, the news reporting alone just that alone there's no way that this trial should be taking place in Waukesha County that that's obvious that's obvious from the way the motion was presented the coverage alone the the political campaign ads that plastered the defendant's face all over the TV every single day every time a political uh, campaign was brought up, it made reference to this incident every single time. The fact that uh, people have children that go to the same schools in this county, that people may have worked with the same people in this county. You yourself, Your Honor, uh, uh, stated that you at one time worked with the father of one of the people that, that was injured in this matter. That is a clear conflict, conflict of interest right there. You also stated for the record that not only did you work uh, with, with this father, but that uh, at one time they may have donated to uh, your, I don't know if it was to you becoming a judge or uh, I, I would have to look through the docket, but you said it on the record that they donated money to uh, a, a cause of yours. You also stated that when you had gain knowledge of the incident and that their family member was injured in the incident that you reached out via phone. I don't recall if it was text message or an actual phone conversation, but you put that on the record. 
you also stated that the nature of your relationship was strictly professional. I don't know about you, Your Honor, but I've I've worked numerous jobs and I know what professional relationships is and personal relationships. I've never had the cell phone number of anyone that was a, a personal relationship saved to my phone that I could reach out immediately when I learned something. That would constitute a personal relationship of some kind. Whether whether hanging out from time to time, having a cup of coffee or hanging out time from time, grabbing a beer or hanging out from time to time, watching a game or or or, or anything of that nature. It would it would definitely be more than just strictly professional. That was stated for the record. Um, again, I go back to the Sixth Amendment again. In terms of when I asked for the the uh, the motion for uh, the evidence motion that I raised, that was denied without any explanation. That would be strictly to uh, placing the evidence any unrevealed contract. That's under the Sixth Amendment. Clearly, there's been repeated, repeated, and repeated violations of my Sixth Amendment. We all know that the United States Constitution is the law of the land, period. It trumps everything. We also know that any law repugnant of the Constitution is null and in void. We know that. There's still there's still no no basis for the motions being shot down. Why was I why was I not granted the motion for finding a fact? Why did it take so long for me to be brought my entire motion for discovery? Why was the motion to prove jurisdiction? not verified why was why was the motion to dismiss the case for all the reasons i said not being granted which brings me to the motion to subpoena witnesses i did everything that was asked of me by the court pertaining those subpoenas it was understood by the court that this is my first time ever having to do this um I didn't understand how to properly, pro properly fill out the subpoenas at which the prosecution volunteered that they would give assistance. The only assistance I received was for them to check to see if it was filled out right. That was it. That, that doesn't amount to any assistance. I was still left to fill it out on my own. And then when I did that, correction still had to be made, which would verify what I was saying. I don't know how to do this. But I still complied to what the court asked of me. And even then, it was a big old thing about the subpoenas. I can't subpoena the plaintiff in the case. Well, how can I not subpoena the plaintiff in the case when under the Sixth Amendment, I have the right to face my accuser, which is the plaintiff of the case. So how, how could... How could the subpoena not be filed? And how could the plaintiff not be called to the witness stand? That begs the question of, does the plaintiff even exist? Which it was stated for the record that not only by a, a witness, a detective, Detective Casey that got on the stand and said on the record that is an entity, which is not a living, breathing human being. And then it was stated again by you on the record, Your Honor, that the plaintiff is an entity. So the question still stands, how can an entity bring a claim if it's not a living human being? So where's the claim? Will, will the the plaintiff in this matter, the state of Wisconsin, be allowed to testify? Would they be allowed to be in the courtroom? 
No, they will not because they don't exist. Therefore, the claim doesn't exist. For all those reasons that I just stated, the case should have been dismissed a long time ago. Once those issues were raised, this case should have been dismissed. And at the very minimum, it should have been di dismissed because those still have yet to be proven. We're still talking about jurisdiction. That's been being asked for over a week. There's still no, no providing of license to practice law yet. Not even by you, Your Honor. Why was I not provided with a certified copy of your oath of office? Why, why would you not state the name that is on file with the Secretary of the State or I made reference the first time to the Secretary of the Treasury and then you stated on the record that it's the Secretary of State, even though you knew what I was referring to when I asked. You referred to your name tag, but that's not the name registered. We both know that. So why wasn't that proof verified? You gave me a... Uh, a copy of your oath of office, but is not certified. So how can I verify that it, that is the true oath of office that you signed? How can I verify that it, that is that is valid? That's the reason why I asked for it to be certified, which you stated for the record. You will not do that. You never stated any uh, legal reason why. I have the right to ask for that legally. I also have the right to call any witnesses to assist my defense, which is the main reason why I subpoenaed the plaintiff in this matter. I also have the right to challenge all relevant laws in this trial in terms of their intent, interpretation, fairness, enforcement, and whether they serve and protect the people. From my knowledge, the, the design of the statutes of the law was written for the common people to understand. So that would mean the final determination or interpretation of what the law says comes down to the people. You know this, Your Honor. Are you or are you not a public servant? You also know that this docket sheet is inaccurate. Every filing up until the point that I started representing myself was filed in a name that was represented by all capital letters, which is not my name. Nor has it ever been my name, nor have I ever seen that name or individual. Every single filing or paperwork was all in capital letters. Ever since September 29th, roughly around there, now everything starts to go to lowercase letters. Why is that? What, what prompted the sudden change?
I still have filings that have all capital letters, which I state every time I come into your courtroom, Your Honor, that that is not my name, nor do I consent or agree to being called that name. I'm merely here as a third party intervener on behalf of my client. Did I accept for value and return for value? I, we go through this every every time I every time I come here. Every time. You bring the uh, Illinois versus Allen when we had the issue of me being removed from the courtroom. We went through that where Illinois versus Allen states that there are three options when a defendant is being disruptive in court. You stated for the record that you identified a fourth one, which is not cited anywhere in that case. It's not cited anywhere. So the question would be, how did you come up with a fourth option that's not written in that case? Did you take it upon yourself to add this fourth option to justify denying me my constitutional right by being present? You could have done the three that were stated. Any one of the three you could have done that were stated in the case. Nowhere does it say you can create a, a fourth option. Not, uh, not upholding my constitutional rights. I'm sure you know about Title 18, USCS 2381, which states that it's treason not to uphold your oath of office. Treason. You repeatedly make judicial determinations that clearly prejudice in, uh, uh, my defense. And then when I question you about are you making judicial determinations, I'm repeatedly shut down. which leads to today. The constant push not to have an informed jury. Not giving legal valid grounds on objections, not noting objections for the record to make sure that the record is clear. I'm sure somewhere in the jury instructions, you informed them that the state of Wisconsin was bringing the claim. But then you make the judicial determination that I'm not allowed to ask questions about the plaintiff. That's clear bias. And it prejudices, it prejudices my defense. You know also that you have an electronic filing system. I find it hard to believe that I was told yesterday about my um, subpoena for the plaintiff that I had to wait for a filing in a, in a, in a timestamp when I've seen it done numerous times in, in, in just a few seconds right in front of my face. When the prosecution needs something filed, it's, it's filed immediately. I have to wait or I have to wait to the next day. That's a clear bias and a clear prejudice to my defense. Obviously, the court knows that I'm not privileged to the same uh, 
filing system. Which brings me to the reason why I brought up the issue of assistance of counsel. Under the Sixth Amendment, I have the right to assistance of counsel. It doesn't say anything about representing yourself without assistance of counsel. Having counsel represent you and having assistance of counsel is two totally different things. You, Your Honor, gave me paperwork that was a, a waiver of counsel. We both know that any contract can be altered if I don't agree to certain terms. I crossed out everything in that paperwork that I did not agree or consent to and specifically wrote on that paperwork that I do not waive my right to assistance of counsel. At the very least, I should have been awarded a standby counsel. Not someone to represent me, to speak for me, but someone to help me do things in a timely fashion. Get things filed in a timely fashion. Get motions together in a timely fashion. Make preparations uh, to, to get things done that I don't have the privilege to do in my current situation of being housed at the Waukesha County Jail. I gave you back that paperwork and you accepted the paperwork that I altered that you understood that I didn't agree and consent to those things that were altered. You accepted it and you filed it. That is in the record. I have copies of the same paperwork that you accepted. So when you accepted that, With no objection, that becomes a tacit agreement. But yet, I'm still forced to come in here with zero help. I think it's clear that that prejudiced my defense. knowing that the prosecution has everything that they need for this matter at, at their fingertips. And I have to jump through every hoop possible to even get things filed in a timely fashion. It was stated for the record that the unit that I'm housed in, in the Waukesha County Jail, and per jail administrator Angela Wallenhoff that I'm only allowed out of my cell for a few hours a day. So I'm roughly locked down 22 hours a day. Not given the privilege to access everything that I should be able to at, at the time that I should be if I was general population. Arrangements could have been made months ago for me to be at, at least in some form general population with an upcoming trial. Reference was made to being able to use uh, Lexis Nexus or whatever it's called. We call it the law library. That may be the easier way to describe it. I'm only a, a allowed to access the law library at certain times during the day. The rule of the jail is that when you're not in the day room, you can't access the law library, which is on tablets. We are not allowed to have those tablets in our cells. That prejudice my defense. 
How can I work on my case? How can I look up certain case laws? How can I do any of this if I don't have full access to it? I even suggested some type of order that could be made by the court to allow me more time out of my cell or to talk to jail administration about allowing me more time out of my cell to be able to use those when needed. And, and to be frank, in a proceeding of this magnitude, there should not be even a time where I'm not access, where I don't have access to, to the materials that I need. If I'm not in the courtroom or sleeping, I should be awarded the time to work on this case, seeing as how I only had a couple days to prepare for a trial of this magnitude. Which brings me back again to the change of venue again. Even right now with trial going on, there's still political ads being shown every day that reference this incident. There's still talk throughout the jail about it. There's uh, been a ton of hate mail received to the jail since the beginning of this. It did die down for, for a little bit, but it picked right back up the closer we got to the trial. Hate mail that comes from people right here in the city of Waukesha. which gives more credibility to the venue needing to be changed. Yet and still, that was denied. It's impossible for impartial jury to be found in this county. And that's not, and that's not to uh, discredit people in the county that can be impartial. It would be unfair to say that no one can be impartial. That, that wouldn't be accurate. But with the level of scrutiny that this whole incident has, the, the reporting, the, the Facebook groups, the, the, the constant, there, there were Facebook groups created because of this. The reporting live stream on, on, on Court TV has comment sections where a, a, a lot of insensitive and nasty things are said. The sheer ins insensitivity of, of some of the things that, that, are, that are said on there. I know a lot of people probably don't care about what I'm about to say, but it still needs to be said because it's truth. The fact of the matter is, is that I have children too. Family too, loved ones too. That also have been ridiculed and and. and and had their names drugged to the mud and, and, and have threats towards them. Loved ones that had to leave their home because they were getting threats thrown through their mailbox. Children that didn't feel safe going to school because they were getting bullied behind what was being said. And that's not to sweep anything under the rug whatsoever. To constantly say and report this incident as attack, 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 terrorism, terrorism. It's unfair and it's insensitive. It's a definite, definite tragedy. Definite. 
and that will never be swept under the rug. There's always going to be healing that, that has to take place. It's going to be difficult. And that, that should not be swept under the rug. Whatsoever. But it's very insensitive and unfair to not recognize that there, there's many, many, many other victims that never is talked about. And for people to paint a certain picture, mostly from this county, to put this picture out there, it's not only hurtful, but it's insensitive, and it's not true. I'm sure the court read through the motion for a change of venue. I'm assuming, though it was it was a lot, a lot of paperwork in those motions. I think it was obvious, obvious that the venue should have been changed, obvious. It's too many connections and it's too close. It's too close. If there was any chance for a fair trial in an impartial jury, it should not have been in this county. But yet it was denied. without any validity. Zero. There's so much bias that's going on that And even with all this, for the record, we still have no proof of jurisdiction. We still have no bond on file in the docket sheet. We still have no plaintiff. We still have no claim. We're not sure of the relationship between you, Your Honor, and a father of one of the people that was injured. We're not clear on that relationship, no matter how well prepared the speech was, because it was a prepared speech. That was obvious. Where's the proof? I just asked it that, that same question. Can an affidavit be given that there is no bias, no conflict of interest, and no interest in the outcome of this case? There's there is no proof if you hold the full judicial power of the state or is it the military power? Mr. Brooks, I've given you about 50 minutes to make your various arguments. You've now repeated yourself a number of times. So I'm gonna to turn to the state to see if they have any response. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Judge, I'm gonna summarize what I just heard by quoting from a case from 
the Eastern District of Wisconsin uh, federal case found at 2022 Westlaw 3045190. Can you repeat that last I'm one? I'm so sorry. 3045190. Retzloff versus Moran. The this case is talking about many of the topics that Mr. Brooks has now recited to the court and simply states, the majority of Retzloff's filing is incomprehensible jargon and cut and paste legal mumble jumbo. Sovereign citizen theories are frivolous and wholly without merit. And the court goes on to cite to Bay, B-E-Y, versus the state of Indiana at 847, Fed 3rd, 559, on pages 559 through 560, a Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals decision from 2017. Mr. Brooks, Objection. Knowingly, I didn't call out that name, nor do I know any individual by that name, Your Honor. Please do the courtesy of not interrupting the state, as they did not interrupt you for over the almost 50 minutes that you spoke. Thank you. Please continue. Your Honor, the record is very clear that Mr. Brooks knowingly, willingly, voluntarily, and intelligently insisted on representing himself in this trial. He has no constitutional right to stand by counsel, none whatsoever. The court patiently went through the form and advised him of many of the things he's complaining about here today, the resources of the state, the knowledge of the law, his ignorance of the law, and his words to this court, and I quote to the best of my ability, it don't make me flinch one bit. That's what he told this court, whatever it was, two weeks ago. Now he's here complaining over and over and over again how unfair this is to him. It's highly offensive. I don't know because unfortunately I was talking to my investigator if he ac accused this court of treason, but I certainly heard that word come out of his mouth and it is absolutely shocking that he would throw such a word around so loosely in this courtroom. This court has been exceedingly patient, exceedingly respectful of his rights at every turn, at every turn. I want to address this claim that he only had three days to prepare for trial. It's absolutely a false statement. The record should reflect that he does have three banker's boxes on his table. The record should reflect that every time the state calls a witness to the stand, he swiftly and easily turns to those boxes, which appear to be alphabetized or organized in some fashion by the public defenders who turned it over to him and quickly removes the folder of the witness who's testifying and effectively cross-examines that witness using notes from the public defender. We know that because he's tried to confront witnesses with the notes from the public defender. He is not going into this blind or with one arm tied behind his back. They did all the homework and he's simply sitting here reading their notes, reading their cross-examination questions and asking the questions and then going on to his ridiculous questions having to do with his belief in the sovereign citizen movement. There's no way this record would reflect that this defendant is not adequately prepared for trial. He's never asked for a speedy trial. He makes conflicting statements on one hand, you violated his rights because it's taken us so long to get to the trial. And on the other hand, we're rushing him to this case and he hasn't had adequate time to prepare. He is not, not, not denied access to legal materials in the jail. The record is very clear from the jail administrator. 
It should not be confused. He misleads this court intentionally to say, I only get out of my cell two hours a day. That is a fact. That is for his own safety so that other inmates do not inflict physical harm upon him. He has access to a tablet. He has access to a computer. Whether he chooses to ask for those resources is up to him. I would also cite the court to U.S. XREL George versus Lane, L-A-N-E, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals at 718 Fed 2nd 226, where a pro se defendant attempted to complain on appeal about his lack of access to a computerized legal research system paralegal training or law school education. The court rejected that contention and said, once a defendant has asserted his right to refuse counsel and conduct his own defense, he has no constitutional right to access those resources. And again, you warned him, Judge. You fairly warned him. And he basically acted as if you were insulting him and said, it didn't make him flinch one bit. Much of the last 50 minutes, which this court has graciously extended him the opportunity to go on and on and on, is nothing more than legal mumble jumble. He's reading from some typewritten transcript. I can see that from where I'm sitting. I don't know who's giving him these materials, but he has an agenda here. It's to stall, delay, disrupt, intimidate, and it's not going to work. Thank you. Objection to that. Um, Your Honor, that's, that's, a, that's a load of crap. Mr. Brooks, that's my opportunity now. I gave you about 50 minutes. I just want to object to, to the, the disrespectful comments that, that was just made. I'm not trying to hold you up from what you're going to say, but that's a load of crap. Mr. For, Brooks. For her to sit there. Mr. Brooks. For her to your sit there. objection is noted. For her to sit it's, there, No, Honor. it's my turn. Let me, let me go through this. I graciously gave you 50 minutes to raise all these various points that you want to bring up. I then gave the state an opportunity to respond. That is the proper procedure. I followed decorum. I followed civility. I did not interrupt you. The state did not interrupt you. Your objection to their characterization, it's noted for the record. I am going to render a decision at this point. Please listen and please do not interrupt. As I indicated, the defendant spoke for about 50 minutes, raising a litany of complaints and issues and theories regarding his view of how this case has proceeded. Many of these issues, if not the vast majority or even all of them, have already been addressed by this court in one way or the other. Looking at, for example, his complaints about change of venue, it is true this court denied the change of venue motion. The court made a record at that hearing. I stand behind that record and that decision. The arguments made regarding that decision, which I would note he has yet to file an interlocutory appeal ch challenging that, uh, are nothing more than speculative without a basis in law or fact. To say that this jury is biased would be a complete miscarriage of justice and a mischaracterization of the process this court painstakingly took in order to obtain a fair and impartial jury. There is absolutely nothing on this record 
before the court throughout these proceedings to suggest that this is a biased jury. I stand behind my previous determination and the process that this court went through, including initially calling an unusually large panel for which the clerk of court's office sent the initial qualification questionnaire and then ultimately a case specific questionnaire was sent to approximately 1400 jurors or potential jurors. There was ample opportunity for the parties throughout the proceedings leading up to the end of August to review those materials. There were numerous strikes for cause that this court entertained. Even prior to that specific hearing, the parties met, they conferred, uh, the state agreed not to challenge the vast majority of the challenges to jurors brought by uh, the defense. Then there was the hearing. Uh, then this court uh, at jury selection uh, allowed for an indefinite number of strikes for cause. Many were granted, if not all. Uh, and then even on the day that the jurors were brought in, the court provided the jurors with a supplemental questionnaire dealing specifically with the issue of exposure to uh, the political advertisements. And then each, each sorry, party had the opportunity to exercise 10 preemptory strikes, which is well above the number of strikes allowed for by statute, which would be six based upon the homicide charges, one extra for the alternates, which would be seven, but out of an abundance of caution and in the interest of justice, the court gave each side 10, for which many of those, Mr. Brooks, chose not to exercise and then pursuant to state law, uh, the clerk of court chose names to strike by lot. Again, there is nothing on this record before the court to suggest that this jury that we have is anything but fair and impartial. And I take issue with the characterization that they are anything but. They've been diligent, they take notes, they are attentive. They come to this court as the case law says, there's a presumption that they come to the court without bias and it's through the jury selection process that the parties and the court ferret out that bias. Many of the jurors who were brought in were struck for cause. Many others were not. Um, but ultimately, we have a fair and impartial jury. As I listen to the litany of issues and arguments and complaints raised by Mr. Brooks, I would note that they are all unsubstantiated, conclusory allegations and assertions without an adequate basis raised in law and fact. There have been several misstatements by Mr. Brooks uh, regarding either the record that's been made, items that's been provided to him, or the basis for the court either sustaining or um, sustaining, I should say, or overruling objections, for an example. Um, there's been a mischaracterization of his rights that he claims to have. As I have stated repeatedly, your constitutional rights are not absolute when you're in a criminal trial, meaning your First Amendment right is not unfettered. It is frankly no different why the case law is very clear. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. No one has a First Amendment right to do that. In a criminal case, the parties have an obligation to follow not only the Constitution and the statutes that are applicable, but to follow criminal procedure, the rules of evidence. That is what circumscri circumscribes the rights that a defendant or the state has in a criminal trial. The issues you raise, for example, regarding subject matter jurisdiction 
are baseless, they're frivolous, and they're not anything this court needs to address further. The fact that you now are asking questions about whether this is admiralty court or a military court or a court of competent jurisdiction is frivolous. This court has jurisdiction over the criminal cases brought before it by the state of Wisconsin in this particular case. These are allegations that criminal conduct occurred in the city of Waukesha. The city of Waukesha is within the county of Waukesha. This court sits as an elected official in the county of Waukesha to hear these types of cases. That is clear. The only argument or relief that I could discern through the course of those 50 minutes was Mr. Brooks's request that this case be dismissed for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. And as I have just indicated, this court has jurisdiction. It's not been right. Let me rephrase that. The issue has not even been raised properly. There's never been a written motion. There's never been even an oral motion that would comport with 80201, which requires that the basis for the relief being requested be stated with specificity and be based in law and fact. The vast majority of the points that you raise, sir, are issues that you can raise on appeal. It is true. You have a right to an interlocutory appeal. I would not be the judge to decide any of those issues. So the fact that you complain about what I do, it's noted the record is going to be very clear. All right, I have a court reporter who's taking down the record of everything that is said and done in this courtroom when we are on the record. And so I don't have to all the time say it's noted for the record because we're on the record. I sometimes do that to hopefully make it clear to you or to note it. I don't always do that, but I'm not required to do that. You raise issues concerning, I guess, plea bargaining. I have never been made aware that you would want to change your plea in this case uh, and that you're not aware of the state wanting to do that. Um, that is the first time any such issue has been raised and I see it as a distraction and as simply a statement made by you as part of the, the litany of things um, that you are not perhaps pleased with. As far as my conduct in this case, I already addressed those issues. I'm not going to revisit uh, issues related to uh, my familiarity with the father of one of the victims that was done very early on. I made a very thorough record and I gave the parties at that point an opportunity to address that after they had ample time to digest that information. While it's true you have a right to seek substitution of judge, it is not unfettered. There was a time limit for that. In fact, it was exercised because judge, a prior judge was assigned to this case and your attorneys on your behalf exercised that right of substitution. So to say that you have the right to seek recusal at any time would be a misstatement of the law. And even if you think that should be exercised or there is a valid claim for that, sir, it's not been raised in the proper way before this court. This trial will keep going. I still expect the basic rules of civility and decorum to be followed. That includes, sir, that when there is an objection to a question that you ask, that you wait for the state to indicate their objection and the basis for it. If I need additional information, I will ask for it. If I don't need additional information, I will rule on it. 
And I do expect that even if you disagree with that ruling, that you will abide by it and that you will move forward. Whether that's asking a new question, rephrasing a question that you've asked, I do ask that you follow that simple rule of decorum, and that's you not interrupt, and then you follow the rules of procedure. As far as the other issues you raise concerning your right to assistance of counsel, the record before this court over the many days that that topic has been raised, even going back to the two afternoons of hearings this court held, um, I will not revisit those. I believe I honored your request to represent yourself as is required by uh, the Constitution of not only the United States of America, but the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin. And that you made a very deliberate choice after being fully advised and aware of all the requirements that I needed to go through under the case law, both case law in the state of Wisconsin and case law from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which not only guides this court, but this court must follow. I agree with the state and would um, draw your attention to the two cases that were cited, uh, United States X Rel George versus Lane, found at 718 F 2nd 226, and Retzloff versus Moran, uh, found at 2022 Westlaw 3045190. I let you put on the record all of those points uh, in order to give you that opportunity to make a full record of the issues that you have believed that you are entitled to raise. But those sovereign arguments regarding uh, written findings of fact, bill of particulars, regarding contracts that you enter into, regarding admiralty court, uh, et cetera, they're baseless, sir. And this court need not address them further. Now with that, I know it's 1130, but I would like to get one more witness on before at least we break for lunch. The jury, of course, has been out for quite some time. So I'll instruct Madam Clerk to bring the jury out. For the record, John, we didn't uh, bring up the Higgins Levine 415 US 533 decision. That was, that was not addressed and the, the issues are still not addressed. There's still been no proof to anything that you said, anything that the prosecution has said. There still the hasn't been- is noted and we will continue. Bring the jury out, please. There still hasn't been uh, Mr. Brooks, any proof. I've addressed them there to the extent that I will. There still hasn't been any proof. I never once, the comment about me not flinching was when you said that there's 66 years of experience at that table. That's the comment I said, that doesn't make me flinch. That was mischaracterized. That should be for the record. There's still, okay. been, no, there's still been no proof. Mr. About Brooks, please stop. I'm not going to address whether there's verified proof or not of jurisdiction, because whether there's not, anything not. along those lines. It is frankly not required under the law. You may disagree with that, you can take that up on appeal, whether that's an interlocutory appeal or whether that's a direct appeal if there is a conviction. But I'm not going to address it any further. Because there's no verified proof. There does not need to be, sir. All right, if yes, the jury true. is coming out, is that true? Now? In order for a case to... All right, the to record should reflect that the jury is coming out and we are about to continue with the state's next not witness. Once was the plaintiff addressed? That wasn't addressed. Where is the plaintiff? Where is the injured party? That's because the jury will disregard the statements presently yeah. being made by the defendant. Because y'all don't want the jury to know the truth. The jury will disregard <coughs> those statements made by the defendant. I see, I see it is not his opportunity to testify. They are comments, on. and as such, are to be disregarded. I see what's going on. Thank 
don't worry. All right. Thank you, everyone. You may be seated. It's not going to work. Attorney Opper, you may call your next witness. Thank you. The state calls Hope Evans. All right. Good morning, Ms. Evans. If you would please make your way to the witness stand. It is up a riser, so be mindful of that. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, who's on my left, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. The first thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. Uh, it's uh, Hope Evans Jansen. Uh, it's H O P E E V A N S dash J A N S E N. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Um, Ma'am, on the day of November 21, 2021, did you attend the Waukesha Christmas Parade? We did. And you uh, came with your family, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, sorry. That's okay, thank you. Just for the court report, if you could say yes or no. Um, and uh, was one of the people that was with you your daughter? Yes. And what was her age at the time? Uh, her age at the time was 10. Okay. And uh, was there a time when she was recording the events that were occurring during the parade? Mm, she pretty much recorded the whole parade. Okay. And were you, um, were you present when this was happening? Yes. Standing right next to her, basically? Sitting next to her. She was on my husband's lap. Okay. And you could see her... Um, using a device to record the parade? Yes, ma'am. What type of device was it? An iPhone. And was that her phone? Yes. Okay. And uh, during the parade, were you present when the dancing grannies were struck by the red SUV? Yes. And did that get captured by your daughter on her iPhone? Yes. At some point in time, did you turn that um, recording over to the Waukesha police? Yes. And uh, prior to doing that, um, did you alter the content of the recording in any way? No. Was the recording that you turned over a true depiction of the events as you saw them in full, unfold right in front of you? Yes. I'd like to um, display Exhibit 139 to the witness only, please. Go ahead. And uh, ma'am, it should be on the screen in front of you. Um, we're going to just play it for just a few seconds first to make sure you can look at it and uh, identify this that we're talking about the same video you provided in this case, okay? So yes. we'll play about three, three or four seconds worth here. All right, does that look familiar to you? Yes. Okay. Is this the recording that your daughter captured that afternoon? Yes. And uh, the same recording that you turned over to the Waukesha Police? Yes. All right. Move to admit number 139 and permission to publish. Objection. Exhibit 139 is received. Permission to publish is granted. The objection is overruled. Your Honor, this particular recording is 15 seconds in duration. I'm going to ask that it be played with the volume on. <coughs> Go ahead. Sevens, is that what you remember seeing that afternoon? Yes. Did you hear those loud thuds? Yes. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Mr. Brooks may have some questions for you. Any cross? Yeah, and I object to being called that name again, and I don't consent to it again for the record. Noted. Just a few questions. Uh, do you do you recall about what time you arrived at the parade that day? No. Before it started. Um, do you re recall how long you were there before the parade actually started to get underway? Not really. I don't recall. And 
And who all were you with? My family, uh, my friend's son, my daughter, my husband, my mother-in-law, myself. During the uh, parade, were any of you or your family injured? No. Do you recall seeing a vehicle approaching? Yes. And about how far was it from you when you saw it approaching? Uh, roughly, like, I don't really know of an estimate of the amount of distance. It was roughly when it started um, hitting the dancing grannies. Did you see the vehicle strike anyone before that that point? No, the the crowd was rather large at the parade. Do you remember the the large crowd? Uh, do you recall it being pretty loud at that at that point? Every parade I've been to has been loud in general, so. So it would be fair to say that that one was pretty loud. Yeah, I suppose. Do you recall what you did when you saw people being struck? My husband pressed my daughter into his chest so that she couldn't see. Um, I passed her to somebody behind me and then I got my mother-in-law up to go inside of the karate studio that we were sitting in front of, as well as the young man that was with us. And do you recall how long you were in the karate studio? No. Was it briefly or? We were in there until we were told that we were able to leave by the police. Did you hear uh, at any time a report of uh, shots fired? No. Did you hear any shots? It was loud and chaotic. I can't for say for sure if I heard shots or not. So would it also be fair to say that if a, a horn may have been blowing, you wouldn't have heard that either? I would have heard a horn. It, the, we weren't that far from where the vehicle came through on the road. So it'd be fair to say that you think you would have heard a horn, but not shots. I don't know if shots were fired further down the road or if I didn't hear any shots when the car went past. No, that's, I'm not asking when it went past. I'm saying uh, the question was at any time. So I, I should have been more clear. I apologize. At any time, any time during that that moment. I don't believe I heard gunshots. I, I've never heard a gunshot before, so I can't really say yes or no. So it would be fair to say you wouldn't really know what a gunshot would sound like. Correct. Seeing as how you, you've never heard a gunshot before, would you, would it be fair to say that it might be, it might be uh, really loud? I wouldn't know. I've never heard a gunshot, so I wouldn't be able to guess. Do you recall if it was any music playing? It was a parade, so well, uh, there was music at some point. Uh, com coming bands. from coming from any of the vehicles in the parade. I don't recall at the moment.
do you recall about what time you and your family left the parade? Uh, no. You recall making a statement to law enforcement at any time during the, the incident? No. After the incident, the days after? Uh, when I sent the video in to the police department. Do you, do it's the only time I talked to anybody about this. Do you recall uh, uh, when that was that you sent the video in? Was it a few <laughs> days after the incident or a week or two? Or I don't honestly remember. Were you contacted by law enforcement about any follow-up to the video? No. Did you follow up with law enforcement about the video? No. I'm assuming at some point you uh, took that video off of your daughter's phone. Would that be fair to say? Correct. And did you did you post that video footage anywhere, social media or anything like that? No. So it was just only to law enforcement that the video was shown? Correct. Never showed it to any other family members or friends at any point? Objection, relevance. Grounds. Overruled. You may answer. No. Uh, when were you notified that it was when were you notified that it was a possibility that you may be called to testify in this matter? I received correspondence in the mail. Um, I don't remember the exact date of when I received it. Um, August, I think. So not that long ago then would, would be accurate. Yeah. Or pretty recently, rather. Mm hmm Yes. Do you recall if that was in subpoena form? Yes. Did it state by whom the subpoena was sent? Uh, the district attorney's office. Did it have a name? Uh, Susan. Did you uh, contact the district attorney's office after receiving the subpoena? I mailed back the subpoena and I did call on October 3rd to see if I would have to come in um, because I had received no notification about anything. Um, I was told that I was going to receive a call back um, and they did contact me. Um, to say that I was an on-call witness. So at the time of uh, October the 3rd, when you uh, did a check to see if you were, would be needed, is it fair to say that at that time you wasn't sure if you would be testifying or not? Yes. Did you seek to testify in this matter? No. Did the district attorneys ever uh, tell you in any way that they were the plaintiff in this matter? Those words were never spoken to me.
Are you aware of any plaintiff in this matter? Objection. Grounds. Irrelevant. Grounds. Sustained. You don't have to answer that. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor. Next question, sir. Did you or your husband or anyone in your family that was present at the parade uh, file any claims on the, on the matter? With who? Do you understand the question? Not really. Please rephrase. At any time, did you file a claim uh, with any, I guess, the agency or anything like that no. in, in regards to the incident? No. Did any, inform did any information that you obtained in regards to this incident have a complaint with it? Objection, Gr babe. Grounds? Sustained us to the form of the question. Have you ever seen any complaint related to this incident? Sustained objection. Grounds? Sustained us to the form of the question. Do you know of any complaint with this incident? Not sure I completely understand the question on that. Um, what kind of complaint? I mean... Please rephrase. Have you ever seen any uh, issued charges in, re in relation to this incident? I'm sorry. Grounds? I did not understand what Mr. Brooks just asked, Your Honor. I believe he said the issued charges. Oh, I object to that on relevance grounds, Your grounds. Honor. Grounds. Uh, overruled, she may answer. <coughs> I haven't really been keeping up with the news media on the trial, um, so no, I haven't seen a list of the charges. I was I was referring to um, if uh, you had uh, received anything from the district attorney's office about the charges issue. No. Are you aware of anyone bringing any claims or suits? Objection. Grounds. Irrelevant. Grounds. Sustained. You don't have to answer that. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor. Next question, please. Do you recall seeing the driver of the vehicle that you saw that, that day? No. Could you see if anyone else was in the vehicle that you saw? No. Can you recall if you saw any tents to the vehicle you saw? And by tents, I mean like tinted windows or anything of that nature. I don't recall if the windows were tinted or not. Do you recall where the vehicle traveled after it passed you? No, my uh, my priority at that point was to get everybody inside and make sure they were safe. So you didn't observe anyone struck after what you saw initially? Correct.
and you stated that you haven't really been keeping up with the incident, right? Correct. So that would that would that in, uh, mean that um, it was your choice to do so, or you just kind of just disregarded it? Objection. Grounds. Over. Grounds. Sustained. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor. Next question, please. After uh, turning in the the video to law enforcement, did you keep the video at that point? Objection, as an answer. Grounds. Overruled. She may answer. Uh, the video is no longer on my daughter's phone. Um, there is a copy on my phone that is still on there in case I needed to resend in the video. It has not been accessed since the day I sent it to the police. So pretty just, pretty much just keeping it just in case. Correct. Have you viewed it since turning it into law enforcement? Objection. Grounds. Relevance. Grounds. It's been asked it. It may not have been asked, but she answered it, so I'll sustain it. So it'd be fair to say that seeing the video today would be the first time that you've saw it since turning it into law enforcement? Correct. Just for, for clarity, um, you are not aware of any plaintiff in this matter, correct? Asked and answered. Grounds. The is that an objection? The objection is sustained. You don't need to answer that. I think you said that you were contacted back in August, correct? I received mail with the subpoena, yes. Um, do you recall before August uh, being contacted in connection with this incident? Objection. Grounds. Repetitive, irrelevant. Grounds. Sustained. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor. Next question, please. No grounds. Next question, please. Would you consider yourself an injured party in this incident? Objection, Grounds. repetitive, irrelevant. Grounds. Grounds. Sustained. Reason for the sustain, Your Honor. Next question, please. No further questions. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. Thank you.
It is just before the noon hour, so this will be a good opportunity uh, for the court to break for lunch. Um, I will say between an hour and an hour and 15 minutes, at least for the jurors. So I'll rise for the jury, please. One o'clock, we are in recess.
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. State have available its next witness? Yes. All right, we'll bring the jury out. Jurisdiction, Your Honor. Still have yet to be verified. Your objections noted. Was my ICF uh, obtained by uh, the clerk of courts? The one requesting the copies of various documents? The one uh, asking for the complaints. Yes, my understanding is they're working on it. Just wanted that clear for the record. Just one or two ICF forms on that. Um, I sent one. Okay, it was sent to me twice and I just wanted to make sure it was only mm -hmm. one. It appeared to be the same thing, but. Is it in the queue, Your Honor? It's um, in the case. It should no. be. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. State may call its next witness. State calls Master Trooper Mike Smith. Come on up, Trooper Smith, when you get to the witness stand, which is to my right, up one riser. If you would please remain standing, raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. Madam Clerk, I'm giving you previously received 54. All right, sir, the first thing I will have you do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. First name is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Last name is Smith, S-M-I-T-H. Thank you. Go ahead, you witness. Thank you. How are you employed? With the Wisconsin State Patrol. What's your job title? Um, I am a reconstructionist with the Technical Reconstruction Unit. How long have you had that position? I joined the TRU when it was originally formed in 2008. I've been doing full-time recon since 2002. Uh, we had a unit formed based on the need for a reconstructionist that did this type of crash investigation all the time. That's all we do. Uh, a normal trooper has traffic enforcement duties. We just have strictly crash recon duties. That's all we do. How long have you worked for State Patrol? Uh, I was hired in 2000. Can you describe for us uh, your educational background? Yes, I have a two-year associate's degree in criminal justice and then uh, multiple, multiple training in the crash reconstruction field through the State Patrol. So I'd, I'd like to get into that a little bit. Can you tell us what kind of training was required to become a reconstructionist for the State Patrol? Yes, um, we have, I've had over about 2,000 hours of training. That training has been done at our State Patrol Academy. Uh, we bring in schools like Northwestern, Texas A&M, IPTM, which stands for the Institute of Police Technology and Management. Uh, they come in, they're college level courses. They teach us obviously over a series of weeks. Um, we also have specialty instructors come in for specialty fields in accident reconstruction, which can be vehicle versus pedestrian, vehicle versus motorcycle, uh, CMV crashes, uh, lighting studies, and a bunch of other ones. How many uh, accident or crash scene reconstruction analyses have you completed as a, as a uh, reconstructionist with the State Patrol? Well, since about probably 2004, I would say till now, I average probably over 100 a year that I respond to. Um, and these are serious crashes. They're not just you know somebody driving into a mailbox. This is a criminal or possibly injury case involving criminal charges that we respond to. Um, but probably on average over 100 a year. 
for the last, you know, since 2004. Did you conduct a crash reconstruction analysis uh, in downtown Waukesha from event an event that took place on November 21st, 2021? I did. When did you uh, begin your work on that analysis? I worked with uh, detectives from the city of Waukesha Police Department on January 30th of this year. We actually went out to the scene to conduct a uh, time distance analysis. Where did you go at the scene? Uh, we went to the Curry Insurance Company, which was the cameras that we decided to use after viewing all the videos. That was the best, um, as far as what I'm concerned, to use in a time distance analysis. It was the clearest. It provided certain things that made it necessary for me to do an accurate time distance analysis. What are some of those certain things you referenced? Uh, what we look for and what we've been trained to do is, first of all, we look for a stationary camera, one that doesn't move. So when we are viewing the video um, of the incident and we are, again, recording new video with the time distance analysis, that camera is in the same exact spot. That's the first thing we do. Uh, secondly, we want to have at least two fixed reference points to actually see where a vehicle in this case is entering the first reference point and where it hits the second reference point. So those need to be really clear for us to get an accurate distance. Um, and from that point, then we want to actually time or make sure the timing on the video software is accurate. And that's sim simply a stopwatch that we use to verify that that video is timing correctly, not too fast, not too slow. So once we have all that done and we determine those two points, we will bring a vehicle in, and in this case, an exemplar vehicle that matched the description, I think you're making model of the vehicle that was in the parade. We actually will have someone, me in this case, inside watching the video on the screen, seeing when that exemplar vehicle comes into the screen. When it comes into the screen where the vehicle did at the time, we have somebody mark that location out on the roadway. We then do that for a second point further down. In this case, we had two points. Once we have those two points established, then we're bringing uh, our survey equipment out, which is a Trimble unit uh, that you've all seen them out on the roadways and then you know, people's homes where they're surveying. That's what we use. Very accurate instrument. Just to give you an idea of accuracy at about 300 feet, it's plus or minus an eighth of an inch off. So very, very accurate unit, which we use all the time for crash reconstruction. So once we have that distance, we verify the timing. Um, it's a pretty simple calculation that we do to determine a vehicle's average speed through that particular distance that we have. And just keep in mind it's an average speed. So it could be moving faster or slower during certain portions of the distance, but it's just basically taking that average speed through that distance that we measured. When you use that Trimble machine uh, to conduct your, your measurements, uh, did you use those measurements to later produce a, a two-scale scene diagram? I did. Okay, I'd like to project for the witness only exhibit number 56. <coughs> 56? Yes, please. Thank you. Go ahead, show the witness. Do you recognize the diagram on the screen in front of you? I do. What is it? That is the uh, scale diagram that I created as a result of the Trimble measurements that I took out of the scene. I move exhibit 56 into evidence and request permission to publish. I can't see it on my screen. He's right. Oh, I don't know why. We'll need to check the uh, cabling. I can see it on mine. What exhibit was that? 56. Check the. Oh. Oh, sorry. Let me know when it's on the screen in front of you, sir. All right. Continue then. Oh, and uh, exhibit fifty six. Oh, well, first of all, let him review it. It's been offered by the state. You've now had an opportunity to review it, sir. All right, Exhibit 56 is received. Permission to publish is granted. Go ahead. 
Okay, could you please walk us through what we're looking at here? Yes, again, so this would be um, a diagram, a two-dimensional orthogonal, so basically looking from the top down at the area that I did measure at the time we did the speed analysis. Um, obviously, it depicts uh, a vehicle at a starting point and a vehicle at an end point. The vehicle at point A represents where that vehicle came into that east camera that was located at the Curry Insurance Company. And as soon as basically that vehicle, you're able to view it inside uh, the secure, uh, inside the insurance company with the representative that was there, I basically told that vehicle to stop. Uh, we marked that location on the roadway. And then we continued down to the secondary point, which I determined was the crosswalk. And we marked at that point once the exemplar vehicle reached that. And that's how we got that distance of 101, 141 feet, roughly three inches. Okay. Um, and what do you do with that distance once you have that measurement? So once we have that measurement, that's one part of the equation that we need. Um, the equation that we need, just really to explain it briefly, comes from Newton's laws of motion. Force equals mass times acceleration. It's part of Newton's second law. The formula that we use is velocity equals distance divided by time, and then we convert that velocity to speed. So we need two inputs in order to calculate the average speed of that vehicle over that distance. The first, obviously, is distance. The second is time. Now, how we get the time is we take the actual video from the incident, and we have a stopwatch, and we time it when it reaches those fixed points. And we do about 20 iterations, and we average that 20, those 20 iterations out to get a time, and that's the second part of the equation that we need in order to get that velocity or speed. Once we have that time, in this case it was 2.7 seconds, we round up and increase that time to the nearest whole number, which was three. That why, do you, all, why do you round up? I'm sorry to interrupt you there. That's fine. Uh, we round up always to give the benefit to the vehicle, um, because obviously the longer it takes to travel that distance, the slower the speed will be. So we always round up to the next number. Um, if it was two seconds, we'd round up to two and a half. So it's about every half second interval that we round up to. Um, so now that we have the distance of 142 feet roughly and the time of three seconds, not 2.7, we came up with the speed of the vehicle or average speed of the vehicle during that segment of 32 miles an hour. 32 miles an hour has an average speed from point A to point B as they're depicted on this diagram? Yeah. Correct. Winnie. Sustained us to the form of the question. Please rephrase. The jury will disregard the last answer. Could you please explain for us, uh, again, summarizing what average speed you calculated and over what distance? Yes. So the average speed, uh, very simple. Um, we marked point A. We marked point B. We had that distance. We had that time. The vehicle speed between point A or the average vehicle speed, let me reiterate, was 32 miles an hour between point A and point B. You mentioned an exemplar vehicle earlier. Can you uh, maybe explain for us again the purpose of using an exemplar vehicle in your analysis? Well, when I worked with the detectives from the uh, City of Waukesha PD, we wanted to find an exemplar vehicle just due to the type of case this was. Um, they were able to easily locate one that was very convenient to use, um, matching the description, I believe, the year, make, and model of the car in the, that was in the actual parade. So we decided to use that. Um, realistically, you can use any type of vehicle because you're just basically looking for that object coming into that frame of reference. But just for court purposes, I think it's a little bit easier to you know, show the jury that, hey, we used a vehicle that was similar or the same. And in terms of this case, you used a 2010 red Ford Escape? Correct. Okay. Do you happen to know the curb weight of that vehicle? Yeah. Well, overall, do my answer. So explaining what curb weight is really quick, that's the weight of the vehicle as it comes off the assembly line. So it doesn't include fuel, it doesn't include any personal items, it's just right off the assembly line. This particular 4x2 vehicle was 3,368 3, pounds, curb weight. Okay. And uh, to clarify, does curb weight have anything to do with your speed, average speed analysis? It does not. Okay. Um, When you get to the end result of your speed analysis and you have that, that number, the average speed over that distance, does somebody check your work? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, part of our uh, protocol in the TRU is we have to have all of our port reports peer reviewed. Has to be done. Uh, every single one goes out to a former member of the TRU who is now a consultant for us. Uh, he peer reviews it, makes sure that everything is correct. Okay, I want to wrap up by just asking you some clarifying questions about the nature of what an average speed means. Can you say definitively that at any point between point A and point B, the vehicle was traveling faster than 32 miles an hour? Objection, hearsay. Overruled, you may answer. Right. So average speed is calculated, as we talked about, through that distance. Um, the vehicle can either be going faster than 32 or slower than 32 over that distance. But it's an average. Is it possible the vehicle maintained a constant speed of 32? Yes. But it's, all, it's more plausible that you have higher and lower speeds during that segment. Okay. Uh, that's all I have for this witness. Thank you. Thank you. Cross. Um, yes. Uh, this is kind of distracting still being on there. Uh, From your testimony, it seems like you've been doing uh, crash reconstructions from quite some time. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Around 2004, I believe you said? I was in the program from the, about 2002, but really started getting into full recons about 2004. You need, you need a little bit of training first before you can actually go out and be on your own. Uh, you stated that you uh, worked with detectives in um, the process. Do you recall who that was? Yeah, that was Detective Casey. On getting the calculation of the speed, uh, did you work with anyone on, on that side of uh, your investigation? No. So it was pretty much just you and the detectives? The detective did not assist me with the speed calculation. He just assisted me with uh, obtaining the videos and also assisted me, <coughs> excuse me, out at the scene where we did the testing. I think the exhibit showed the, uh, the building that had the camera. Do you recall uh, which streets that were on along the parade route? Yeah, that was on in front of Curie Insurance on Main Street. And the point A and point B, did those start from a, a cross street or was it just the main? The insurance company has cameras outside by the sidewalk. There's two of them. There's one towards the east and one towards the west, right at the front of the building. You made reference to the uh, distance travel in feet. Correct. Uh, I think it was 141. Correct. 141 feet, two inches, a little bit over that. And you made a reference to the average speed. Um, any reason why the average speed wasn't depicted in the exhibit? That's just a calculation that we do that's included in the report. I don't normally do that in the diagram. So it would be fair to say that you created the diagram? I did create the diagram, yes. You said normally you don't put the uh, speed calculation, calculation in the diagram. Would, would it be any reason for that? It's in the report. It's not necessary to put it in the diagram. Have you ever done that before? Could you rephrase the question? Have you ever not included the speed analysis in any um, crash reconstructions that you've done before, before this one? Are you referring to the diagram or are you referring to the referring report? Referring to the diagrams. No, I, don't, I do not put speed calculation results in diagrams. On any of them? On any of them. Did you uh, create any diagram with the speed calculations present on it? No, I don't. I, the diagram that I created is the one that was up on the screen. 
and then from there you put the speed calculations just in the report. Yeah, I, I normally just put them in the report, yes. I don't have any recollection of putting one in the diagram. Would it be fair to say that it may be a little bit difficult to locate what you analyze for speed if it's not in the diagram? No. So if, if you wanted to know the calculation of the speed, you would have to read the report. Correct. Would it be fair to say that it, it might be easier to find if it was included in the diagram? My report is, my diagram is included with my report and that's all one unit, so it is in the report. Can you explain what uh, the S6 is? Yes, the X, excuse me, the S6 is the name of the Trimble robotic total station that we use to actually measure things at crash scenes. So, so that's like a, a, a certain technology or something, would that be fair to say? It's a piece of surveying equipment that if you've been on the road, you've seen them where they're measuring the roadways or if somebody's building a home um, same type of equipment, we just use it for crash reconstruction. And what is a prism? Is that in direct relation to the electronic distance measuring system? Correct. The total station is one part of the equipment that we use. The prism is the other. Um, the total station communicates with the prism through an electronic digital measuring system, which is a laser. Um, the two pieces are needed, in this case, to collect the measurements that I collected. Not necessary component to using the equipment, but we normally do use the prism when taking measurements. And that prism is pretty accurate, you would say? Well, the unit is accurate. What about the prism? Yeah, it's all accurate. The unit itself is very accurate. At 300 feet, it's about an eighth of an inch either way, plus or minus. And is the CAD the, the diagram that you created? Could you rephrase the question, please? Is the uh, the CAD, um, is that software related to the diagram that you create? It is. In what way? The computer-aided design software program that we use is a, is a tool that when we transfer the measurements from the Trimble Total Station, we transfer that into the computer-aided design program and that's how we create our diagram. Can you explain with the uh, the 2.4 gigahertz radio uh, technology is? That's just software that's built into the total station, the Trimble unit, um, as part of its communication. And is that communication uh, radio? Yeah, there's a radio inside the unit, correct.
you made a uh, reference to uh, something called Newton's Law. Can you explain a little bit further what that is? Newton's Laws of Motion are what we use as a big step in our reconstruction field. A lot of formulas are derived from Newton's Laws, including the formula that we use to calculate the vehicle's average speed. Sir Isaac Newton obviously invented the laws of motion. We all learned that in high school, um, and that's part of the process that came to the formula that I used to, to calculate the average speed. I always thought of Newton as gravity, <laughs> so that, that was a bit of new information. Um, you made reference to um, part of the crash reconstruction was, was finding a, a similar vehicle. Would that be fair to say? Yes. And you were able to find a similar vehicle pretty easily, you would say? That would have been the city of Waukesha Police Department, which found the vehicle. <coughs> and you made reference to it being in the parade as well? Or mm -hmm. part, of, part of the parade as well? The exemplar vehicle? Yes, the, uh, the, the vehicle that was similar. The exemplar vehicle was not in the parade. Um, I may have mis misinterpreted what you were saying. And you said it was found by the uh, Waukesha Police Department. Yes, sir. Do you recall if that part of your um, investigation and the um, the creating of the graph and all that technology that goes with that was that part of the same day, or were they done on different at different times? I'm sorry, did, are you referencing the diagram, the creation of the diagram? Right. No, that was not. It seems like a lot of technology went into getting the diagram created and, you know, different variations of that. And then also using a similar vehicle to, I guess, simulate the, would that be fair to say, simulate the incident? We use the exemplar vehicle for our testing. What, was that done all the same day, or was it done? Sorry, could you rephrase time? the question again? I'm not understanding what you're asking. Was the creation of the diagram and the simulation of the vehicle done on the same day? No, it was not. So it'd be fair to say it was a process involved in getting all the information. Correct. <laughs> And you stated that that was done around uh, uh, Jan uh, January 30th, around that time? The testing was done on January 30th. <coughs> and what about the simulation from the similar vehicle? I'm sorry, could you rephrase the question? Do you recall what date the, the simulation was performed? Are, are you asking when I completed my analysis? Um, specifically the part of the uh, similar vehicle being used. That was January 30th. We did the testing out on Main Street in front of Curry Insurance. So what part of the process was done at a later date? The diagram, the calculations, the time distance analysis.
do you recall uh, the the date of the second part of the investigation? Are you referring to when I completed my reports? Yes. No, I don't know what day that was. Was it sometime after the January 30th date? Correct. Would you say there was a, a delay in finishing it or did something cause you to kind of Let me let me rephrase that. Was there anything that may have delayed you finishing the uh, investigation uh, quickly? Can you rephrase what do you mean by quickly? By uh, it seems like there was two two parts of it: getting the the simulation done and then the actual diagram and, and things of that. Any reason why it, it, that couldn't be done closer together? Well, first of all, it's not a simulation because a simulation is different than what we did. Um, this was just some testing we did out at the scene. Uh, secondly, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I respond to hundreds of crashes. Um, you know, it depends on what I'm working on at the time. Um, once our reports are completed, they need to be peer reviewed. All that process takes time. So there's nothing that delayed my report. Um, if you want to use it, me going to another crash, that possibly could have delayed it, but no delays that would affect the outcome of the report or the accuracy of the report. No, that's I wasn't uh, going to that, that part of it. I was just kind of curious to what may have spaced out the, the dates. That's what I was really getting at. We do a lot of reports every year, and obviously we're, we're not just doing one report a year. So every report is different. Every report requires different types of analysis. Um, so there's really no set time on when we can finish a report compared to when we started. It just depends on what else is going on outside of our time in the office. No further questions. I need to redirect. <coughs> no, thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. You may. Statement called. It's next witness. The state called Dr. A.B. Shield. Right, good afternoon, Dr. Shield. If you would please make your way to the witness stand, which is to my right, up one riser. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, who's on my left, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, please be seated. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each, please. Amy Shield, A-M-Y-S-H-E-I-L. 
Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Shiel. Um, how are you currently employed? I'm an associate medical examiner at the Waukesha County Medical Examiner's Office. How long have you been with the medical examiner's office? About seven and a half years. What are your duties at the medical examiner's office? My primary function is to determine cause and manner of death. And in order to do that, I often perform autopsies or external examinations, send out laboratory tests, interpret the results of those tests, compile all this information into a report, and then certify a death certificate. And is that report, um, what is that report called? An autopsy protocol or autopsy report. Can you briefly describe to the jury the uh, schooling and training you went through to become an associate medical examiner? Yes, I earned my Doctor of Medicine degree from Creighton University in Nebraska in 2003. And then I completed a pathology residency in South Carolina that is anatomic and clinical pathology. And then I did a one year forensic pathology fellowship, which concerns how disease and injury cause death. Then I practiced for about a year as a forensic pathologist in South Carolina. And then I did an additional year of training in pediatric pathology, which is the study of diseases and conditions in infants and children. I worked in pediatric pathology in an academic setting for about five years before coming to Waukesha County. I'm going to direct your attention to approximately November 22nd of 2021. Um, did you perform an external examination of an individual identified as Leanna Owen? Yes. I did give you three exhibits when you walked into court, is that correct? Yes. I'm going to uh, direct your attention to exhibit number 62. Do you see that in front of you? Yes. Is that the autopsy protocol for Leanne, Leanna Owen? Yes. And can you just state for the record how many pages that autopsy protocol consists of? It's not on the screen. Um, and it's not going to be on the screen. Under uh, Previously provided to Mr. Brooks? Yes. Do you have any uh, additional copies today, any chance? I do not. We can make some. You don't have that in your materials, sir? Do you have the autopsy protocol in your materials? No. <laughs> Provide that to Madam Clerk and we can make copies as well. Was it intended, intended for me to have or not to have? Just so I'm clear. I don't I can't answer that. These autopsy protocols were previously uh, provided to the defense. All right, we'll still make copies. Except for value and return for value, these documents shown. The record should reflect that the defendant has a copy of Exhibit 62. Please continue, Attorney Glazer. Ma'am, what did you do in this case in terms of examinations of Ms. Owen? On November. Generally speaking, I'm sorry. 
Okay. On November 22nd, I performed her external examination, which involves documentation of all her clothing and jewelry, her identifying features such as stature, body weight, hair color, eye color, any scars, tattoos, uh, and then we proceed with documentation of injuries. And did you also create a summary of the injuries that you located on Ms. Owen? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show for you um, on the screen in front of you um, what's been marked as States Exhibit 163. If you can tell me when you can see that on the screen in front of you. And I did provide Mr. Brooks a copy of, of both the autopsy protocol as well as the um, diagram that's going to show on the screen. You seem to be in court that name, Your Honor, for the record. And you see, is it showing up in yes. front of your screen? And um, Exhibit 163, is that the diagram that you prepared to summarize your findings in the autopsy protocol for Leanna Owen? Yes. And does it accurately de um, depict the injuries that are notated or described in the autopsy protocol? Yes. I would ask the court to accept Exhibit 62 and 163 into evidence. Objection. The objection to both, each objection is noted, they're overruled. Exhibits 62 and 163 are both received permission to publish, or I believe only 163 is what you asked me for, is granted. Yeah, it was only one Permission to publish 163, I, that's what I said. Thank you. Ma'am, can you briefly describe um, what this document, um, Exhibit 163, portrays. This diagram depicts Leanna Owen's injuries. The red represents open wounds, lacerations or abrasions, which are scrapes to the skin. Blue is for bruising or contusions. Black is internal injuries or skeletal fractures. And in doing, performing the autopsy procedure on Ms. Owen, were there any, what was the cause of her death? Multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. Specifically for the injuries that she sustained, um, can you describe the fatal injuries for the jury? Objection, leading the witness. Um, overruled, she may answer. Leanna Owen had injuries to her head spine, torso, and viscera, or her internal organs. The combination of all these injuries led to her death, but she did sustain isolated injuries to her upper cervical spine, or her neck spine, and aortic lacerations. The aorta is the largest artery in the body that would have been fatal within seconds to a couple of minutes. And would all those injuries be consistent with being struck by a moving SUV weighing approximately 3,300 pounds? Objection, hearsay. Overruled, you may answer. Yes. Thank you. I'm next to direct your attention to um, did you perform an autopsy on an individual identified as Virginia Sorensen? Yes. And do you have her autopsy protocol in front of you, Exhibit 63? Yes. And do you have a diagram um, detailing Ms. Sorensen's um, injuries on, um, <coughs> in Exhibit 164? <coughs> oh, I don't have the diagram. You do not have a diagram. Sixty-four. That is correct. All right, thank you. Do you see it in front of you? Yes. Do the um, does the documentation in Exhibit One Sixty-four is that a summary of your findings from the autopsy protocol for Ms. Wenzel? <coughs> yes. 
I would ask the court to admit exhibits 164 and 63 and publish 164. Objection. Obviously 164 is on the screen, has exhibit 63, the copy been provided to Mr. Brooks? Correct. Uh, the autopsy protocol for Virginia Sorensen as well as the diagram um, contained in 164 have both been provided to Mr. Brooks. <coughs> Objection. I don't consent to that name, nor do I agree to it. Oh. All right. Exhibits 63 and 164 are both received. Permission to publish 164 is granted. Thank you. Let me know when you see it in the screen in front of you. Yes. Okay. Again, ma'am, the injuries that are detailed in Exhibit 164 that's showing on the screen, were those, was that exhibit created as a result of your findings in the autopsy protocol for Ms. Sorensen? Yes. And can you describe for the jury what injuries you discovered? Well, first of all, I strike that. Did you perform an external and an internal examination of Ms. Sorensen? Objection. Reading the witness. Overruled. She may answer. Yes. When did you perform those? November 22nd, 2021. And during the autopsy, what injuries did you discover on, on Ms. Sorensen? Virginia Sorensen had blunt trauma to her head, neck, torso, and right leg. Were you able to determine a cause of death for Ms. Sorensen? Yes, multiple blunt force traumatic injuries. And can you describe for the jury which injuries were fatal injuries? Virginia Sorensen. Overrule. Uh, Virginia Sorensen also had a high cervical spine injury with laceration of her brain stem. She also had lacerations to her heart, either of which would have been fatal. And is that consistent with being struck by a moving SUV weighing approximately 3,300 pounds? Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. Yes. Finally, Dr. Shield, did you perform an autopsy on Jackson Sparks? Yes. And did you uh, create an autopsy protocol after your examinations of um, Jackson Sparks? Yes. And did you perform or did you create a diagram which displayed the injuries on Jackson Sparks? Yes. Okay. Do you have in front of you Exhibit 64, which, in, which is an autopsy protocol for Jackson Sparks? Yes. And I'm going to display what's been marked as State's Exhibit 165 on the screen in front of you. Objection. I'm confused. The 64 or? They reference both. Oh, okay. 64 is the protocol, 165 is the diagram. Okay. I was, I was a little confused. And for the record, the State did provide Mr. Brooks with a autopsy protocol for Jackson Sparks as well as exhibit a copy of Exhibit 165, which is the diagram. Ma'am. Objection, I do not consent to that name, nor do I know that individual, for the record. Please continue. Thank you. Ma'am, does Exhibit 165, the diagram in front of you, accurately uh, show the findings that you made during the autopsy of J Jackson Sparks? Yes. Okay. I would ask the court to admit State's Exhibit 64, as well as State's Exhibit 165, into Objection. evidence and publish Exhibit 165. Objection. Overruled, Exhibit 64 is received, Exhibit 165 is received, permission to publish is granted. And Exhibit 165 is the diagram that you took, which um, displays the findings that you made in your autopsy protocol? Yes. Can you describe for the jury the injuries that you observed? Strike that. When did you do your external and internal examination of Jackson? November 27, 2021. Why was that later than the others? 
Jackson went to the hospital. He was pronounced brain dead on November 23rd. And again, is there any reason why it would take till the 27th to perform the autopsy? Jack Shane. He was oh, in, uh, oh, sorry. Overruled, you may answer. Jackson was in the hospital. He became an organ donor, which often requires a couple of extra days. Can you describe for the jury his injuries? Jackson had bruising around both of his eyes. He had a large bruise to the left side of his forehead. He had undergone a craniectomy where the neurosurgeon removes a portion of skull to relieve pressure on the brain from brain swelling. That's the large oval depicted on the left side of the skull in the diagram. He had trauma to his brain. He had bleeding around his brain inside his skull. He had multiple bruises to his brain. He also had a separation of his skull from his cervical spine. And he had two rib fractures on the right side. What was his cause of death? Complications of craniocerebral injuries due to blunt force trauma to head. And what were, what injuries of those were fatal? His head injuries. Would that be consistent with it being struck by a moving SUV weighing approximately 3,300 pounds? Yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross exam. One second. Your cross, please. Do you have any questions for this witness? Just one second. I apologize to the court for taking so long. the uh, decision was made to uh,
why why the decision was uh, made. Uh, for uh, Jackson to become an organ donor. Objection to relevance. Sustained. <coughs> Did you, uh, doing any more uh, autopsies beside those three as it relates to this case or some other case sir this case to this case did you hear the question I could he please repeat it please repeat your question As far as this case, uh, those are the only three autopsies that you did. Yes, Jackson Sparks, Virginia Sorensen, and Leanna Owens. Call when when they were brought to the hospital. Virginia Sorensen and Leanna Owens were pronounced at the scene. Jackson Sparks was transported to the hospital. Well, I'm assuming that's a. Uh, Waukesha Memorial. He was transferred to Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. Upon first uh, Tending to the to the victims. Were you in the knowledge of what happened? Yes. That uh, that knowledge was given to you immediately. Could you please repeat? That that knowledge was was given to you immediately when you were called to ten to him.
are you called to attend to any other victims of the incident or just the three? Jackson Sparks, Virginia Sorensen, and Leanna Owens. You didn't tend to anyone else? Or else? Oh, overruled. She may answer. No. No further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Dr. Shield. You may step down. May I have the exhibits, please? Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor. I call. I'm sorry. Your Honor, if it pleases the court, may I have a few moments? We can take a short break. I'll excuse the jury. We all can take about a 10 minute break. I'll rise for the jury, please. It's 2.13. We'll be in recess for 10 minutes. We'll be back at 2.23. Thank you.
Oh, you are? Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
appearances are as they were before. Uh, just to confirm, Attorney Opper, the next witness will be uh, the other medical examiner and the exhibits related to that that are hard copies have already been provided to uh, the defendant. That is correct, Your Honor, and also the state has put on the witness stand exhibits 59, 60, and 61, which are the autopsy protocols for Tamara Durand, Jane Kulik, and Wilhelm Hospital. All right, thank you. Then with that, we'll have the jury. Oh, one other thing. Yeah, I just had a question as to timing as to how late you wanted to go today so we can uh, have enough witnesses here. Sure, so I'm, um, I was not told of any conflict, so I would like to go between five and six, depending on where we end with witnesses and where we end with direct and cross exam and when we can be begin someone and how many individuals that you have. Would that work out with the individuals you have scheduled for this afternoon? Yes, I believe so. And then uh, tomorrow morning, I wanted to address timing for tomorrow morning as well, but we could do it later if you're anxious to get the jury in here. Yeah. I'd probably be inclined to have our normal time tomorrow unless there's a request to do something different. Yes, I'm going to request a 9 a.m. start time, Your Honor. I have a court appearance in Branch 10 that was put on um, uh, in a, kind of an emergency because there's a speedy trial demand that was made with an in-custody defendant. So we had been starting at 8.30. I agreed with Branch 10. I could be there at 8.15 to address that. I'm scheduled to uh, present the district attorney's budget to the um, county board tomorrow morning at 8.30. So if the court would be uh, willing to start court at 9 a.m. tomorrow, then we'd be ready to go. Um, I don't have an issue with that. We can either cut into the lunch hour, if we need be, go a little bit later. Uh, we have ample time, from my perspective, set aside for this entire case, even if the state believes they're a little bit behind. And, and, and to that extent, Your Honor, we feel like we're making uh, catching up a little bit here today. So. Right. Mr. Brooks, any statement or comment based on the requests that have just been made? No, uh, no comment. Just uh, briefly touch on the subject matter jurisdiction again. For the, uh, the court will not be addressing that. Please bring out the jury. for me if he's right there. Thank you everyone. Please be seated. All right then uh, the state may call its next witness. Call Dr. Linda Bitzerke. All right, good afternoon, Dr. Venturki. If you would please make your way to the witness stand, which is to my right up one riser. When you get there, please remain standing, raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, who's on my left, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and spell each. 
Linda, L-Y-N-D-A, Bidritsky, B-I-E-D-R-Z-Y-C-K-I. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you. Dr. Bidritsky, how are you employed? I'm the medical examiner for Waukesha County. How long have you been the medical examiner for Waukesha County? About 25 years. And can you briefly describe for the jury your education and training that you obtained prior to becoming the medical examiner? Yes. Um, I went to medical school at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I did an internship in internal medicine. Then I did general pathology training, which is anatomic study of tissues and clinical, which is laboratory medicine. Four years of that at several different places, including the Medical College of Wisconsin, University of California, and William Beaumont Hospital. I did a fellowship in forensic pathology, which is the study of trauma <coughs> and legal medicine in Detroit at Wayne County. And I did a year of cardiac pathology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Thank you. Directing your attention to November 22nd, 2021, did you perform an autopsy on a Tamara Durand? I did. And did you prepare as a result of the autopsy that you performed an autopsy protocol? Yes. Did you also prepare a diagram for court in order to summarize your findings from your autopsy protocol? I did. Okay. In front of you, you should have state's exhibit number 59, which is the autopsy protocol for Tamara Durand. Yes. Do you see that? Okay, and then I'm going to show um, in front of you exhibit 166. It will be on the screen in front of you um, shortly. Ma'am, looking at the screen in front of you, is that um, your um, diagram that you prepared for testimony today, which um, shows your summary of the autopsy protocol, the injuries to Ms. Durand? It is. Okay. Can you describe for the jury, well, first of all, when did you perform the autopsy on Ms. Durand? On November 23rd. And were you aware that this was as a result of an incident that occurred in downtown Waukesha on November 21st, 2021? Absolutely. Um, overruled, her answer may stand. Did you go to the scene on November 21st, 2021? I was there. Okay. What were your findings with regard to um, Ms. Durant? She had... Um, Two groups of injuries, I like to say. One is from the impact of the car with the body, and these injuries include the marks on her hips that you can see on the posterior. And I'm just going to ask the court, I apologize, um, permission to admit Exhibit 166 and 59 into evidence and permission to publish 166. Objection. The objection is noted. It is overruled. Exhibits 59 and 166 are both received. Permission to publish 166 is granted. I apologize. If you can start over with that testimony, they didn't have the diagram in front of them. Um, there are two groups of injuries, which is typical in a pedestrian injury. One is from the impact of the car with the body. And the external evidence of that are the marks on the back of her hips, which I indicated um, their heights between 34 and 38 inches, their um, abrasions and bruises, the red and blue marks. And those points of contact resulted in a fractures of the pelvis on the right, which is indicated with green or dark lines across the pelvis on the skeleton picture. So the car struck her hip, broke her pelvis. The other injuries that are characteristic of pedestrian injuries are the small abrasions on her toes on the right. You see little red marks on the toes. She did not have the shoe on the right foot. The impact of the car with the body pulls the foot out of the shoe. This is very characteristic of a pedestrian injury because of the force and velocity of that impact. The second group of injuries is when the person strikes the ground after that impact. And that's reflected by the laceration, a red mark on the back of her head, and then uh, reflected by a line on the skeleton diagram across the skull, which is a fracture from ear to ear at the base of the skull. 
and two fractures in the occipital area or back of the head, which you see in the posterior skeleton, um, which extend basically to the base of the spinal cord. Internally, corresponding to that impact with the ground, there was subarachnoid hemorrhage or hemorrhage covering the brain and also a tear at the level of the brain stem from that impact. Also from the ground contact are multiple rib fractures. On the left, they were uh, the upper ribs, there's little marks um, near the scapula on the left and uh, mid ribs on the right. You can see the little uh, marks there. And as a result of the impact that caused the fractures, there were also contusions of the lung bilaterally on the inside. And hemorrhage, we call retroperitoneal hemorrhage, which is the area around the kidney on the right side. So there are two groups of blood trauma. And ma'am, I'm going to give you a pointer. Um, I think it's hard maybe for the jury. I'm having a hard time seeing some of the, the dots okay. on the uh, skeletal diagram. Objection. Overruled. Grounds for the overruled. Oops. Relevant. Again, if you can just briefly describe what you just testified to, or briefly point to what you testified to. Objection. Action answer. Overruled. The witness may answer. Okay. So the first type of injury from the car are the skeletal, um, the fractures of the pelvis here, and the external marks here at the heights that I've indicated from the hood of the vehicle. Um, the toes are seen at this time. Uh, you could bring them up right here. On the, t on the top of the toes, when they're lifted out of the shoe, there's often scraping, and that's what you'll see. Then the second group of injuries from the contact with the ground, um, if it can go down now, is a laceration to the back of the head from contact with the ground, a fracture across the base of the skull ear to ear, fractures to the back of the head on the right and the left, and internally subarachnoid hemorrhage and the brainstem tear. In the chest, fractures here, ribs three and four, and five and six on this side, with also contusions to the lungs, pulmonary contusions bilaterally, and retroperitoneal hemorrhage, or hemorrhage in the soft tissue around the kidney area. And just because it's flipped, this kidney area, the right kidney, is in this area of the skeleton, right above the areas of the fractures of the pelvis. You have measurements on the third diagram from the left-hand side. What is the significance of those measurements? You had talked about the height of the car. Did you see the, the suspect vehicle, or did you um, go to look at the suspect vehicle in this case? Yes, I did. Um, overruled. She may answer. Go ahead. I did. On November 23rd, I went to um, Fleet at, in the the county complex where the car was being held, and I examined the car, looking for points of contact between the car and the, and the pedestrians, and I also looked at the configuration of the vehicle, like the height of the hood, uh, what the wheels look like, what the tires look like, where the bumper was, where the damage was, and took multiple pictures. And with the observations that you made on the, again, the third diagram from the left, and those measurements, that would be consistent with the uh, measurements taken of the hood height of the suspect vehicle? Yes, it's typical of, of the more SUV type of um, configuration of a car. I mean, a very low sports car would have a very, the hood would be low and the bumper, and if a bumper protrudes, then the bumper might be the leading edge. But SUVs have kind of a flat front and a higher um, hood. The hood that I measured and the vehicle was damaged was 42 centimeters, but that's only at one point because the configuration of the hood had different shapes as the metal was curved over the wheel well and so forth. So these measurements, 38 and a half, 37, 32 and a half, are, are pretty good for the height of a SUV type vehicle at the point of contact at the pelvis. Thank you. We have a seat. Ma'am, can you describe for the jury the fatal injuries that were suffered by Mr. Rand? 
The head injuries, the brainstem injury was quite severe. That would um, alone be fatal. Um, the, the pulmonary injuries and the uh, rib fractures could also alone be fatal, be causing um, respiratory compromise. And the pelvic injuries could alone be fatal, causing hemorrhage. So she died of multiple blunt trauma, but um, each area of injury was quite severe in and of itself. Would that be consistent with her being struck by a moving SUV weighing in excess of 3,300 pounds? Absolutely. Um, it's overruled. She may answer. Uh, it's typical of a pedestrian injury. It's typical of an injury with an SUV configuration, and the speed would be um, at least considerable because of the momentum which resulted in these severe injuries. When you say the speed would need to be considerable, what does that mean? Um, I will explain. Injuries are proportional to the energy delivered, kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, the formula, is one half times mass, mass would be the 3,300 pounds, times velocity squared. So velocity is like really critical. So if you look at severity of injuries and speed of the vehicle on a graph, the graph doesn't go like this. It's not when speed increases, injuries increase that way. Injuries increase like this because velocity is such an important part of the equation. Thank you. Moving next to the autopsy that you performed on Jane Kulik, um, I would direct your attention to State's Exhibit number 61. Yes. And also I'm going to project in front of you State's Exhibit 167, which is uh, the diagram, I believe, that you uh, created for the, uh, to assist in the testimony today. Yes. Let me know when you see that diagram. In front I of see you. it. Okay. And does that accurately depict the findings that you made in your autopsy protocol? Yes. Okay. I've asked the court to admit State <coughs> Exhibit 61 and pub admit and publish 167. Where's 61? Objection. Where's 61? You should have that. It's not been on the screen. It was provided to you previously. That'd be the autopsy protocol for Jane Kulik. All right, Exhibit 61 is received. Exhibit 167 is received, and permission to publish is granted. Now, ma'am, directing your attention to November 23rd of last year, did you perform an autopsy on Jane Kulik? <coughs> I did. Okay. And can you describe your findings um, during that autopsy? And if you can use Exhibit 167 as well as the pointer and the screen in, um, to your right. Okay. So, Ms. Kulik had three types of injuries. She had the first kind we discussed being struck by the vehicle. We have an impact to the left hip here at 39 and a half inches, and we have pelvic fractures on the left here. We have injuries to the tops of the toes. Now she had no shoes when I saw her, but the sock on the left foot was torn right in the area of the toes. Also, there's an abrasion to the top of the foot that would be considered with being taken out of her shoe. So that's from the car impact. Then second, we have injuries from hitting the ground. We have a laceration to the back of the head. And we have some laceration <coughs> abrasions on the left side of the face and the nose area. The third type of injury she has is being, from being run over by a tire. So we have a squared off abrasion across the upper abdomen, lower rib area that was sharply demarcated as I drew there. So it's not as if the abrasion blended into um, the skin, like if you do a, a sliding motion, but it was quite sharply demarcated. And associated with this injury, her liver was like lacerated, multiple tears in the liver. <coughs> bleeding from that liver injury. She had multiple fractures on the right side of her chest. Anteriorly, she also had lower um, rib fractures posteriorly here. So the pressure of the tire compressed the liver and it also um, compressed the part of the chest. The diaphragm on the right was also torn. 
Um, there's also looked like a tire mark on the lower part of her left leg. There were no fractures under that site. So she had impact from the vehicle, impact to the ground, and then crushing from the tire. What did you determine the cause of death to be for Ms. Kulik? Multiple blood trauma. And the fatal injuries, can you describe those for the jury? Her injuries from being run over were probably the most severe with the multiple rib fractures and the crushing of the liver. Also severe, however, was the pelvic fractures. Pelvic fractures, I didn't maybe explain, cause a lot of bleeding because your, um, your aorta divides in the pelvis into your iliac arteries, so it's a very big blood vessel, and also your inferior vena cava is there. So if you damage any blood vessels in the area of the pelvis, you're damaging pretty large caliber vessels, and you can lose a lot of blood. So, and also there's bone marrow in the pelvis. So pelvic injuries, especially um, when they're fragmented, as it was in her case, um, can be very, very serious. So I would say those were the two, uh, and then the rib fractures, and I didn't mention, she also has pulmonary contusions on the right and hemorrhage in the retroperitoneum on the right. So uh, those injuries, the chest injuries, the pelvic <coughs> injuries, um, and the abdominal injuries, each were very serious and um, could have been fatal individually. Okay. And is that consistent with Ms. Kulik being struck by a moving SUV weighing in excess of 3,300 pounds? Okay. Yes. Overrule. Well, her answer is Dan. Yes. Thank you. Finally, ma'am, I'm going to direct you to the autopsy protocol for Wilhelm Hospital, which is Exhibit 60 that should be in front of you. Yes. Um, I'm also, did you prepare a diagram uh, documenting your findings through the autopsy protocol? Yes. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 168. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd ask the court to admit Exhibit 60, which is the autopsy protocol, as well as the diagram contained in Exhibit 162. Or 168, I'm sorry and permission to publish 168. Objection. Uh, noted, it's overruled. Uh, exhibits 60 and 168 are both received permission to publish. Exhibit 168 is granted. What was the first, what was the first one? 60. And ma'am, did you perform an autopsy on Wilhelm Hospital on November 22nd, 2021? I did. And can you explain for the jury um, your findings that are contained on Exhibit 168? Yes. Mr. Hospital had similar types of injuries from the impact of the car. He had a very um, rectangular shaped bruise, 42 inches above the heel to the uh, back of the left hip. And he also had a bruise um, above, right around the back of the knee, slightly above and slightly below, but extending between 16 and a half and 24 inches above the knee. This uh, hip bruise corresponds to the fractures of the left side of the pelvis right here. He also had foot injuries. Instead of the toes, he had marks to both the back of both heels, and that could be because of the type of footwear. Again, he did not, I saw Mr. Hospital um, without clothing, so I did not see the shoes. Um, they were taken off at the hospital because he had surgery, but he did have injuries that we often see in pedestrians as well, whether the shoes were taken off or just the friction from um, being struck. Then he had the injuries from hitting the ground, which were lacerations and abrasions to the head on the right side and on the back, and the result of that was a fracture on the right side of the head. But this is um, kind of also interesting and shows how this injury occurred. The fracture is on the right side of the head, but the bruise to the brain and small subdural is on the left side of the head. That's called contra coup. And that type of injury occurs in a moving head injury. So his head was moving, hit the ground on the right, caused the bruise on the left because of the rebound of the brain striking the skull. So he had injuries from being struck by the car and injuries from hitting the ground. 
Now you testified, first of all, about the injuries to the back of the <coughs> second diaphragm from the left and the height of those injuries. Are there any relevance of the height of those injuries as well as the measurements that you took of the suspect vehicle, which was a uh, red Ford SUV yes. escape? When I measured um, the side of the hood, I got 42 inches. I have There's a picture with a tape measure showing that. So that corresponds well to the height of this particular pattern injury. And the height of the top of the bumper, because now the, the bumper is not uh, a shiny chrome protruding <coughs> bumper, but it's kind of a flat bumper that's uh, painted the same color as the vehicle, so it's rather broad, um, is about 26 inches, which would correspond to a strike to the back of the left leg there. Thank you. And you had testified that unlike the other two people that you had performed autopsies on, were those people brought to to the medical examiner's office from the crime scene being Main Street? Objection. <laughs> Mr. Um, Rand. Overruled. She may answer. I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Rand was brought from the scene, and I saw her at the scene before I did the autopsy. Ms. Kulik was brought from um, Waukesha Memorial Hospital, where she was pronounced. And uh, Mr. Hospital, Mr. Hospital was brought later because he was treated at the hospital. Okay. And can you describe, or what would, did you determine the cause of death to be for Mr. Hospital? Uh, multiple blood force trauma. And the fatal injuries for Mr. Hospital, can you describe those for the jury? Answer. Uh, over my <laughs> should I answer? Okay. Uh, Mr. Hospital's most severe injuries were related to um, his pelvic injuries, which um, he lost a lot of blood. They require to uh, put a coil to try to um, <coughs> obstruct the bleeding vessel to stop it from bleeding. It was not accessible surgically. They had to put like a coil through the vasculature. Um, but also the impact here caused uh, an injury to the thoracic duct which um, carries your lymph fluid. And as a result of that um, injury, he also had an accumulation of fluid in both chest cavities of the lymph fluid that occurred during the hospital course, which impaired his respiratory status. So it's an indirect cause of the injury, the accumulation of the, the fluid. But they both were related to the impact of the vehicle. His head injuries, it's harder to assess because he died. He, was, um, he did present with a, a change in consciousness, so it's possible those head injuries would have also have been independently fatal. And would those fatal injuries and the injuries that you've described, would those be consistent with being struck by a, a moving SUV weighing in excess of 3,300 pounds? Objection. Overruled. Oh, Absolutely. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. Any questions for this witness? I do. Um, your primary uh, field is um, in the medical field. Would that be fair to say? Yes. Any reason why you would be inspecting a car if that's not a medical professional thing? The examination of anything that's related to injuries in the people that I later examine is relevant in my specialty of forensic pathology. So examining the vehicle Examining the vehicle would be important to your uh, medical assessments in what, in what way? Because the injuries that people sustain, whether it's a vehicle in this case or anything else, um, it's important to correspond the nature of the implement, the implement being the car. So it's possible I would be shown a car that would be not consistent with the injuries. So it would be fair to say you've done uh, numerous autopsies in your um, time as a medical professional. Would that be fair to say? That's true. 
And as you just said, um, examining the vehicle would be essential to your medical expertise. Is that, is that fair to say? Examining the vehicle is important to interpret the injuries. I, I don't, I'm not sure that, I don't know if that's the answer to your question. So with, if you were doing a, an injury assessment based on if the injury was caused by a different kind of uh, instrument, would, would the same apply to having to view that? Yes, if um, in cases of gunshot wounds, I asked to see the gun. In cases of stabbings or blunt trauma, I asked to see the weapons that they think were used so I can determine if they um, are consistent or not consistent. I can't make matches, like precise matches, but I can say it looks like a baseball bat or it looks like a pair of scissors, that kind of thing. It would be fair to say if in, in a case of a gunshot wound, as you brought up, um, it, it wouldn't be, it would, well, let me back up, it would, would you say it would be hard to assess the gun being that it wouldn't be the actual gun but the bullets that caused the injury? Well, actually, I don't examine the bullets, but I would examine the gun, especially, for example, if it's a contact wound. So if the muzzle of the gun touches the skin, then the muzzle could leave a mark. So then I could say, the muzzle of the gun shown to me might match the mark. And that, uh, if it was something similar to that, the muzzle type thing, that would be, the mark would be from the heat. Would that be fair to say? No, not actually. It's actually from the contact of the metal. So it's more of an abrasion than a burn. So in a case like in, in, in a case like that, what would be the significance of the actual inspection of the gun? I'm gonna object to this idea. I think it's a little bit of field of where we're, we're at. Grounds. Um, uh, overruled. She may answer. She brought it up as an example. I'll allow a little sorry. bit of leeway, but um, go ahead. Uh, could you repeat your question? What would be the significance in in a case like that, as you as you stated? Um, you view all types of instruments, gunshot wounds and things of that nature. What would be the significance of inspecting the actual gun in terms of the injury? Well, I, would, I may be able to say that the mark on the skin, for example, is consistent with the outline of the muzzle of that particular weapon, looking at the dimensions and shape. So what if, what if it was used from a distance? then what would be the essential reason to expect the gun? Depending on the distance, um, sometimes uh, the pattern of stippling, um, like for example, if there's a flash suppressor, suppression or something used, that can play a role. If it's very far away, then the actual characteristics of the weapon are more general. In other words, um, the size of the hole, for example, or uh, would, might reflect the, both the size of the caliber of the gun or the velocity. So it depends on, it, distance does play a role on what I would be evaluating. Do you know uh, if at the time you did the autopsies, if any of, uh, any of the victims you performed the autopsy on had any underlining uh, illnesses at that time, uh, any cancers or anything like that that may have been going on at the time that you did the autopsy? Yes, I would make observations of any natural disease processes that I saw at the time of autopsy. Did you observe any? Yes. Um, do you recall from who that was? Well, Mr. Hospital, he was an um, uh, older gentleman. He had some heart disease, as I recall, a pacemaker, um, some coronary artery disease. Uh, Ms. Kulik, as I recall, had uh, a large fibroid. That's what I remember. I, I, you know, I could look and 
uh, clarify my memory further, but those are examples. Um, can you explain to the jury what, what is a large thyroid? Is that the word you, thyroid? Fibroid. Fi I, I'm sorry. Yes. It's fibroid. A, a benign uterine tumor. Is that a form of cancer? No. And you said uh, the older gentleman had uh, some some fluid build up in the chest. It, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't. I don't want to misquote you. Um, some type of fluid around the chest area. Correct. And from your recollection, that wasn't caused by the vehicle. That was. He entered the hospital actually with no evidence of that fluid, but. Um, it's lymphatic fluid from the thoracic duct from a thoracic duct injury. So over the time he was treated, especially with the fluid resuscitation, because of the blood loss, the fluid collected in the hospital um, as a rupture of that thoracic duct injury and was in the pleural space surrounding the lungs. So that it would be fair to say that that came about once he was already at the hospital. That's true. And you said he had a pacemaker. Would, would that have uh, any effect whatsoever on what might have been going on in his chest at the time? No. And because he was in the hospital, that pa the function of that pacemaker was well documented while he was being monitored. Was it pretty, was it pretty active, still working properly at that time? It was. Even with the loss of blood, as you say, he, he had a loss of blood. Even even then, was it still working pretty pretty good? Yes, it, the loss of blood had no effect on the electrical function of the pacemaker. Were you at the parade at the time of the incident? No, I was called after. So at the time you were called, uh, did you know uh, any information about the incident? Yes, uh, because I was called in my function as a medical examiner, I was informed about the death of numerous people, injuries of more, and that this was a result of a car going through the parade. Do you recall if, if it was referred to as a car or, or an SUV? I'm sure I was told it was an SUV because the vehicle in question was in custody at the time. And you were already privy to that information before you arrived at the scene? Either before or at the scene. Do you recall who whom informed you of that? It could either have been my staff, who were the first person, uh, the first people notified, so they would have reported to me what they were told, or it could have been detectives at the scene who I also interacted with. So it would be fair to say you don't really recall? Not specifically. And you said you observed damage to the vehicle when, when you were able to view it? Yes. Would you, would you say it was extensive damage, or did you really look at one specific area? Or let me rephrase that. Were you, um, were you really focused on one certain area of the vehicle when you viewed it? Well, when I was examining the car, actually the crime lab was there. So we um, looked at the entire circumference of the vehicle, and the vehicle was also on a lift, and we looked under the vehicle because we were questioning whether there was uh, clothing, perhaps, or other uh, physical evidence that would um, be, be important to document. So I would say that I looked at the car um, quite, quite comprehensively, although it was not my job to document damage to the vehicle per se, other than what related to my autopsy um, interest. And that would be specifically looking at the hood of the vehicle 
to determine how it fit with your uh, medical expertise? Well, I, I paid attention to the front end of the vehicle, which is the part that typically is involved in uh, pedestrian strikes. And those are the parts that I, I paid more attention to in terms of measurement than say, um, I don't know, the, uh, the but it, it would be more of the damages because now I'm thinking in some pedestrian strikes, uh, there are cracks to the windshield or injuries to the side mirrors or and so forth. So I paid attention wherever I thought the damage would be that would be relevant to my cases. But I did take measurements of the front end. With your expertise, would, would, would you determine that all of the damage that you observed would be caused strictly from hitting one thing or numerous? I can say that there were multiple areas of the um, car that had damage, so it would it would seem <coughs> unlikely to be from one impact because, the, in my experience, it's you know uh, you can have a frontal impact, you can have a side impact, you can be rear-ended, but there were um, dents, if you will, in multiple areas of the car. <coughs> So from your expertise, it, that could have came from a, a, a number of different things. That's true. You made a brief um, observation about speed and velocity. Do you have any expertise in that area? Only to the extent that I understand how injuries occur and um, I, in terms of the transfer of kinetic energy, because all injuries I see in the body have to do with that kind of transfer. Would it be fair to say that everybody is different, though? Everybody is different. So with, with May... Um, I guess I would, I would phrase the question by saying, something that may seriously injure someone else probably wouldn't seriously injure another person. Based on your expertise. Generally things of a serious nature don't become um, not serious. I would say that different people might have um, this, you know, there are differences in people and how injuries would, inj how different events might injure them. But I wouldn't say that something that's serious in one individual would be minimal in another. Even though there might be a range, it's not going to be um, okay for one person, but maybe deadly for another. That is not typically how it is. But it can vary. It can vary. Do you recall how many people you were called to attend to the night of the incident? How many people I was called to attend to? Yes. There were three victims on the road. Those are the ones that I saw that night. Did you uh, see anyone else besides those three? I later saw um, Ms. Kulik, who came from the hospital. Those were the people I examined that evening. So it was just the three? The four. Oh, I'm sorry, four. Yes. And, and no one besides those four? Correct. Do you, do you recall being notified possibly to testify in this matter? Yes. Do you know about when? I knew 
knew always that this case would end up in trial. I mean, whether, but I don't remember when I actually had a date and time for appearance. And, and how would you know exactly that the case would end up in trial? Um, and I say that because many factors could play out along, you know, many different things happen over time. You're right. That was probably a misstatement on my part. I thought it might go to trial, given the nature of the case, but I did not know for sure. That makes sense, definitely. So you had uh, an idea that you might be testifying. That's true. And when did you know for sure that you would be testifying? Um, but you really only know for sure when you're called to court. You get a subpoena and things can still change. So um, I guess that's the best answer I can give you. Uh, do you recall when you were subpoenaed? No. <laughs> Was it fairly recent to now or was it some time ago a few months probably not months but i don't remember do you recall whom you were subpoenaed by the district attorney would that be referring to one of the district attorneys here today sue Upper. what time you arrived on the scene after the incident that night? It was about 10 to 8. And do you recall what time you finally left the scene? I th no, I don't recall exactly. Would it be fair to say you were there for, for quite some time? Probably around an hour or so, and then we um, continued our work at the medical examiner's office for a couple more hours. And after you were subpoenaed, did you um, were you in contact with Attorney Opera after that? Yes. Did Attorney Opera ever state that she was the plaintiff in this matter? Objection relevant. Right. <coughs> Sustained. You do not have to answer that question. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor. You may ask your next question. Were you ever made aware of the plaintiff in this matter? Objection, Grounds. Robbins. Sustained. You do not have to answer that. Please ask your next question. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor, before I continue. Ask your next question. Do you even know if there's a plaintiff in this matter? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. A uh, reason for the sustain, Your Honor? Ask your next question. No reason for the sustain, Your Honor? Ask your next question. <laughs> Do you know of any claims filed in this matter by you or anyone else? Um, what are claims? Any reports filed, any... Uh, Any filings made on your behalf or anyone you know? I'm actually not sure I understand that. I would object to it. It's vague. Grounds. Sustained. Sustained as to the form of the question. Did you uh, make any claim of being an injured party in this matter? No. 
Do you know of anybody that that, that has? Objection relevance. Grounds. Sustain. Reason for the sustain, Your Honor. Relevance, speculation, vague. <coughs> Have you had any um any opportunity to view a complaint in this matter? Objection vague. Grounds. Sustained as to the form. Have you ever seen a complaint in this matter? Objection vague. Grounds. Sustained as to the form. ever at any time had any interaction with the plaintiff in this matter? Objection. Grounds? Sustained. Reason for the sustain, Your Honor? Vague. Relevance. I would object to that sustain. Uh, you said vague and relevance. Relevant to the sustain. case. Sustain. Next question, sir. It's relevant, Your Honor. Jury Your deserves to know. It is overruled. I respect that. Jury deserves to know, though. Jury will disregard the last statement made by Mr. Brooks. It's not his time to testify. Comments made by the parties or attorneys are not evidence. Have you ever seen the plaintiff in this matter? Objection, relevance. Grounds. Sustained. Reason for the sustain, Your Honor? Same as before. Uh, so that would be relevancy and vagueness? Ask your next question. Was today your first time ever seeing those exhibits that were shown? No. You you seen those before those videos? Videos? Yeah, the the exhibits that that were shown the. Uh... Diagrams. Yes, I'm I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. know that's how you identified them. Oh. Well, I drew them. Oh, th those exact ones. Yes. Oh, so okay, okay. I wasn't aware of that. I apologize for that question. <laughs> And so I'm assuming at some point you turned those over to the district attorney. Would that be fair to say? Today. Oh, today. Any reason why you didn't previously turn those over before you actually were called to test or before you knew that you would be testifying today? We, I, I decided to prepare them for the purpose of testimony. They didn't exist before today. Mm, that's interesting. So this was really like a 11th hour bottom of the night thing for you to get them prepared and be ready to go today then. Would that be fair to say? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I mean, it's true, I did finish preparing them today, but I was, um, I was, what shall I say? I was detailing them um, and wanted them to be as good as possible. So how long did it take for you to detail them? I guess I have to explain that there are no pre-existing diagrams of front and back skeleton and body diagrams in my office's collection of diagrams. So I spent time finding the proper diagrams, scaling them, composing them, and putting them in a format that I thought would be the best to illustrate the points I wanted to make. So I created the basic diagram, and then I decided on how to describe the injuries and 
I, you know, did one version, then I did another version. I wanted it to be very good. And so that's why I can say it didn't exist in the form you saw today until today, because that's what I was doing. So would it be fair to say that you have been working at this for some time then, to get it the way you? A few days, a few days. Did you anticipate that you would be using those diagrams? Yes. So I'm assuming that some type of conversation had to be had in order for you to work that hard on those diagrams. Would that be fair to say? Yes. And you had that conversation with Attorney Opper? Yes. <laughs> to your knowledge, why would you, well, not why, Take that back. To your knowledge, what would be the reason why you, were, you weren't already asked to develop those diagrams? Meaning, why weren't you asked this months ago in, in advance? I don't think that anybody thinks about um, what exhibits might be used in a trial until the trial approaches would be my answer. But it would be fair to say that you just testified that you didn't know for sure if there would be a trial. Correct. That it was an assumption. Correct. Had you ever uh, created any uh, diagrams like that before this yeah. incident? I'm sorry. Um, for these cases? Or at, at any time before this particular case? Are you still refer? You're not referring to these particular the, cases? These particular, uh, the way that you did these. Had you ever done this before this, this incident? I've used diagrams in many, many trials. I just didn't have a diagram that displayed um, the body and the skeleton in this manner. You know, I had no pre-existing form, but I use diagrams all the time. So for this particular case, you, you decided to go a little bit, of, a little bit extra. Would that be fair to say? Objection, Grounds? Sustained. As to the form of the question. Would it be fair to say then that for, for this particular case, you decided that you would want a, a, a diagram that was a little bit more defined? What I decided was we had three um, decedents and I thought it would be easiest for the jury to understand the complexity of the injuries when talking about three people sequentially if I could compress the information. Otherwise, a typical autopsy might have a skull diagram and then another page a body diagram and then another page a skeleton. You know, it would be multiple pages. And I thought that would be very um, difficult when we're talking about three different people. So had you thought of that before in any other cases that you've done before this one? I don't remember testifying about three pedestrians in trial in one sitting ever before. No, no, no. I, I wasn't asking uh, if you've testified at a trial before. Um, I, I was asking based on the explanation that you just gave about making it easier to read the diagrams. Had you ever thought of that before this particular case? It's, yes. It's not unusual for me to create my own diagrams specific to a case. What I meant by that question was the way that 
you designed these particular diagrams? Had you thought of doing it this way before this particular incident? Grounds. Sustain. Grounds for the sustain, Your Honor? Next Do you recall when you completed all your um, medical work for, for this particular case? Well, the autopsy report was signed in February of um, 2022. So my medical work, my conclusions were, were concluded at that time. So about eight months? Um, At the time that you concluded your um, reports, were you already thinking about forming uh, the diagrams for the injuries? No. So that kind of came about during the process of um, possibly knowing that you might testify. The diagrams were um, created as court exhibits. Today? Completed today. Do you recall what time they were completed today? Was it morning or shortly before you came in or? Judge has relevance. Grounds. Overruled, she may answer. I think I actually completed them last night, but um, we got the copies made this morning and they were not given to Ms. Opper until today. So I think they actually were completed in terms of my um, sketching last night, but they were not, um, I had to get color copies made and they had to be submitted. So I would say, I thought of them as being done this morning, but I was working on them last night. No further questions. Let me read briefly. Ma'am, to follow up on these diagrams that have been presented in court today, are all the findings that are contained in those diagrams from the autopsy protocol? Yes. Objection. Overruled. Well, let me see. Overruled. And ma'am, could you have brought in a skeleton? It's Halloween, so we see them all over the place, but could you have brought in a skeleton and describe the same injuries? Objection, relevancy. Overruled. It's Objection, correct. hearsay. She may, it's not hearsay, she may answer. <laughs> I could show you the broken bones on the skeleton. I couldn't show you the injuries to the soft tissues or the organs on the skeleton. And if you had in um, a doll or a mannequin, that would be something that you could show the jury, just like you did in these diagrams, where the injuries, the external injuries were. Would that be Objection. a correct statement? Brother Vinci. Overruled. You may answer. That's true. So is there anything on these diagrams that were not contained within the autopsy protocol that were turned over to the state months ago. Objection, relevancy. Overruled. No, there's nothing on the diagrams that was not, um, con that isn't listed in the <coughs> autopsy reports. In fact, if I had a blank diagram in reviewing the autopsy protocol today, if I put a blank diagram in front of you, could you have made these same markings right here? And it would have just taken time, obviously, but could you have done it right now? Objection, oh. lead the witness. Uh, overruled, you may answer. Yes, I could. Thank you. Now, I want to talk briefly about uh, Jane Kulik's autopsy. Um, you had stated that there were, you had discovered a benign 
um, uterine fibroid, is that correct? Correct. Did that in any way, was that a factor in her death? Objection, hearsay. Overruled, she may answer. No. And with regard to Wilhelm Hospo, was the presence of a pacemaker in any way related to his death? Objection, I asked that in my cross and she answered. Overruled, it's redirect, it's proper, the state may ask it. You may answer. No. The coronary disease that you testified to on cross-examination, was that, did that play a factor in his death? Objection, same, same reason. Overruled, Already you may answered. answer. No. The thoracic fluid found in Mr. Hospital's lungs that you said did play a factor in his death. Is that correct? Yes. What caused that fluid buildup around his lungs? Objection. Answered already. Overruled. You may answer. It was an injury to the thoracic duct that was caused by the impact by the, of the vehicle to his body. <coughs> Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You may step down. My jurors are okay. Just thought we'd stand for a bit, but then keep going with testimony. So everyone may stand. Do our little stretch break. We haven't done one of those in a while. <laughs> Probably a good thing the camera can't capture you. This chair hurts a few The non chair. When you're ready, have a seat. All right, the state may call its next witness. The state call Father Matthew Witter. Sir, if you would please make your way to my witness stand, which is all the way up here, upper riser to my right. When you get there, please remain standing, raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. The first thing I will have you do is state your first and last names for the record and spell each. My name is Matthew Witter. M-A-T-T-H-E-W, and then last name Witter, W-I-D-D -D as in dog, E-R. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Sir, how are you employed? I'm the pastor of the Catholic community of Waukesha for so four Catholic churches in the, the city of, of Waukesha. And what are those Catholic churches? So St. William, St. Joseph, St. Mary, and St. John Newman. We're also associated with Waukesha Catholic, uh, the school. Okay, thank you. And when you say the uh, Catholic community of Waukesha, four parishes, are, and you're the pastor at all four? Exactly, yep. There's uh, four of us priests. I'm the pastor. There's two other priests and uh, a team, you know, that kind of works together. So you actually do sermons or services at each of the four churches? Yep, exactly. So we'd, uh, the four of us priests uh, kind of go around and exactly wherever we're called to be, we're kind of on a bit of a rotation, but we're at all the, those four churches. Okay. Directing your attention to November 21st of last year, were you at the City of Waukesha Christmas Parade? Exactly. I was uh, the Catholic community of Waukesha, Waukesha Catholic, were, were walking in the, in the parade. Okay. And when you say, were there just one group of people, or when you said the school and the yeah, church? Yeah, we, we were one group. Okay. One group. Did you have a float or anything? We did not have a float. There was a banner and... Um, uh, the banner was kind of being carried at different times by a different amount of people, but otherwise we were walking uh, different proximity to the front and back. We were spread out a little bit. Approximately how many people were in that group that day? Probably between 40 and 50. <clears throat> was there any type of formation? Uh, there wasn't like a, you know, I think at different times we were probably closer together, at different times we were more spread out. As the praise went on, I think, you know, some people walk faster, some slower. 
and no uniform or did everyone wear the same type of shirt or sweatshirt? We didn't have, uh, no, it was somewhat cold, so we had different kind of, <coughs> trying to stay generally speaking warm. We had some little, kind of little, very small kind of lights that were can, uh, kind of carrying, very small, just kind of that sense of, not everyone had them, I didn't have one, but that sense of uh, kind of bringing the light of Christ into to Christmas. And Thank you. I'm going to show you a variety of exhibits. Um, first, I'm going to publish them or put them on the screen in front of you, and I'll direct your attention there. I'll ask you some questions um, about them, okay? So first thing I start with, the, with exhibit 129. And let me know when you see that exhibit in front of you. Okay, yep, I see it. Okay. And have you seen that picture before? Yep, I have. And yeah. do you know who that was taken by? I believe it was taken by Jason Peckloff. Uh, he's at least the person that uh, I've saw the picture from, so it was probably circulated, but uh, yeah. Okay, do you know when it was taken? It was taken before the parade started with, uh, with some of the group. <clears throat> okay, so this wasn't all the people in your group? Not everyone, but uh, um, you know, a chunk of people. Okay, are you familiar with pretty yeah. much everyone within this picture? Yep. Yeah. And there are names that are associated with certain people who are we, who are we, who we are, um, considering um, injured parties in this matter. Do you see those names? I do. Do you see the arrows that are associated between the people and the name? I do. Can you briefly look at that and let me know if those names are correctly associated with the correct people? Yeah, to the to the best of my my ability, uh, Juan uh, Marquez is kind of in the back. That's a that's a different difficult one to say. It's uh, probably him on that angle. I couldn't say like a hundred hundred percent, but uh, very very probable. Okay. Um, I would ask the court to admit Exhibit One Twenty Nine into evidence and publish it for the jury. Would ask the court to publish. Easy. The objection is overruled. Exhibit 129 is received and permission to publish is granted. Can you briefly kind of go over the people who are named and their relationship with the other people um, in this picture? For example, I see yep. um, some um, kids with the last name Perales Alvarez. Exactly. Um, yep. Can you kind of describe what their relationship is to one another? Exactly. Yep. So uh, Yamalet and Ashley. They're the, and then next to them, unnamed is Yashleen. They're the uh, daughters of uh, Maria Alvarez Dominguez, as his name there. You just say Alvarez uh, Perales, actually. Okay. And then uh, um, Jose Perales Alvarez. Okay. Uh, th that, so those are uh, connected there. Okay. And then uh, um, yeah, Benjamin and Elliot Hallmark are uh, our siblings. Some of their other siblings are there too. Okay. Gregorio Romelia. She usually goes by Romy Perez and uh, Camila on the far left. Uh, that's mother and, and daughter. Okay. And then uh, Juan uh, in the back, his, uh, his son David is up front. His, his head is kind of ducked to the side. Okay. So those would be the, the relationship connections. How about Adair Lopez Rebelar? Objection uh, leading a witness. Adair is. Uh, Hold on, there's been an objection. I need to rule on it. Um, the uh, objection is noted. It's. <coughs> Overruled, and you may answer. So Adair is, uh, uh, his mother Marisol was also in the parade. Uh, she's not in the picture though. And how about Maria Alvarez Dominguez? I don't know if you addressed her yet. Oh, yeah, uh, Maria is the, she's the mother, and I, and I forgot Eileen, I, I know I was missing someone. Eileen is on the far right. So Eileen with the A, Yamalet, Ashley are the, and then Yashleen who's not, doesn't have a name box by her. Uh, they're the, the kids of uh, Maria and, uh, and Jose, who's got the, just barely see the red hood. Okay. And does this accurately reflect kind of the clothing that they were wearing while they were marching in the parade on November 21st of last year? I would believe, I believe so. Okay. I'm now gonna direct you to exhibit 128, because I, I thought, um, <coughs> I 
So can you identify the person depicted in, the, in that photograph, 128? Yeah, so as it says, that'd be, that'd be David. Okay, He'd be so one of the younger, younger kids. He was kind of hidden a little bit in Exhibit 129, so I wanted to get a, a better picture of him. Um, I'd ask that this be admitted into evidence. I'm sorry, was this taken on the day of the parade? Does it appear? It would definitely appear. I, I'm not familiar with the picture, but it would, I mean, it would definitely appear. That appears to be the street that you guys exactly. walked on yep, and the clothing definitely. that he was wearing. Um, overrule, Father, do me a favor and just wait until the question is fully asked before you answer it. I know it can be very easy to anticipate, but the very nice lady in front of you is taking down a record of everything that's said, and it just makes her job a little bit more difficult if that happens. It's okay. So hopefully his answer was clear. If not, you can read it. I'm sorry, that um, accurately reflects um, what you believed you would have seen on November 21st of last year? Yes. I would ask that Exhibit 128 be admitted into evidence and published to the jury. Objection. Exhibit 128 is received and permission to publish is granted. The objection is overruled. Now I'm also going to then um, show you on the screen in front of you Exhibit 121. Let me know when that's showing in front of you. It, it is. Okay. Um, you had indicated that in front of the group was a banner. Is this uh, consistent with what you're seeing, or can you describe generally what you're seeing in Exhibit 121? That would be our group somewhat close to the beginning of the, the parade route. So that's the banner. That's uh, Bob carrying it on one side, and, and Jason Peckloff, as is noted, on the other side, where yeah, there's St. Matthias in the background, St. Joseph is kind of right in front of that towards the beginning of the row. Okay. And there are other names um, that are associated with people. Um, there's a box with their name with a red arrow um, going from the person to the name. Are all of those correctly diagrammed? Camila uh, certainly is. Jason certainly is. Adair certainly is. Maria certainly is. Juan, I couldn't say definitively that that's him, and Jose Perales, I, I believe that's him, but I couldn't say definitively on that particular angle. Okay, and with regard to Jason Peckloff, specifically since we've identified the other people in this um, <coughs> photograph through Exhibit 129, that is Jason Peckloff, and he's correctly uh, named in Def this diagram? Yeah, definitely. Jason, uh, everybody was not positively identified. Um, I would note that the witness identified most with certainty, others without. Um, so the jury should just keep that in mind at this point. I don't believe there's been an offer, though, to or a request to receive it just yet. So I'll withhold any of that. And Your Honor, I'm going to move <laughs> Exhibit 121 into evidence, ask that it be published um, with the understanding that um, Father Witter indicated that Jose Perales Alvarez and Juan Marquez, um, it would be consistent, but he cannot say with 100% positivity that uh, those are those two individuals. It was not said with uh, certainty at whatsoever. It, the, the answer was he's not sure. Um, exhibit 121 is received as noted by uh, the state uh, permission to publish is granted. Sir, again, in looking at this exhibit, which is 121, um, other than Jose Perales Alvarez and Juan Marquez, which you indicated you weren't positive about, the other people whose names are in arrows are on that picture, you can positively identify them? 100%. Okay, thank you. Now I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 122. And again, is this consistent with a picture that was taken at the very beginning of the parade where the other picture was taken from? That's, that's correct. Okay. And uh, there are two names associated with two individuals on this picture. 
Can you positively identify that those individuals are the people um, in this picture? Objection, leading the witness. Um, overall. Yeah, William Mitchell and, and Yamalat Perales, that would be 100% certain. Thank you. I would ask the court to admit Exhibit 122 into evidence and publish it for the jury. Exhibit 122 has received permission to publish granted. And again, this accurate reflects um, the identity of William Mitchell. If you can just circle William Mitchell in the photograph, it is a touch screen um, in front of you. I should. And Yamalat Perales Alvarez. Thank you. Moving on to Exhibit 123. Can you identify the individuals who are named in this exhibit? Objection. The names are on here. The question was whether he could identify the individuals who are named. So that's a big arrow point to here. Your, your objections noted. It's overruled. You may answer the question. So each of the, the, the people, uh, Benjamin Hall, Hallmark, that arrow is correct. Maria Perez, that is correct. <coughs> that is Luke Hallmark. Marisol, that would be Marisol. And, and then uh, Gregoria, I would say. 100% I would attest to that picture. And again, does this look to be taken in the same vicinity as the other pictures <coughs> I've shown to you? It definitely, it's towards the beginning of the route. Uh, exactly, I believe that's probably St. Matthias right there and St. Joseph be right in front of us. I'd ask the court to admit Exhibit 123 into evidence and to publish it for the jury. Objection, relevancy. Overruled. Exhibit 123 has received permission to publish as granted. Again, sir, I'm just going to ask you to circle um, the people associated with the names as I call them out. Um, Benjamin Hallmark, I think you had previously identified in Exhibit 129, but where is he in, if you can circle him. Okay. And Maria Perez. Yes, Maria. Luke Hallmark. Marisol Lopez Gutierrez. <coughs> and Gregorio Romelia Perez, I think you said you know her as Romy? Yeah, she also goes by Romy. Thank you. I'm now going to show you uh, States Exhibit 124. <coughs> and let me know when you, oh, you see it, I'm sorry. Um, and does this again, it looks like it's taken from the same angle as the prior exhibits. Um, do you see the name of Elliot Hallmark and Father Pat Heppy? I do. And are the arrows associated with the people that you know as um, Elliot Hallmark and Father Pat Heppy? Objection, leading the witness. Um, you may answer. Yep, 100%. Thank those, you. those would be correct. Thank you. I would ask the court to admit Exhibit 124 and publish it for the jury. Objection, rather than issue. Overruled. Exhibit 124 is received and permission to publish is granted. And again, just to clarify for the jury, Elliot Hallmark, can you circle him? And Father Pat Happy, can you circle him? That was he one of the other three um, pastors? Exactly. Yep, Father Pat is the, the pastor emeritus in the Catholic community of Waukesha, so he's one of the four of us priests. Okay, thank you. And finally, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 125. Let me know when it's on your screen. Yep. And the final two, or two of the people that we did not identify in that first picture, Exhibit 129, Lori Loken and Margaret um, Pakoulis, and she goes by Peggy. Um, do you see them in this picture? I do. Are they correctly identified? They are. I'd ask the, and again, it's, this photograph is taken at the same location as the others? Yep. Okay. Um, I'd ask the court to admit Exhibit 125 and allow it to be published for the jury. Objection. Relevancy. Overruled. Exhibit 1, excuse me, Exhibit 125 is received and permission to publish is granted. 
Thank you. If you can circle, circle Lori Loken and Margaret Pakoulis. Thank you. We can take this um, exhibit down. Do you recall as you were marching or walking in the parade, who, what group was in front of you? The, the, the group in terms of, we were at, the Catholic Memorial Group was the group in front of us, behind us were the dancing grannies. Okay, thank you, that's what I was looking for. What, at some point, was your attention drawn to something during the parade? Uh, something unusual? Yeah, so we were uh, all of a sudden kind of heard a scream, and you know, my experience was I, I turned to my left, and there was a red SUV just flying uh, down the road. Um, you know, my, my next experience would be kind of hearing it, you know, you know, kind of striking people. <laughs> And I'm gonna just because we have to put that on the record that you put your fist to your um, uh, yeah, palm of just, your hand, yeah. making a striking noise. Yep, just kind of like a Objection. pounding the way sound, I guess you'd call it. Overruled. The description may stand. Keep going. Thank you. Next, Next question. question. How many times did you hear that? So for me, the witness. Overruled. You may answer. I heard that uh, two times. Where were you when you were marching in this group? Were you on, as you're walking down Main Street, were you on the right hand side of the group, which would be, I don't know why I can't get this right. Um, the right side would be, I believe, the north. Or were you on the left hand side of the street, which would be the south, or were you in the middle? I was more towards the, the right hand side of the street. And when, did you look back, and you, you said you looked back and saw the red SUV, correct? Yeah. But, uh, the way I would describe it is if the car would have hit me, it would have hit me. Um, I kind of saw it as it was entering into our group. And the two um, impacts that you heard, did you see those impacts? My mind blocks that part out of it. So I couldn't say who was, who was hit in those impacts. What I could say is that my next encounter was that there were three people from our group that I, I don't believe would have been the ones with impact that were lying more or less right in my, my immediate path. So two right in front of you on the right-hand side of the street yep. as you testified? On, on the right-hand side. Those are the first, the, the, the three people that I was right by then. And before that car went through, were those three people on the ground? <laughs> Definitely not. Where did this impact take place? Do you know approximately where on the parade route? Yeah, so it was. It would have been past Curry Insurance. There would have been, um, I believe it's Main Street Bar and Grill, and then there's kind of an unnamed bar, and then there's Planned Parenthood. So th those would be the, the, it's kind of the Main Street, between Main Street and the un, kind of unnamed bars where it would, would happen. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked and admitted into evidence as State's Exhibit 15. Um, it will not only be, I'd ask that it be published as well. Go ahead. Um, Objection, how many times do you need to publish the same picture? Your objection's noted, it's overruled. Of course. On this picture, there are um, different groups that appear to be on this picture. Can you describe, does this, what does this appear to be a map of? Yeah, that would be Main Street. Um, that that'd be the, the, our groups, all the all, you know the groups of the the parade. And, and you uh, see your victims. group on this map. I do. Would it be in the left hand side of the of Exhibit 15? Objection, leading the witness. Sustain. Uh, hold on, sustain. Please rephrase. Sure. You, where would you see? You said you saw your group. Where do you see your group on this map? Uh, on this map, our group is furthest to my my left. Can you circle it? And that would be in that arrow, or I'm sorry, that star that you circled, then is attached to a list of names. Is that correct? Objection, leading the witness. Sustained, please rephrase. Yes. Is there, do you see a list of names and an arrow on that map? 
objection, leading the witness. Overruled. You may answer. I do. And where does that, um, do you recognize the names that are on that map? Objection, leading the witness. Overruled. You may answer. Yep, I, I recognize all those names. And it appears that approximately how, or how many names are, are on that list? Objection, leading the witness. Overruled. Nineteen. Didn't mean to test you. <laughs> um, and were all those people, to your knowledge, um, injured as a result of being struck by or indirectly struck by the vehicle in the parade? Objection, hearsay. Overruled, you may answer. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, we can take exhibit 15 down. So when you looked around and saw the red SUV, was there, did you hear the impacts first or did you see the red SUV first? I, I saw the, the red SUV just uh, flying on the left side. I mean, flying is a relative word, but it was, you know, going fast in my, it was going faster than anyone in their right mind would be driving in that scenario. Could you estimate the speed? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. You may answer. From being on that street and other occasions and kind of walking over there, you know, the speed limit is 25. I, I, the car, in my estimation, was going faster than I would see a car driving in normal times down that street. So an excess of 25 miles per hour? Objection, hearsay, leading the witness. Uh, not hearsay, it's a clarification question. Um, your objection is noted. It's overruled. You may answer. I, w I would say yes. Now, when you said that you saw the, uh, the red SUV coming to your left, I know you described your path of travel being on the right side exactly. of the road. Um, so it's to the left of you. Would it be more towards the, the <coughs> middle of your group or to the left of your group? Or on the left-hand side of your group? I would say it was on my left. So you're not sure how far away it was when it passed you? No, it was it was on my left. I was not struck. It was on my left. It wasn't. Uh... Did you see who was driving the vehicle? I did not. After the vehicle, did the vehicle um, go past your group? Did it drive past your group? I, I believe it did. I, um, I saw it just fly by, and my intention immediately was drawn towards the, the three people that were on the ground in my vicinity. After the car went by, did you ever see the car stop? I, I simply uh, I saw the car fly by, and then the next thing I knew, there were, there were three people in front of me on the ground, so my attention right there. Did you see anyone else on the ground? after the car passed, other than the three people you initially saw? Uh, there are other, you know, so all around then there are different kind of, as time played out, kind of pockets of people. Can you describe who you saw after the car went through who appeared to be injured? So the, th the three people that were uh, in my path were Father Patrick Heppy and then Maria Perez and William Bill Mitchell. Did they all appear to be injured? Yes. And did you meet with those people um, after the parade? Did you talk to them or meet with them? Yeah, so I, my attention was really drawn towards uh, those three that were kind of right there. Father Pat was, uh, he was kind of completely knocked out and then he kind of came to and he was kind of put on the side of the road. And then I more or less stayed by Maria Perez on the side. She was in agonizing pain. There were some other people that came. And William Mitchell was also there, also with severe injuries and major pain. So I more or less stayed there. And then Father Pat and I, we, uh, uh, being priests, we live in the same, we call it the rectory or the house. So when he went into the hospital, I, I joined him to go. And then so my next immediate experience was uh, going to the hospital and then encountering more of the people that were in our group who were already at the hospital. 
So the three people you had direct contact with would have been uh, Maria Perez, William Mitchell, or Bill Mitchell, and Father Heppy. That's correct. Um, I believe that's what his testimony just was. It, correct. It's overruled. And you went to which hospital? So Father Pat was taken by a squad to Waukesha Memorial, so I, I joined them in going to that, that hospital. Did you see any of the people that you had observed on that list on Exhibit 15 at Waukesha Memorial Hospital? Yes, I did. What observations did you make there of the people you saw? Yep, so immediately I saw um, Eileen Perales, who was uh, sitting off to the side with some facial issues and, and uh, some other injuries. So uh, Father Pat was kind of, he was placed in a room and I kind of was helping Eileen a little bit. And then there was also Peggy Pachulis was also in the waiting room already when I got there. Did she have any observable injuries? She had, uh, I think her ankle was, was splinted already. She was waiting. And then uh, um, shortly after that, then uh, Benjamin and Elliot Hallmark were also in the kind of the general waiting room. And I ended up also seeing them. And then my, my next experience would be is uh, with the different situations and families, it became apparent that unfortunately some families were were split apart and in different injuries. And so um, I was with the uh, kind of there was CAT scans that needed to be done on some of the children. So there were kind of four beds. And I was uh, especially with that, you know, Benjamin and Elliot Hallmark, their parents were out. And then it also turned out that Eileen and Ashley Perales also then were kind of waiting CAT scans. So that would have been my next kind of encounter. What injuries did you observe on those individuals? So at, at the time, I mean, Ashley had uh, kind of some, as you call it, facial lacerations and major injuries there. And I think you already testified about Eileen. Um, how about Elliot and Benjamin Hallmark? Yeah, so uh, they were both in, uh, at the time they were getting checked out for brain situations. Uh, was clear Benjamin had a kind of a major fracture uh, in his leg and also a major kind of you know, golf ball kind of coming out of his, by his eyes. And uh, Elliot also then had uh, some injuries. And I'm just going to go through the remainder. And if you saw them or um, either that night or in the following days, um, let me know and if you, okay. just, if you know that they were injured. Uh, Maria Alvarez Dominguez. Objection. Uh, it's hearsay. It's, just, uh, it's not hearsay. It's asking about his knowledge, not what he heard. It's the so injuries. you may answer the question. Hearsay. Maria was injured. I don't know the full scope of her injuries. Okay. And how about Gregorio Romelia Perez? She was uh, very, very, very severely injured. Uh, major, major issues. She, you, could you observe what those injuries were? Objection. Uh, uh, hearsay. Overall, you may answer. Uh, pelvis fractures, and uh, she was in uh, rehab for about four months with a uh, uh, still walking with a cane. She still is walking with a cane. That's correct. Lori Logan. Lori uh, sustained some major heart issues, so she had a major procedure on her heart. Marisol Lopez Gutierrez? I don't know the full extent. Marisol was, uh, was impacted. She suffered, a, I believe, a fracture, wrist fracture, um, some other uh, major soreness. She's, she's healing. Adair Lopez Gutierrez? Adair was, uh, the car ran over him. Uh, he didn't suffer any major physical injuries, but was impacted. Juan Marquez? Juan uh, suffered a major leg fracture, has had a couple surgeries. David Marquez? Uh, David was, was struck, took on some bruising, but no major, major injuries. Jason Peckloff? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Jason has suffered suffered a severe concussion and uh, some ankle injuries. An, an ankle injury. Yamalat Perales Alvarez. Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. 
Go ahead and answer. Yeah, well, that was, uh, we very came very close to losing her major, major head trauma. Um, was severely, severely hurt. <coughs> Jose Perales Alvarez. Objection hearsay. Mm -hmm. Jose also was very severely hurt with leg injuries. He's had uh, about 10 surgeries at this point. Still and, walking with a crutch. And Camila Perez Gonzalez. Objection hearsay. Overruled. Camila had a, an orthopedic injury. Uh, she's had a number of, a couple surgeries. Any cross-exam questions for this witness, sir? I do. Please proceed. You see. I don't have too many questions for you, Father. Uh, do you... Do you recall when you knew for sure that you would be testifying in this matter? I, I got an official word on October 1st to plan to be here, I believe, on uh, last Wednesday. And to the best of your knowledge, do you have any reason why you would be testifying on behalf of an injured party if you are not an injured party? Objective. Mr. Bell. Grounds. Um, overall, to my answer, maybe no. My, my thought would be that as the pastor, I would have a more wide ranging kind of knowledge of, of different people's situations as a pastor, or some people might, you know, that, that's what I would assume. But. Um, you testified to observing uh, a, a, quite a few injuries. How can you assess the injuries just by looking at the people? Can, can you clarify what you mean by that? Like, what, what are you getting at? For, for example, um, if I would, if, if, I was to see someone injured laying on the ground. I could essentially say, oh, it looks like this. Mm -hmm. But how, how can I be certain that that's what it is? So my question is, being that you observed a lot of injuries, how are you able to assess what they were just by looking? Well, the question mischaracterizes his testimony, so I'm going to ask that you rephrase. How did you know the injuries just by looking? It still mischaracterizes his testimony. That's not what he said. He, he was asked about whether he was aware. Yeah, the, that he observed injuries. So how, how could he know? He observed some, so you need to be specific as what point in time. The injuries that you saw at the hospital. How were you able to say for sure what those injuries were just by observation? Yeah, so some of it is seeing people at the hospital, and then part of it then is, you know, so there's the immediate seeing people in the hospital, and then there's the later times of seeing people in the hospital or seeing people um, in other contexts. So would it be fair to say that you were told those injuries either by medical professionals or by the people? It, it, I'm, exactly. So if people would, would say, this is my injury, uh, I would believe them if they'd be in the hospital, if I see people with crutches, wheelchairs, you know, then, then I would say that's probably accurate. But you didn't know for sure yourself until you were told. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not the one diagnosing an injury. I can observe what they say, I can observe what I see, and then 
You know, I see people with uh, yeah. crutches, that, wheelchairs. That's and I'm like, getting there's at. probably yeah. truth there. Do you know, because uh, you testified to seeing those, uh, some of those people after the, uh, the incident, would that be fair to say? Yes. Do you know if any of the people you saw after the incident filed any claims in the matter? Could you clarify by what you mean by claims? Um, did, did they file for uh, um, to be an injured party in the matter, or did they file for any uh, any, uh, any uh, medical bill support or anything of that nature? <coughs> do you, to your knowledge, do you recall any of that? We we certainly told as many people as possible to get involved in the Waukesha parade support and other means of, of help. I, I'm not, I can't speak specifically for each person what they did or did not do. Uh, can you explain to the jury what, what you mean by uh, the support that you are referring to? Was, is that, was that like a group formed or was that sort of like an event of a GoFundMe account or, or something like that? Can you give some clar clarity on that? Yeah, there was the, the Waukesha Parade Fund that was, I think, an international type of thing. There was, uh, you know, our parish had a fund. There were GoFundMes. There were any number of different, different things. There were different encounters to allow people to come together and talk about what had happened and, and seek started healing from the emotional part of it and and by international that would be assuming worldwide that'd be fair to say yes so it would be fair to say that there were uh, financial interests attached to this incident objection is how Grounds. it relates to this witness's testimony Grounds. sustained I should try to answer that, the, the question. No, I sustained it. You don't have to okay. answer that. Right. You can rephrase, but as it relates to how it was asked in this witness, I'm sustaining it. Well, it was actually because he referred to some GoFundMe's being set up and anything. So my question was, um, being that the, it was a wide ranging scope by, by him saying international. What's your question? I sustained the objection. Was, was there a, uh, any financial interests attached to this incident? Ken, I'm going to object to the same reasons before. Grounds. It's vague, unclear, overly broad, sustained as to the form of a question. Any idea how, uh, how much Money was raised for the, uh, I guess I would say, GoFundMe's groups support. Objection as it relates to this witness. Grounds. <coughs> well, I'll allow it a little bit of leeway as it potentially could relate. To bias, not of this witness, he made no claim, but go ahead. If he knows, subject to you following it up with other, I guess, witnesses later on. I know, uh, so the Catholic community of Waukesha had uh, an opportunity because people wanted to give, and so there, there were $73,000 that came into the fund that I'm aware of, the Catholic community of Waukesha that we dispersed uh, in different ways. There's still, I think, 3,000 left. That's for kind of community healing events. What the, the end of the, what GoFundMe's reached, what the Waukesha Foundation Fund reached, I, I don't know. But I know the Catholic community of Waukesha was 73,000, yeah, specific. I couldn't say 73 what, but 73,000, I think. And, and did that go straight towards the, the, the victims to, help them in any way? So an example would be, you know, there are many people that uh, could no, they could not work because of uh, being hurt. 
or they had situations where a loved one was severely hurt and they had to be at home uh, or going to the hospitals, nursing homes, and taking care of them. So there was, uh, uh, and I, I have no idea the ins and outs of uh, you know, payment of hospital bills and things like that, but I, I know people were, you know, they could not go to work because of, of some of these scenarios. And you stated you didn't see the vehicle approaching at the time when it got to where you were. You were. Would that be fair to say? That's correct. It was very close to me when I saw it. About how close to you did the vehicle come? The, the vehicle was on my left side. I saw it probably, you know, very close to when it was on me, I would say, to my left. So you were, you were on the right side of the street at that point? It was on the, point? The, right the right side of the road. So it would be fair to say it was on the opposite side of the road from you? It was on my left. Where on the left? In, in, you know, if you show me a picture of the road, like point to where it was on my left. I could not say that it was on my left. Did it come pretty close to you in, in, at any time when it was passing you? The car did not hit me. It was on my, my left. Uh, you referred to it as a car, as you just said. Was it a car? Was it an SUV? What, what was the vehicle? I would describe it as an SUV to be specific. Any reason why you would say car? Objection argument. Grounds? Overruled. He may answer. For me, people that know me, I'm not a, a car person, so car is a wide-ranging uh, descriptor to me. Would well, it be fair to say you wouldn't call a bus a car, though, right? Objection argumentative. That's argumentative, sustained. You don't need to answer that one. When, when asked uh, earlier, when you were asked about um, if you saw anyone else on the ground or something to that effect, you said as time went on, you, you had observed someone else laying on the ground. Can you explain what you mean by as time went on? Was that a significant time that, that passed or a very short time that passed at that point? Do you recall? My testimony is I, there were three people that were right in front of me and I really spent time Father Pat then was taken to the side as he waited for a squad to come. I really stayed with, with Maria because uh, there weren't a lot of people around there first, so I really kind of focused on staying with her. From looking up and waiting, you know, there'd be officers or, you know, different medical personnel, whether there were, I can't say, you know, what type of personnel there were, people would come and check and, and kind of evaluate. But I could see other kind of pockets of people. Uh, did you observe the other pockets of people that weren't with your group being struck at any at any point in time? The only experience that, that I saw was was our particular group. At the time of the incident, I had no idea what had taken place behind us. And would it be fair to say you had no idea what had taken place in front of your group? I, as I stated, I. I only saw what I saw. At any time when the vehicle was passing you, were you uh, able to see into the vehicle? The vehicle was going very fast. So I, I, I would not have had a picture of who was driving the vehicle. But you can't estimate a good speed that the vehicle may have been traveling? My estimation was the, the, the vehicle was traveling faster than I would usually see a, a car traveling down Main Street. So over 25 miles an hour. So would that be uh, that you would, you said traveling faster than 
you would see a, a car traveling down Main Street. Would that be in terms of if there was a parade actively going on or even without any traffic on Main Street? If I was at Main Street right now watching cars go past, you know, if I was just on the sidewalk, I would say that the car and the parade was traveling faster than those cars would be traveling. I'm saying in terms of even if there was no parade, if it was just a regular, just a normal, just a normal day. That, that's what I'm saying. On a normal day, the car was traveling, in my estimation, faster than you would see a car traveling on a normal day. And you, you weren't able to get any description of the driver of the vehicle? Not at all, no. Could you at any point tell if there was uh, more than one person in the vehicle? I would not have been able to, no. interviewed by any law enforcement at that time? I was at the, the hospital, as I indicated before that night, and there was a, a law enforcement personnel, person that kind of ducked into one of the rooms and asked the, you know, a couple questions what I would have seen or... So, so very brief, not, not extensive, uh, long extensive type interview, but very brief, just a few questions? In the hospital that evening, yes, there was a law enforcement that was a brief interview. Did you give any, uh, or were you interviewed by any law enforcement uh, after that night? I was, I was not interviewed until getting a subpoena about uh, this particular case. Um, do you recall when you received that subpoena? I can't say a specific date. I can say it, you know, after that first one, October 1st was when I got the official, you know, to report, to testify to the case. I, I can't remember what, what date it was uh, before that. Were you in, in contact with any law enforcement about this incident leading up to the October 1st uh, subpoena that you received? Not before I talked to the, the DA that, uh, that, that first time. And do you recall what DA that was? Uh, it was Su Susan and... Excuse me. Uh, Susan. Uh, made a record reflect that there was a right hand gesture towards the prosecution table. I believe the... Witness identified our district attorney, Susan Opper, as the Susan. The record can reflect that. And was that uh, October 1st time the only conversation you had with attorney Opper? October 1st was I, when I received the notification that I was to, to report to court. I uh, spoke with uh, attorney uh, Susan, you know, sometime in the, the month before we spoke once. But at the, uh, in the month before the October 1st subpoena? <clears throat> so, so October 1st is when I formally got the subpoena that I was to come in. It would have been sometime in September where I was, you know, notified to come in and talk to the DA. So I talked to the DA once. And at that time in September, you weren't yet subpoenaed. I, I was, how do I say this? Uh, 
this would be a point of clarification in the sense of I, I believe that I was subpoenaed to come in and talk to the, the DA. I, I'm not sure if that's a subpoena or that's you know what the correct wording is. Um, I was you know told to, to come in and and talk to the district. I'm not sure if that's a subpoena, but I, I believe it would be more than come in if you want to. I, I believe it was kind of like you need to come in, not if you want, you can. If not, don't. I'm not sure what the, the terminology for that is, but that's how I would take it. If that's a subpoena. Um, no, that's, that's not a subpoena. The subpoena is when you actually get the subpoena paperwork by mail or I, I don't. Mr. Brooks, you need to ask a question. Um, can I get to it, Your Honor? No, because you're trying to define something which would be testifying, which you cannot do at this time. So just, the jury will disregard his last comment. But go ahead and ask a question of this witness. You is something else. Wow. Mr. Brooks, that was inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions yes, for this witness? Yes, Please I ask do. them. During your um, conversations with Attorney Opper uh, in September and October 1st, when you, you received the subpoena, at, at that time, were you uh, provided the complaint in this issue? What, what do you mean by complaint? The complaint would be a reference to uh, the charges in this matter. Paperwork that would state the charges. Objection made. Grounds. Oh, or else he may answer if, he, if he's able. You mean to me, seeing what happened and seeing everyone that was hurt? No. To me, it was very obvious what, what this was about. Did you see? at any time, any paperwork, paperwork related to the charges in this incident. So there have been the, you know, the subpoena sheet that would have had, uh, you know, your name and you know, a number of different. What do you mean my name? What, what are you referring to? I believe it would have said Daryl Brooks on it. Um, are you aware that I don't identify by that name? Sustained. Sorry. So is that what your subpoena said? Was that the language of your subpoena? The logistics? We've been down this road under 906.11, Mr. Brooks. You're not, I, I need you to ask a relevant question to this witness. That was relevant. He said what was on his no, subpoena. No, we've you've talked at length about the subpoena. So under nine oh six eleven, move on to a new topic, please. Are you aware of who the plaintiff is in this matter? Objection relevance. Grounds. Overall, he may answer. I believe that, uh, that that you would be, or excuse me, you, you're the defendant. I, I would be the plaintiff. You're, excuse me, at my mind, you're the you're the defendant. I believe the plaintiff would be. If you you know, all those who were, were hurt under the title of the state of Wisconsin. That's how I would, that's how I would identify it. That's how you would identify it. So do you know of anybody who was hurt that identified as the plaintiff? Objection relevance. Grounds. I think this witness has testified he's really not sure what what the plaintiff is, he kind of guessed, he gave an assumption. Sustained. He, he did. Foundation. He did answer the question, though. Sustained. Next <coughs> question. <laughs> 
So to the best of your knowledge, the plaintiff would be the representative of the people. Objections to relevance. Sustained. Right. You're now asking him to make a legal conclusion, which I will not have him do. It's also not relevant. Do you know of any injured party who claims to be the plaintiff in this matter? Objection relevance. Grounds. Sustained. Mr. Brooks, under 90611, please move on to a new topic. Are you aware that only an injured party could be the plaintiff in this incident? Objection. Grounds. Relevance. Um, sustained also misstates the law. You don't have to answer that. Mr. Brooks, new topic or under 90611, I will close the cross-examination. How does that mischaracterize the law? An injured party right. has to um, make the plan. You haven't asked a question. I will give you one more opportunity. Don't question me. Please ask a question of this witness. The jury will disregard his statement as it mischaracterizes the law, and he is not testifying. He's asking questions at this time. Are you aware that the state of Wisconsin is an entity and cannot claim to be an injured party in this matter? Objection. Grounds. All right, sustained. All right. Uh, the, your cross-exam is now closed under 906.11. Um, does the state have any redirect for this Briefly. Witness? Go ahead. Sir, prior to the red SUV coming through your group, did you ever hear of horn honking? Objection. Overruled. Uh, you may answer, objection. sir. Objection. Hearsay. It's not hearsay. I, I personally hearsay. didn't, but. That's fine. Now I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 15 again and ask that that be published to the jury. This has already been admitted into evidence. Go ahead. Objection. What was the, what was the answer to the last question? The record speaks for itself. Next, the witness can answer the annotations. <clears throat> And again, you previously identified the individuals um, in the Catholic communities of Waukesha box. In looking at that box again, were all those people on the road as part of the Catholic communities of Waukesha when the red SUV went through? Objection, leading the witness. Overruled. You may answer, sir. Definitely, 100%. And we can take that exhibit off the screen. One final question. When you spoke with District Attorney Susan Opper in your meeting that you testified to, did she ever tell you what to say today? Objection. Hearsay. Um, overruled. You questioned his credibility. You questioned his talking to the state. He may answer the question. The only reason why I'm objecting, Your Honor, is because your objection is noted. Attorney it's, Opper is not asking the question, so how would Attorney Basie know what Mr. Attorney Brooks, Opper said? I'm not going to explain the legal procedures. Go ahead, ask the question. You may answer when she does. Do you recall the question? Yeah, yeah I do. She, she did not. Okay. No. Did she tell you to tell the truth today? Objection. Relevancy. Oh, sustain this to the form of the question. <laughs> Everything that you've testified today, is it truthful? Objection. Hearsay. Well, overruled. You may answer. Yes. Nothing further. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You may step down. I would like to get through one more witness, but I want to take a short comfort break. Uh, for everyone, so I'll rise for the jury. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Brooks, not now. Not allowed to. Not hear. now. The jury is in this courtroom, and you will show respect for them and for this court. 
Respect for them will Mr. be Brooks, telling them the truth. Stop. I'm putting you on notice that you are on the verge of this court creating a curative instruction about your frivolous arguments. I will not have you claim legitimacy for what are debunked, frivolous, sovereign arguments. Then that is why it. your questions prove are being prove objected that is to prove that is frivolous. Prove it. All the cases that we've already referenced, sir, we are in recess. We'll be back and in prove five it. minutes. Thank you, everyone. I don't agree to an estoppel. Can you prove
Attorney Opper, you just wanted to address timing. Well, and I understand. Let me say this, Judge. The ebb and flow of this trial has been very difficult to predict, not through any fault of the court, but by events. We do have two witnesses here ready to go. If the next witness goes relatively smoothly, would you consider letting us call the second one and maybe wrapping up by about 6 o'clock? Yes. Okay. Thank you. If not, he can come back tomorrow, but he's been here twice already. No, nope, we'll keep going. I prepped the jury for that yesterday, so we're good. I'm going to have the jury brought out. All right. Well, bring the jury in, Madam Clerk. And I object to that. To the timing? Yes. Um, your objections noted. We're going to make up for lost time from yesterday. So can we adjust the subject matter jurisdiction? No, we cannot. Talk about that. We're not going to address that either. That's still not going to be proven, right? It was frivolous, stuff. That's going to that's gonna get pressed every time. So. I have yet to prove subject matter jurisdiction, any jurisdiction at all, right? The jury will disregard the comments being made by Mr. Brooks at this time. They are a mischaracterization of the law. Absolutely not. They are absolutely not. They are. All right, thank you, everyone. Please be seated. The state may call its next witness. The state would call Lucas Hallmark. All right, Mr. Hallmark, if you would please make your way to the witness stand, which is on my right up one riser. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, who's on my left, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you that? I do. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. First thing I will have you do is to state your first and last names for the record and then spell each. Lucas Hallmark, L-U-K-A-S-H-A-L-L-M-A-R-K. Oh, hold on a second. It would really help if our audio's on. I'm just going to have you do that again. If you would please state your first and last names for the record. Lucas, and then spell, sorry. Lucas Hallmark, L-U-K-A-S-H-A-L-L-M-A-R-K. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Sir, how are you employed? City of Waukesha Police Department. What's your position? I'm a detective. How long have you been with the City of Waukesha Police Department? Uh, for approximately 15 years. Has that been the entire time you've been in law enforcement? Yes, ma'am. Direct your attention to November 21st of 2021. Were you at the City of Waukesha Christmas Parade? I was. Were you there in um, as a law enforcement officer, a spectator, or a participant? I was there as a participant. And what group were you with? I was with the Catholic Communities of Waukesha. Who were you there with? I mean, other than the Catholic Communities, were you with your family? I was. And generally, I don't need names, but um, was your wife present? My wife and uh, my four kids at the time, yes. Okay. And what are the ages of your kids? At that time, they were uh, three, five, seven, and nine. And approximately how many people were walking with the Catholic communities of Waukesha? I believe there was about uh, 45 or 46 individuals that were walking with us. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a photograph um, and just ask you if you recognize it. It's Exhibit 121. Um, as a reminder, the monitors in the jury box have about a 20 second delay so we need to be mindful of that as we show exhibits to them they do come on the screen i think a little bit more quickly but there's rapid succession previously so and i'd ask that also be published to the jury at this time this exhibit has previously been admitted in evidence. permission granted and when is it the jury let me know when that exhibit comes up on the monitors in front of you Sir, um, do you know where this picture was taken? 
Yes, that was taken at Main Street and I believe East Avenue. Was it what day was it taken? That was taken on November 21st, 2021. And there are um, boxes with names that are associated with people through a red arrow. Do you see that? Yes. Um, overruled, he may answer. Was that a yes? Yes. Okay. And as you review those names and the people that those names are associated with, um, is that is that exhibit accurate? Objection leading the witness. Um, sustain us to the form of the question. Sir, do you know the people whose names appear on exhibit 121? Objection leading the witness. Overruled, you may answer. Yes. And the arrows, do you see arrows on that exhibit? Yes. And they're um, going from a person to a name. Do you see that? Objection leading the witness. Um, overruled, the exhibit's previously been received. Uh, he may answer. Yes. To clarify, Jason Peckloff, do you see him in this picture? <coughs> I do. Can you pour, um, there's a touch screen in front of you if you can just circle where he's at in this picture. Okay. How about Camilla uh, Perez Gonzalez? If you can circle her. Maria Alvarez Dominguez? Uh, Dair Lopez Revelar? Jose Perales Alvarez? And if we can clear the screen, and then Juan Marquez. Thank you. We can clear the screen. Are you done with this exhibit? I am. Okay, go ahead. <coughs> Did you know the names of most, if not all, of the participants who were marching with the Catholic communities of Waukesha that day? Most of them, yes. At some point, did you hear some type of commotion behind you? I did. Can you describe to the jury what you heard? Uh, we were um, we were walking west westbound on Main Street, and near the area of about 400 to 409 uh, West Main Street. My attention was directed towards large amounts of screaming coming from behind us, so to our, to our east. Um, at that point, I looked over my, uh, my left shoulder. At that point, there was still some folks from our, from our group that were behind us, so it wasn't clear, but over the tops of them, I could see uh, like a roof of a, a red vehicle traveling also to the east coming towards us. I'm sorry, to the west coming towards us. What were your initial thoughts? Objection, hearsay. Overruled, you may answer. My initial, my initial thought that came into my mind at that time when the screaming occurred was that there was probably a lost motorist and there was a vehicle traveling in the parade that shouldn't have been there. Have you ever worked a Christmas parade in Waukesha? I have. Relevancy. Overruled. He may answer. You said you have? I've, I don't recall specifically the Christmas parade, but I've worked other events in downtown Waukesha. Okay. Um, have you ever worked a Fourth of July parade? Objection. Relevancy to this incident. Let me strike the question. Okay, go ahead. Have you ever worked a parade in the city of Waukesha? Um, I don't recall specific parade, but I've worked um, Friday Night Live which is an event where they usually close down the, the downtown area for vehicle traffic and it's pedestrians only. So that was where I was drawing my, my recollection to that incident. Are there some times when there are barricades set up and a vehicle will come into the area that they're not supposed to come in? That does occur, yes. What would law enforcement do in that case? Usually stop the vehicle and direct them to either stop or remove them when it's safe to do so. Have you ever been present where the vehicle doesn't stop? Objection, hearsay. Overruled, you may answer. No. When you said that you heard screaming, could you describe for the jury what you mean? Because we're at a parade, so I'm assuming that there's some screaming. Objection, leading the witness. Um, 
It sustains to the form of the question. Can you describe for the jury if the screaming stood out to you? Yes, it was. Lead the witness. Overruled. You may answer. Yes, it was something different than was actually occurring at the parade. In just to give you a perspective, at this point, we were actually almost done marching in the parade, which was actually a very big relief to me because I didn't want to be in the parade in the first place. <laughs> so I was actually very relieved at that point. So um, yes, at that point, this had caused some sort of commotion that was not particularly used to that we've already incurred through the entire parade. And did you notice anything different about your surroundings as you heard the screaming? Objection. That's the form of that question and it was answered. Um, overruled, he may answer. Can you just repeat the question, please? Sure. Do you notice anything other than the screaming that seemed unusual when that happened? Objection, different question. Um, overruled, I'm not sure what the objection is, but you may answer. Clear with the objection. Um, so after my, after my initial thought of that, that vehicle was just a lost motorist or they didn't know what, actually what was going on, um, my that that thought faded very quickly and I realized that something was drastically wrong based on the fact that that vehicle was traveling at a significant rate of speed um, towards our direction when you first saw the vehicle or the top of the red vehicle mm -hmm. approximately how far was it away from you um, when I first looked back and saw it I would estimate it to be about um, I would say approximately 200 feet. Um, my recollection is that it was near uh, Curry Insurance. Okay. You testified already as to where your position was at that time, correct? Yes. Where were you in relationship to the group that you were walking with? Where were you in within that group? Sure. So our, our group, um, we were just kind of walking together behind a white banner. There was no set, uh, I guess, method of us walking. Um, we. Actually, as we were continued down the prey route, we, some of us moved forward, some of us moved back, depending on how the kids were doing. Um, but at that particular time, I was near towards the, the back, so um, I would say the middle of the back of the group, and more towards the center of the road. And which shoulder did you look back over when you heard the screaming? <clears throat> I turned to my left. Okay. And that's when the vehicle was approximately 200 feet away? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Yes. What did you see next? Um, the vehicle uh, came, I recall the vehicle coming right at to where we were walking. Um, it started hitting folks in our, in our group and the only thing that I could remember doing was um, I had my, my three-year-old on my left hand and I had my nine-year-old on my right hand. As we were walking down the parade route, my, uh, um, my, my seven-year-old was kind of walking in front of us um, at the time and I remember realizing that we were going to get hit and it was going to come very quickly. And so I grabbed my three-year-old as hard as I could and I threw him towards the curb. At the same time, I tried to grab um, Benjamin at that point and throw him with with my three-year-old. Oh, Benjamin, is he the seven-year-old? Yes. And he was in front of you, you testified? Objection, Correct. leading the witness. Um, <coughs> overruled, the answer may stand. T to the best of my memory, yes. Yes, okay. And you stated that you had your nine-year-old in your um, on your right side. Who, what's the name of your nine-year-old? Objection, brother Missy. Overruled. I'm sorry, what was the name? Elliot. Thank Elliot you. Mark. <coughs> when you saw the vehicle and as it was coming towards you, could you estimate the speed that the vehicle was traveling? Objection, hearsay. <coughs> Overruled, you may answer. I estimated the vehicle traveling about 30 to 40 miles an hour. What is the speed limit in that area of Main Street? 25 miles per hour. So you threw your three-year-old to your left, you sedated? Towards the curb, which would have been um, to the south. Okay. And how about Elliot? I, I, don't, I don't remember um, at that point what happened with Elliot. I, um, 
as the vehicle passed us, um, I don't know if he got ripped out of my arms when the vehicle came through. Um, I just remember that I kind of got, as I turned to my left, I pivoted on my, my left foot. I got clipped on my left foot and um, the vehicle passed us, but I, I don't recall what happened with Elliot. How about Ben? Um, ben, uh, I, I saw him stumble and kind of roll from where the vehicle came towards the curb to the south. Now, when you said you got clipped, what clipped you? Uh, Injection. Overruled. It, it had to have been the vehicle. Um, I had an abrasion on my left heel, and then I had a, white sneakers on that night, and they had black marks along where I had my abrasion on that same, that same part. What was that consistent with, those black marks? I would guess the, the vehicle tire. Where was your wife? Um, I, she was standing a little bit um, behind and then to the left of us, so she would have been a little further um, at that point, a little bit further to the east and then to the south. Now, in terms of the path that the vehicle was traveling prior to it striking your group, um, can you describe that for the jury in terms of was it on the north side of the road or the south side? Or to explain it to someone like me, mm -hmm. if you're traveling down the parade route, was it on your left or on your right? Objection, leading the witness. Overrule. Um, as it was coming towards us, as I was walking initially, we were kind of in the center of the road. So when I saw the vehicle coming, I kind of moved to the left and threw my, my kids to the, to the left. So we were kind of left of the center line, so to the left, um, as you described, and towards the south. Um, but the vehicle had passed me on my right. And did you, did you say that you observed anyone get hit that was behind you? I don't read the witness. Overruled. I don't recall seeing anyone um, specifically getting hit. I do remember hearing sounds of, of the vehicle striking objects. And then the only objects in the road were people at the time. What happened next, or what do you remember next? I remember turning to my wife and, and asking her um, if all the children were okay. And uh, she looked back at me and said that she didn't know where our son Elliot was. Um, at that point, I, didn't, I couldn't see him either. Um, so I began running up and down Main Street trying to locate where he was. Did you have eyes on your three other children? I did. And what did you do with those three kids? Um, I had those um, children stay with my wife while I went and tried to find Elliot. Did you find Elliot? It was some time after, um, I would estimate it to be a minute to two minutes after the vehicle had passed, but I had located him on the road further to the south, almost towards, immediately to where the curb was, um, being, being tended to by some individuals that had covered him up with a blanket. While you're looking for Elliot, did you see anyone else on the, on the ground? I did. Can you describe for the jury what you observed? Uh, there was there was a lot of individuals laying on the, the road as you look back and um, I remember specifically seeing uh, Father Pat Happy laying on the ground. I remember he was at that point when I had saw him I, I thought he was deceased because he wasn't moving at all so I, I would assume that he was knocked unconscious. I continued past and then I remember specifically seeing um, a younger female who I recall to be as Yamalet um, Paralis laying in the roadway and two I, I thought she was also deceased because she, um, there was blood coming from like her ears and um, she wasn't moving either. Did you see anyone else before before you found your son Elliot? There was other people but I don't specifically re re recalling at that particular time no. Okay. Once you found Elliot what observations did you make of him? Um, at this point, he was awake. The person who was tending to him indicated that he was knocked unconscious. Um, so when I had found him, he actually regained consciousness, but he was crying and, and um, complaining of uh, injuries to his back and to his hip and to his leg. What did you do then? Um, pretty much just, I was, I was told by the individuals that were caring for him that, um, that we needed to 
and keep them there for um, safety purposes for like uh, C-spine, making sure they didn't have any significant neck injuries or back injuries and that we needed to wait there until paramedics arrived. They eventually come and assess Elliot? Uh, yes, during this time I had spoken with my wife and the, the decision was made that she was gonna go get the car because it was at this point, it was chaos in downtown Waukesha and, um, I would actually made contact with a couple of different officers that I knew um, from the police department and uh, one of the comments was, was we didn't know how we were going to get a lot of these injured folks from the street to the hospital that needed care. So the decision was made that I was going to send my wife to go um, get the vehicle so she can remove our th um, three kids that were mobile and remove them from the scene. Um, at that time I didn't know the extent of the injuries to Benjamin. Okay. And that's what I was just going to ask you about. Were there any observable injuries to Benjamin at the time um, following, immediately following <coughs> the car going through the, the group? Injection, the new witness. Overruled, you may answer. I knew that he had been injured because when I looked over um, to where he was over on the curb, I had seen that he had some facial um, injuries, um, swollen eyes, some lacerations, but he was, um, he was calm and he was collected, so at that point, I didn't know that there was any other injuries to him. After the paramedics had put uh, Elliot on a, a removable stretcher, I indicated that Benjamin was hurt and I needed to go bring him with us when we went to the hospital. After I went over to him to pick him up, I had looked down and I had realized that he had a, an open fracture to his left leg. So what did you do? Um, I picked him up and then we, uh, we, we ran with the paramedics down to, um, they called it the collection, casualty collection point or the point where all the ambulances were um, caring for, for individual folks. And did you ride in the ambulance with Elliot and Ben or did they go separately? We went together. Okay. Where did you go? I went to Waukesha Memorial Hospital. <laughs> and what happened once you were at Waukesha Memorial Hospital? What, what did you see? In general? Yeah, I mean, as working in the city, we go to Walk from the Hospital quite a bit, and I have never seen anything like this in my entire life. It was, um, it was pretty much chaos. Uh, when we first got to the hospital, there was um, some sort of physician or uh, EMT that was actually triaging individuals with, uh, I believe it was permanent marker, and they were triaging individuals on their forehead of what level of injury they needed. And based on that, it's kind of directed work to the had gone inside the hospital. So when we had gone into the, the hospital, we were directed into the, the waiting room. And at that point, we were still on um, kind of like stretchers or, or backboards. We were placed in the waiting room and we were just waiting until um, we could be attended to by some of the staff. And did both Benjamin and Elliot receive treatment at Waukesha Memorial Hospital? Yes. What treatment did they receive, if you know? Um, Elliot um, received treatment for um, a severe concussion. Um, he had a severe ankle sprain. Um, they did a CT scan. Um, and then with Benjamin, um, he ended up spending the night because uh, the same, same thing, uh, concussion, um, they did a CT scan, but then he also had surgery on his uh, broken leg that night. Now you say, stated initially when the car was coming towards the back of your group, you thought it may have been someone that just accidentally got in the, the, the Christmas parade route, correct? Objection. That, that was not the form of question or answer, rather. Um, asked and answered, sustained. So after having your initial thought, did your thought change at some point that this isn't a misguided vehicle? Yes. And what did it change to? Objection leading the witness. Overruled. After the vehicle had come through and uh, st struck our group and then as I looked back at all the carnage behind us, um, it was pretty, my thought then that we were involved in some sort of terrorist act. There, it was uh, overwhelming fear, overwhelming panic amongst everyone in the downtown Waukesha. After the vehicle went through your group, did, it, did you ever observe it stop? I did not. I'm going to show you um, on your, the screen in front of you, Exhibit 140. On 
you can have it displayed um, in front of you and let me know when it's on your screen. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to play approximately five seconds. It's a one minute and 26 second clip. I'm going to play the first five seconds and see if you recognize um, this video. Yes. Okay. We can stop it and go back to zero, zero. Does it accurately reflect what you observed on 11 November 21st, 2021? Objection yes. to the relevancy who took the video. Um, overruled. Does this video contain footage of the Washa um, Catholic community in the parade on that date? Objection. Here's Oops. that. Overruled. Give me an answer. Yes. I move. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I would move States Exhibit 140 into evidence and ask that it be published to the jury with sound. Objection. Steal your say. The objection is noted. It's overruled. Exhibit 140 is received. Permission to publish is granted. That asset starts um, playing now. Maybe, we'll see. I mean, it's actually at the Elks Club Lodge. It's like, see, it's really cool. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe. I forgot, I went, it was like a Sounds cool. Yeah, it's really. Is it on Thanksgiving? Saturday, November 20th, 2021. What? The past. Oh, yeah, it's the 20th today. Oh, right? Oh, no, it's the 21st. Ooh, so you already, it already did already. It happened yesterday. Yep, it happened already. Ah, whatever. Yeah, no, no. <coughs> Did you see a red SUV traveling westbound in that video? Yes. Would that be consistent with what you saw coming from behind you um, on November 21st prior to um, what you just described? Objection. How do we know the direction? Uh, how do we know it's westbound? Um, your objection is noted. It's overruled. The witness may answer. Yes. Thank you. So I'm going to show you some still shots from that video and just um, ask if they accurately reflect uh, what you observed. Objection to the relevancy. I have to see them. Are you going to do that electronically or hand them to the bail? Um, I'd like to do it electronically if I can. Go ahead. Um, show exhibit 135. Just to the witness. Sir, do you identify that as a still shot taken from the exhibit 140? I, I recognize the, the photo you're seeing is from the, the video? Yes. Yes. Okay. And there are, um, do you see arrows? Um, what does this photo reflect to you, sir? Objection, leading the witness. Overruled. Uh, this photo represents uh, individuals from our group in the parade uh, walking in front of, I, I believe, uh, Magellan's, I think. Any other names on this diagram? Yes. And um, do they appear to be associated with people within this group? Objection hearsay. Overall. Yes. How is that depicted? <coughs> Objection leading the witness. Overall. Uh, the names are depicted by red arrows pointing to the individuals. And do they accurately reflect the names of the individuals that they're pointing, their, that the arrows are connected to? Objection, lead the witness. Overruled. Yes. Okay, I'm going to ask that Exhibit 135 be admitted and published to the jury. Objection to the relevancy. 
Uh, overruled Exhibit 135 is received. Permission to publish is granted. Keep in mind it takes a little bit for the jury to see it, at least on the monitors in the jury box. It appears that the jury now can see it in front of them. Um, so with regard to this one, if you can just circle Jose Perales Alvarez. Objection of being the witness. Overruled. Juan Marquez, if you see him. Marisol Lopez Gutierrez. Gregorio Romelia Perez. And Maria Perez. Well, when I circled Gregoria, I believe I, I kind of got rid of uh, okay. Maria there. But is Maria's, that helpful? Yeah, Maria's right next to Gregoria. Okay, thank you. This um, can be taken off. Next, I'm going to do the exact same thing with a couple more pictures. The next one would be um, Exhibit 136. I'll have it shown in front of you. Let me know when it's on your screen. I see it. Okay. If you can describe for the jury what you're seeing in Exhibit 130, excuse me, 136. Um, something very similar to the last exhibit. I'm sorry. Is there an objection? Leading the witness. That's not leading. It's overruled. You may answer. It's a photograph. Appears to be a still fo uh, photo from a, a video, similar to the last with um, names with uh, arrows corresponding to those individuals. And um, do they, do the arrows corresponding to the individuals and the names, are they accurate? The, in my screen, there's a, like a. Yeah, there's a box that appears to be from there the go. user. That need, there you go. Okay. It needs to be removed. Yes, it's accurate. Okay. And do you see yourself in this um, photograph? I do. Okay. Um, I would ask that this. 136 be admitted and published to the jury. Exhibit 136 is received. Permission to publish is granted. Objection. Why, uh, where's his name if he's in the video? Um, that's not an objection. That's a question. You can certainly ask that during cross-examination, but it's just, I'm sustaining it. Go ahead and ask your next question. I guess I'm waiting for it to be published. I will do that. Okay. And then a confirmation from the jury that they can see it. Um, sir, first of all, do you see yourself in this photograph? Yes. Can you circle where you're at? Objection. Why well, is no name on it? Overruled. What's the relevancy of it? Overruled. You may answer. You may. Answer the question. <coughs> That's right. Thank you. And again, the, the names you've testified are associated with the appropriate people, is that correct? Yes. Can you circle Lori Loken? Maria Alvarez Dominguez. Ashley Perales Alvarez. Margaret Pachulis. Eileen Perales Alvarez, Yamalet Perales Alvarez, and I think you can you, uh, possibly see her her legs. Yeah, she's wearing she's wearing gray pants. I'm sorry, green green kind of leggings, um, but you can't necessarily see her um, face in this photo. So, but her green pants are right there. Okay, Camila per Perez Gonzalez. and Benjamin Hallmark. Thank you, you can clear the screen. Next I'll go to 137. And again, when we're looking at these photos, these are all from the same video, is that, are they from the same video? Uh, it, it appears so. Okay, and approximately what location are these taken in relationship to um, 
where your group was physically impacted by the car. Objection, hearsay. Overruled, you may answer. Uh, this was probably a, about a block prior to us being struck. I think this is right around the 300 block of West Main Street, kind of uh, by Donnie Boys, Magellan's um, Curry, Curry Insurance area. And would this be consistent with what you believe generally the formation would have been when your group was impacted? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you 137. I see it. And ask you the same questions. Um, does this appear to be a still shot from the video that uh, you saw in Exhibit 140? Yes. And what does it depict? Uh, it depicts um, Jason um, Petchloff, William Mitchell, and Father Pat Heppe um, walking in the parade route, pulling a banner. Okay. And are um, there are there names on that? Yes. Are they associated with the people you've just identified? Yes. Correctly. Correct. I'd ask that Exhibit 137 be admitted into evidence and published. Objection. Where's the relevancy? <coughs> Overruled. Exhibit 137 has received permission to publish as granted. Thank you. And again, if you can cir circle Jason Peckloff, William Mitchell, Father Happy. Thank you. Has that to come up for the jurors? No. Oh, sorry. We'll wait. <coughs> I apologize. That's Sandal Cruz. Oh. He'll have to redo that. It was clear before the jury got it, so go ahead and redraw your circles. Okay. okay. Um, can you identify Jason Peckloff, William Mitchell, and Father Heppy? <coughs> Thank you. You can clear the screen. And finally, 128. I believe 128 may have already been admitted into evidence. Mm -hmm. I'd ask that be published to the jury. Did they? Okay. And um, do you see the name David Marquez on the screen? Objection, leading the witness. Overruled. Yes. And um, do you see David Marquez in the picture? Yes. Can you circle him? Thank you. You can clear that exhibit. It's I would not. No. Oh, Sorry, does not have it yet. Yeah. Well, at least someone's. I'm trying. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, it now is in the view of the jury. I'd ask that it be cleared. All right. Thank you. Finally, exhibit 15, which has previously been admitted into evidence. I'd ask that it be published to the jury. Mm -hmm. And I would. Okay, so they give me a signal when it's on the screen. <laughs> Sir, have you seen this map before? Yes. And what is this a map of? This is a map of the parade route, and it also appears to um, indicate where certain groups on the parade route that were impacted during this incident. And is there um, any type of uh, delineation as to exactly where the parade route, where it started and where it went to? Objection of the witness. Overruled. I don't see any clear del delineation in regards to an arrow, but the parade started up towards um, Maine and White Rock and ends towards Maine and Wisconsin. You see a purple line on that exhibit? Yes. What does that reflect? Objection. Overruled. The, witness. the parade uh, route. Hold on, I'm sorry, what was your objection? The witness. Leading, did you say? Um, overruled, you may answer. It indicates the parade route. Sir, so directing your attention to the area where the Catholic communities of Waukesha, where there's a list of names, do you see that? Yes. And are all those people that are listed in that box were they in the roadway at the time that uh, the red SUV went through your group? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Yes. Okay, thank you. And again, it's, um, there's a line with that box that's associated with this, uh, a yellow star. What's the significance of that, if you know? Objection, leading the witness. Overruled. 
that would be the general area where we were when we were struck. Thank you. Uh, you can clear the screen, sorry. Now I'm going to go to the exhibit 160. And I'm just going to ask if this, uh, the clip is 50 seconds long. I'm going to show you approximately 20 seconds of the clip and see if you recognize it. <coughs> Do you recognize that clip? We stopped the clip, I'm sorry. We stopped it at 12 seconds. Do you recognize that clip? Yes. Does that accurately depict what occurred um, near your group, the Catholic community, um, on November 21st of last year? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Yes. yes. Thank you. I'd ask that um, Exhibit 160 is admitted and published for the jury. Objection. Exhibit 160 is received permission to publish is granted. No one's giving me a thumbs up. I just want to make sure I'm not missing something. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, if we can play this clip from zero to 50 seconds, which is the length of the clip. The four people that you saw sliding through the screen from left to right, did you recognize those people? Objection, yes. hearsay. Overruled. I'm going to show you what's been marked as 126, which is a still shot from that video. If you can, it'll pop up on your screen if you can tell me if it accurately represents <coughs> that video, that still shot from a video. That Objection, video. leading the witness. Oh, overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. And I said it be admitted into evidence and published to the jury. Exhibit 126 has received permission to publish as granted. Okay. Sir, do you, um, can you identify each of the people that are shown in this still shot? by saying their name and circling their position. Yeah. Objection leading. Overruled. This is, um, I'm going to do it by circling. That, yes. Okay. So this is Jason Petchloff um, on his back in the roadway towards, towards the, the south side of the road. This is uh, Marisol Lopez kind of in the middle of the roadway. This is Jose Perales. Um, just in front of Jason, a little further to the west, but on the south side of the roadway. And then um, Gregoria Perez, um, kind of further to the west in the roadway and then in the middle. Thank you. One last video. Sorry, I'm going to show you States Exhibit 154. Yeah, 
play the first five seconds for you and ask you if it uh, depicts on what you observed on November 21st of last year. Objection, Mr. Mr. Rutherford. Overruled. Go ahead. <coughs> Yeah, this is a video taken. It appears to be from an individual walking, but this is like the aftermath of right after the, the vehicle had come through our group. Have you seen this video clip before? I have. Were, are you able to identify many of the people in this video clip? Objection, hearsay. There's Overruled. a lot of people in here. It's not hearsay. I'd ask that, go ahead. Oh, sorry, be admitted into evidence and published to the jury. Exhibit 154 is received, permission to publish is granted. Sir, I'm gonna take you through this video and I'm going to pause it at certain places and ask you if you recognize anyone that's in the picture and describe their position. If we can start the video. If we can pause it, oh, if you can go back two seconds. There we go. It stopped at 11 seconds. Do you recognize that person on the ground? Uh, yeah, right here, that's uh, Margaret Petrullius. Okay. If we can continue on from 11 seconds and stop. Do you recognize the person depicted at 13 seconds? Objection, hearsay. Over the screen, I'm sorry. You may answer. Um, my last screenshot is up there from the last time. I don't know if you want that okay, clear. Clear that. Thank you. Um, laying on the ground right here in, in the blue, that's uh, Lori Locken. Okay. And if you can continue on at from 13 yes. seconds. If you can pause it. Did you see anyone else? I'm sorry. Just, just prior to that, um, I could see um, where my wife and the other kids were with Benjamin on the curb, kind of behind Lori. If we go back two seconds, do you think that would do it? Yeah. That, so, yep, right there. And if you can circle them. So this is this is my daughter right here, and then right behind her, in the, underneath that blanket, that's where Benjamin is. Okay. He's being attended to by some of the individuals there. If you can just say stop if you see Elliot as this goes on from 14 seconds. Uh, stop. Where's Elliot? So um, he's being attended to. He's right with this group of people right there. Okay. And you recognize that to be the position you went to um, when you found him? Objection. Hearsay. We, we can't see who that is. It's not hearsay. Overruled. Yes. And that was at 20 seconds. We can clear that. And continue on. Sorry. If we pause, do you recognize anyone in this section of the video? Yeah. Uh, so with the, the blue sneakers, um, he's lying this way. That'd be Father Pat Happy. Um, laying down right here is uh, Maria uh, Perez. And then uh, being attended to by these folks in front of the banner, that'd be William Mitchell. Okay. If we can continue on. If you see someone from your group on the ground, if you can say pause. Okay. And we're continuing on from 26 seconds. We can pause here. Do you recognize that person? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Yeah, there's there's two people. Marisol um, Lopez is right there. And then um, Adir uh, Lopez is right here with the gray jacket. And what's their relationship to one another? Uh, 
mother and child. We can continue on from 41 seconds. Sorry, is that still Mayor Sell? Objection. We can pause here. Pause. Uh, Who is that, if you know? Is, so this is still Mayor Sell. Right? Objection. Overruled. So uh, this this last yellow line I just drew, that's still Mayor Sell. Um, right here where I circled as being covered by a, a red blanket. That would be uh, Gregoria um, um, Perez. And then um, over here, that would be Jason Pe Peshloff. Okay. I'm going to stop you at 58 seconds. Sir, I'm going to direct you to exhibit 162. We're almost done. Two more exhibits. I, I, I know the video c continued. I just didn't know if you wanted. Because I apologize. That's fine. Let me go back, okay. sir. Let me redirect your attention to um, Exhibit 154, where we were, which was 58 seconds. Um, if we can publish that for the jury, since it has been admitted into evidence. And again, if you could Objection. Are we going to another exhibit? She just said 162. We're back at 154, she indicated. Is that okay? Um, do you see anyone else, or should I continue playing? I, I think you should continue playing. Okay, let's continue. Pause. So at one one thirty six, this would be uh, Jose um, Perales. Thank you, and that was at one thirty six. Okay. Thank you. you can, Did you you view this video before? Yes. And do you know? Are there any other victims depicted from Catholic communities? Yes. Okay. Then let's keep playing it from one thirty six. And we paused at two minutes and 30 seconds. Who do you identify in this clip? Uh, this would be uh, Yamalad Perales. And let's continue. 2.30, I mean. So this, this would be uh, me right here, and then Elliot's uh, lying down on the blanket. And that's at 2 minutes and 41 seconds. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I think, I think we're good. Um, now let's continue to exhibit 162. <coughs> Thank you. 
Is it in front of you? Yes. Do you recognize the um, person depicted in, actually, do you recognize this person? Yes, that's uh, uh, Aileen, or, uh, Aileen um, Perales. And is that how she appeared on November 21st of last year? Yes. Objection, hearsay. Mm -hmm. And is this a picture taken from a video from the parade? Objection, hearsay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd ask that the court admit um, Exhibit 162 into evidence and publish it to the jury. Objection, hearsay, and relevancy. Um, the objections are overruled. Uh, exhibit 152 has received permission to publish as granted. 162. 162. Um, no. Publish it. If you can clear my, my green. Thank you. If you can just let me know when you see it. Um, you stated that you could see Eileen Perales in this video, or this clip? Yes. And can you point her out specifically, her and the hat that she's wearing on her head? Yeah. Um, Eileen Perales is wearing kind of like a, a black coat, um, some sort of pink leggings, and then she's wearing um, some sort of like maroon um, colored hat with white on it, like white stripes. We can uh, save this screen capture, and this would be 162A. Objection, relevancy. Overrule. If I can then. So 162A has been captured, and we can clear it then. You can clear that, Teresa. And then I'd ask to publish Exhibit 92, which has previously been admitted into evidence. So do you see the hat that's in, um, oh, hold on. Sir, in terms of the appearance of that hat, I'm not going to ask you if it's the exact same hat that was on Eileen's head in Exhibit 162, but is the same, um, is that the same type of hat in terms of, has the same wording on it, same color, same palm color as the hat that um, Eileen was wearing in Exhibit 162? Objection, hearsay. Overrule. You may answer. It looks remarkably close, same color, same patterns of uh, the lines, the writing, and then um, with the top on it. Yes. Thank you. I have nothing else. <coughs> All right, you're cross, sir. So you saw all those videos that were shown, all exhibits rather, all 12, 13 of them. You saw all those before today? I don't recall there was tw 12 videos, um, to the best of my knowledge. 126, 15, 137, 136, 135, 140, 128, 160, 154, 162, 92. 
at least 11 or 12. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to strike your comment because you cannot testify. You did not let him answer. Let him answer first, and then you can ask follow-up. The jury will disregard the statement made by Mr. Brooks. Go ahead. I believe there was only three or four videos, but there was numerous uh, screenshots or photos taken from those videos. That's why I said exhibits. Have you seen all exhibits before today? I had seen those exhibits, yes. And do you know who took any of those exhibits, the videos or still shots? No, sir. So how were you able to see them? Can you rephrase the question, please? How were you able to see them if you don't know who took them? Um, I, I saw them on the, on the screen. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm following your, yeah. your question. Before today, you said you saw them before today. That's what you just said. So I'm asking, I asked after that, do you know who took them? You said no. So how could you, how could you, I guess I'm asking, how would you know if you don't know who took these videos, how were you able to see them? before today? I believe they were collected by the police department as evidence. And that's how you saw them? That's how we were able to view them afterwards, yes. Do you know when you viewed them? I don't recall. Did you, did you view all 12 of them in their entirety at the same time or were they at different dates? Yeah, that's the form of the question. Grounds. <laughs> Did you view them all in their entirety? Again, it makes it seem like he's referring to videos. And if he is, that's fine. If he can just clarify videos or exhibits. Sustain this to the form of the question, please rephrase. Exhibits. Can you just repeat the question, please? At what time did you see all the exhibits in their entirety? Or is it the same day or was it different days? Um, I, I don't recall specifically. Um, I just re reviewed. Um, the exhibits, the photos, um, not the videos, but the, the photos, um, as you're explaining in these exhibits, um, prior just prep in preparation of my testimony. In preparation of your testimony? What do you mean by in preparation of? Um, preparing my testimony for court, uh, making sure that everything um, of, of uh, that uh, maybe um, kind of recall my memory, anything uh, to that nature, making sure that everything is accurate in, in, in what I'm going to testify to. If everything you're going to testify to is truthful, why would you need to prepare for it? Objection. Grounds. Sustained just to the form of the question. <laughs> why would you need testimony preparation? This is a pretty significant incident. I wanted to make sure that I was prepared fully for, for, for being here and testifying. Wouldn't it be easy to just come in and re recount what you saw? Objection. Argumentative. Grounds. Sustained. Please reprise. Is it fair to say that it would be fairly easy to re to state what you saw that, that evening? Yes. So why exactly did you feel the need that you had to prep yourself? Objection, argument. Grounds. Sustained, also asked an answer. I'm going to direct your attention to Exhibit 154, which is a video. So that's clear for the record, not a steel frame. It's a video. You want uh, to put up for him? I want to put up for him. All right. It's been received before. Put it up, please. <coughs> Can we go to 41 seconds? Sure. Thank you to the state for assisting. 41 seconds, you said? 41 seconds. 
Is it fair to say that? Do you want to wait until the jury has it in front yeah, of them? Yeah, yeah. This, this okay. Sorry. It's okay. There's a delay. Sometimes it's long. Sometimes it's short. It seems to be long right now. All right, we're good. Go ahead. So in this, in this exhibit, which is a video that's paused at 41 seconds, we can see two people laying on the ground. Would that be fair to say? Y yes. Can you see any of the two people's faces right now as it's paused? No. So it would be fair to say that you can't positively say who that is from this part of the video that's paused right now? Well, based on my experience, based on uh, clothing descriptions, um, obviously Idir and, and Marisol are, are mother and child, um, and body structures, that's how I'm able to identify who they are. What do you mean by body structure? Well, Idir is a little bit smaller, and Marisol is uh, a little bit larger, and that's how I have memory of who she is. Would you agree that they're kind of like bunched up, like kind of balled up? I would agree that Adir is, yes. Can you see faces? No, sir. So it would be fair to say that you don't know for sure who that is? I'm pretty confident that's Marisol and Adir. Pretty confident? I'm very confident. So why not be very confident the first time that question was asked? Browns. Browns. Let's go to 58 seconds in pause. <coughs> right here in front of us, we see um, three people who kneel down. We see someone with a pinkish blanket 